blessed hermetic life. Great self-denial was indeed required for anyone to live in that entirely desolate and uninviting place. However, Father Paisios was not worried. He obeyed the commandment of God, Seek ye first the kingdom of God, Matthew 6.33. And he staunchly believed in his promise, And all these things shall be added unto you. The Kali of St. Episteme did not even have water. When he was about to go and settle there, one of the iron restorers asked him, Father Paisios, aren't you taking some water with you? Where will you find water up there? I'll collect some from the dewdrops of the night, he answered. It was with joy, however, that he observed a little water dripping from a rock twenty meters away. He opened a fissure in the rock and from there collected the drops of water in a small hollow that he had chiseled out just below. Gradually the water increased and he collected two and a half to three kilos every twenty-four hours in a small cistern that he himself had made there. Each day he went to get some water with a tin can while saying the salutations of Theotokos. He felt great joy and gratitude for that small amount of water. His eyes welled up and he glorified God because he had water. The saint used the same tin can as a drinking glass, a plate, and a teapot. He also had a spoon, a lighter, an alarm clock, a length of cord, and a scissors. For a bed he used a stone ledge, that had been carved out in the cell. There he laid out a mat from the leaves of a date tree, and on the edge he kept an animal skin that he used as a cover to ward off the cold at night. In the cell there was also a stool and a wooden table on which he had placed a skull in remembrance of death. He had no icons, but had drawn a cross on the wall. When Father Damianos asked why he did not add an icon or two, he answered, the cross suffices. He did not make a garden, and he soon uprooted the one tomato plant he had cultivated on a stone ledge with a little soil. Is it proper for me, a monk, to have tomatoes and the poor Bedouins not to have them at all? Father Paisios would often abandon even that austere Kali of St. Episteme and wonder, is a vagabond of Christ as he used to say, around the mountains, clamoring over the rocks, entering the caves, where ascetics had once lived, destitute, afflicted, tormented, Hebrews 11.37, for the love of Christ. There greatly moved, he examined whatever had remained as a witness of their supernatural struggles, the stones that had been hollowed out by the prostrations they had made, the stone ledges upon which they had once rested, the stones blackened by the smoke of the candles they had lit, the small cisterns wherein they had collected the sparse water. The ascetic atmosphere of those caves spurred him on to greater ascetic struggles. In order to sustain himself on his long walks, he had made a long, narrow wooden box like a coffin, which he carried with him and used, either upright, standing in it, protected from the sun, or horizontally, lying down in it and resting for a little. Often he even ascended barefooted to the highest point of Mount Horeb, to the summit of St. Catherine. During the day when the sun was blazing hot, it was like stepping on fire, and at night when the granite stone felt frozen, it was like stepping on ice. The soles of his feet had hardened and become like the soles of shoes. When Father Damianos Asked him how he could walk barefoot on the rocks. He answered, How do the Bedouins walk barefooted? The shoes we were born with never wear out. The more you use them, the stronger they become. Near the monastery, however, he had carefully hidden a pair of shoes, which he wore whenever he went there. Thus those who were expecting to see a barefoot ascetic saw only an ordinary monk. The saint was extremely careful about keeping his ascetic struggles concealed. His ascetic rule was one of doing prostrations for hours without counting them, and the ceaseless repetition of the Jesus prayer, which had become one and the same thing with his breathing. He did not read the church services, but he did recite them while using the combeskini or prayer rope as a means of continuing to say the Jesus prayer. He sometimes spent the nights in his cell 
and other times he crossed the valley and ascended toward Mount Horeb. He entered caves, he came across on his way up to the holy summit, and remained in them all night doing prostrations. When he tired, he knelt and said the Jesus prayer while leaning his head on the freezing rock. He did not even feel the cold. His heart was aflame with divine eros, and it beat sweetly and strongly like a bell. Later in life he commented, If you find yourself in the desert and there is no temple, there is the temple of your body and the bell of your heart, and you have all the stars of heaven for vigil lamps. When he was once asked which hours he slept while at Sinai, he answered, Can you ever let yourself sleep in that place, my son? What do you think? That place is holy. God himself has trodden there. If I had not gotten sick, I would have never left. At another time, he said, when one hears about the God-trodden Mount Sinai, one imagines that he will see God walking there. If one lives there, he feels a tingling in his body, a quivering, because the altitude is high and the rocks are granite. But one also feels a spiritual current going through his body and senses the presence of God very intensely. That intense spiritual state nourished the saint and kept him wakeful. It was enough for him to have a little rest just before dawn. During the day, Father Paisios worked on his handicrafts while saying the Jesus prayer. He had separated the scissors into two, painted both parts with green oil paint in order to deflect the sun's rays, sharpened the blades with a stone, and used them to carve small wooden icons. With the help of the Bedouins, he cut the wood from a type of poplar tree that grew near the Cali of the Holy Unmercenaries, Cosmas and Damianos. He dried the cuttings, then split them into thin strips, sanded them down with sandpaper, and then carved various images of Christ of Panagia, as well as of images associated with Sinai, the sacred bush, the holy summit, the prophet Moses receiving the Ten Commandments. He made the same images again and again, so with the repetition, his hands became accustomed to working on their own without needing his concentration, which he had given over to unceasing prayer. He became so adept at making the icons that he could make in ten hours what had at first taken him five days. He sent the first small icons he had made to Archbishop Porfirios, and thus received his blessing for the handicrafts he had started making. Later on, he gave some small icons to pilgrims as a blessing, while he sent others to acquaintances in Greece so that they could be sold. He also gave some to the monastery to sell, so that he would not be a burden to them, even though he never asked for anything. In the beginning they took some bread to him, but he found discreet ways of returning it. And on Sundays, when he went down to the monastery for divine liturgy, he left without sitting in the refectory. The money he earned from his handicrafts sufficed for purchasing his flour, wheat, rice, and sugar. From Mondays to Fridays he observed the ninth hour, eating the same, quote, food that Hagiophantes had eaten, a type of bread made of flour and water that he, quote, baked on a stone that had been heated by the sun. Footnote. The abstinence from food and drink until the ninth Byzantine hour is 3 p.m. Return to the text. It became, the bread became so hard that it shattered into pieces like glass. Because he could not chew those hardened pieces, he kept them in his mouth until they softened and then swallowed them. He lit fires with dry brushwood in a small fire pit that he had fashioned with a few stones in the yard and brewed some tea into which he would put one spoon of sugar. The tea quenched his thirst and kept him warm. Otherwise, he could not get warm even if he covered up with more clothing. One hot tea with three little spoons of sugar can warm you up as much as three sweaters, he later remarked. For Saturdays and Sundays, he cooked a small portion of flour, soup, or a bit of rice with a teaspoon of cotton oil. One Saturday night, he followed a group of pilgrims who had a priest with them on their way to the Holy Summit, where the Divine Liturgy was to be celebrated. 
He wanted to receive Holy Communion, but because he had eaten oil late at midday, he felt the need to ask the unknown priest for a blessing to receive Holy Communion. You ate oil and you want to commune? You have no blessing, was his response. In obedience, Father Paisios did not commune that day, but he felt a divine sweetness within himself, just like the one he had when he did receive Holy Communion. Out of love for Christ, the saint exhausted his flesh with fastings, vigils, prayer, joyfully enduring the hunger and the thirst, the heat of the day and the cold of the night, the arduous walks in the desert, and the wounds the rocks inflicted on his feet. Thus he strode from strength to strength and ascended spiritual heights with Laventia. Spiritual Help at the Monastery Even though the saint was at a considerable distance from the monastery, he supported the fathers with love and concern, especially for the young novices, and helped them discreetly whenever needed. One of the first things that he concerned himself with was the frequent reception of Holy Communion, because the custom of communing only four times a year had prevailed in the monastery. When they told him to follow the same rule, Father Paisio said, May it be blessed. After that he prepared himself but did not commune. Instead, the moment when the priest said, With the fear of God, he bowed his head and said, You, my Christ, know how great a need I have. But when new novices came to the monastery, he then discussed the issue with the fathers of the monastery, and they finally established a rule of more frequent reception of Holy Communion with the appropriate preparation. In 1963, the fathers at Sinai became very worried over the insistence of an imam to reopen the old mosque that existed within the confines of the monastery. Footnote, the mosque had been built by the fathers of Sinai in about 1080 to 1100 in order to prevent an imminent attack by enemies who were Muslims. Return to the text. Father Paisios was not worried, but advised them to observe a vigil and let God speak on the matter. In the end, the common vigil did not take place, but they all prayed fervently with pain, and the miracle took place. The imam did not appear on the Friday that he had said he would come, nor did he ever again disturb the monastery. In the letter which the father sent to the archbishop to inform him, they wrote, We believe that the Lord saw our pain over the terrible affront to his holy name, to hear the voice of an imam within a Christian monastery, and precisely next to its catholicon, and perhaps even heard our pleas, and did not allow this affront to take place. We fear, however, that we are not worthy of such a benefaction from God, because we ourselves often allow his holy name to be offended. Those final words were a reference to the tolerance they showed in the unchecked movement of the tourists within the monastery. From the beginning, Father Paisios had indicated how dangerous this was to them, and in time, they too realized it. They decided to take measures. They restricted the visiting hours in the monastery, provided clothing for those who had inappropriate clothing, forbade taking photographs inside the Catholicon, as well as forbidding and reproving every loud and noisy expression within the monastery. In the minutes of their meeting, the fathers recorded, the visitors must realize that they are entering a monastery. When they see the austere spirit of the monastery, they too will benefit. The monks will feel more at ease, and perhaps some young men, seeing the monastic atmosphere, may choose to stay. For a monastic atmosphere to exist, the monks themselves need to have a monastic ethos. This was what concerned Father Paisios most of all, the cultivation of a monastic ethos, a monastic frame of mind among the young monks. Although he lived at a distance, sometimes he could see them through the, quote, spiritual television, unquote, and attempted to correct them. Once the archbishop had come from Cairo, and all the fathers together with a few Bedouins had gathered in the Arcantariki. Then Father Damianos, who was a young monk, used to do very amusing things, started doing some tricks by making things disappear and appear again. 
the elderly Bedouin, who was seated with the archbishop, could not understand how those things were done. As baffled and fearful, he watched. The next day, Father Damianos happened to go up to St. Epistemi. Upon seeing him, Father Paisio sternly told him, What were you doing last night in the Arcandariki? What was I doing? asked Father Damianos. We had gathered there and were discussing. What discussion? he interrupted him. I could see you over there acting like a devil. Father Damianos then tried to justify himself by saying that they were just little games that he used to do with the catechetical school children. But the saint explained to him, The Bedouins are simple people. They will think that you are doing magic, and instead of looking respectfully upon you, they will look upon you with fear. Didn't you see how the man the archbishop had brought with him was staring at you? Father Damianos wondered how Father Paisios had seen all those things, given that Father Paisios had been at St. Epistemi and not in the Arcandariki. He was more particularly impressed, however, by how he measured each act and every word in a spiritual way by using the spiritual benefit or the spiritual harm that it could cause as a criterion. Father Paisios considered the habit Father Dami Damianos had of taking many photographs worldly and inappropriate for a monk. Once he took his camera and threw it away into the rocks. Later, however, he returned it to him, undamaged. Father Damianos marveled that the camera was not damaged and said, I will not take any photographs again. The saint smiled and answered, only with discernment. Father Damianos later remarked, Thus, with the help of Father Paisios, I started to understand that monasticism is a far more refined matter than I had ever imagined. In a letter to his friend, a novice monk wrote the following, Father Paisios is a major chapter in terms of experience, holiness, and discernment. He himself has undertaken a great struggle, an extremely austere asceticism. He is doing battle with the devil. He possesses a love and an understanding that are extraordinary. In his presence I feel like a small, powerless child that lacks a conscious awareness of reality, while he is a strong and experienced man. In January of 1963, Euthymios Scleris, a young graduate of the Higher School of Economics and Business, who had met Father Paisos in Athens, came to Sinai. How did you find your way here? Father Paisios asked him as soon as he saw him. You lit a fire in me and I left everything, he answered. Euthymios had brought three suitcases and cardboard boxes with various things, clothing, sheets, towels, flatware. What is all this? You asleep at the wheel, Governor? Footnote, to say that one is asleep at the wheel infers that he has not thought out things fully, one who is not alert or fully aware of a situation. Return to the text. St. Paisios continue. Where did you think you were going? Father Paisios asked, this, asked him this in order to stir up his conscience. Euthemius then started throwing everything out of the window of the cell, shouting enthusiastically, Let's give everything away. Everything must go for the love of Christ. Euthemius threw out not only his own things, but also the mattress the Economos had given him. And the Bedouins in the meantime had gathered beneath the window, picking everything up. Father Paisios rejoiced over the decisive start of Euthemios, but when he found him sleeping on a board, he put some brakes on his enthusiasm. We spoke about voluntary poverty, not about foolishness, he told him. You have gone from one extreme to the other. When after a short period, Euthymios became ill from the sudden asceticism, Father Paisios arranged to have some chicken cooked for him. To encourage him to eat it, he himself took a bite, even though he had not eaten any meat since his childhood. That bite was a sacrifice out of love, as he said later, which is why he did not feel its taste. But when he began to think, have some more to keep him company, the saint did not give in, for he had discerned that the thought had come from the evil one. 
Father Paisios tried as much as he could to help the monastery. However, his basic aim remained the observation and correction of his own self. The desert itself helped him to work upon himself all the more inwardly and all the more deeply. Taking into consideration the spiritual work he was capable of at Sinai, he likened all he had done prior to mere bubbles. He wrote in a letter, It is true that with the grace of God many things have been corrected at the monastery. However, I feel the great need to correct my miserable soul, and I must continue the work I have started. For I now see all the things I have done all the previous years as mere soap bubbles. If I should succeed in reaching my goal, I will be able to help significantly with prayer. Pain and Love for the Bedouins The Bedouins who live in the desert surrounding the monastery of St. Catherine are of the Gambelia tribe, which means people of the mountain. In observing their life, Father Paisios was amazed by their endurance. He commented years later, Even after two years at Sinai, I was unable to attain the hardiness of a single Bedouin. He felt pain for them as he saw that they lacked even the absolute necessary things. When he noticed that they were eating bread made from filthy wheat full of sand and dirt, he recommended that the monastery provide them with good quality bread, and that is what happened. There was also a drought at that time. For seven years, not even a drop of water had fallen. The wells from which the Bedouins got their water were virtually dry, and even the large reservoir of the monastery, which received water from the mountains, was empty. The fathers had started to take the appropriate steps in order to obtain water from a distant place, but the saint had told them to wait, and he prayed a great deal for this matter. Finally, after three months, God provided rain in February of 1963. During that time, Father Paisios had gone to the Cali of the Holy Forty Martyrs to help with the pruning of the olive trees. When the pruning had been completed, the Bedouins, who had been helping, asked the monks, the monks to allow them to take the cut branches for lighting their fires. But for reasons unknown, they were not given permission. When the saint realized this, he tied all the branches into bundles and gave them to the Bedouins. Then an elderly Bedouin told him, You are a good man, it will rain. Indeed, in a little while, a generous beneficial rain began to fall that lasted for about three to four days and provided enough water to last them for two years. Using money from the sale of his handicrafts, Father Paisios provided food and clothing for the Bedouins. In order to avoid expenses, he did not even go to the Holy Land, which was relatively close, since the Bedouin children were hungry and suffering, and they, sensing his love for them, could recognize him from a distance of two kilometers and ran to meet him. He gave them toffees, hats made of fabric to protect them from the sun, and sandals to protect their feet from being cut by the granite rocks. He even treated the wounds on their feet with beeswax. They often went up to St. Epistemi on their own to have him put a little beeswax on the wounds of their feet. And when he went down to the monastery, they gathered beneath his window and called out, Abuna Paisi. He then lowered a little basket with food and sweets. During the Paschal week of 1963, Father Paisios, together with the other fathers, went to attend divine liturgy at the Kali of the Holy Forty Martyrs, having taken some red eggs with them. After the Divine Liturgy, they distributed the eggs to the Bedouins who had gathered there, and although there were only a few eggs, each of the Bedouins received one. Later the saint remarked, the holy forty martyrs provided forty eggs to the forty Bedouins in the oasis of the holy forty martyrs. Father Paisios often took Bedouin children with him to ascend the summits of the mountains in order to repair the worn-out wooden crosses which had stood there for years. He spread open the empty tin cans that he had taken with him, hammered them out, wrapped the tin strips around the crosses, and fastened them with small nails. Afterwards, the Bedouin children helped him erect the crosses, which were now shining as the sun was reflected from their tin covering 
and could be seen from a distance. Father Paisios later showed the Bedouin children how the cross is shown in the sunlight. He showed particular affection to a sickly little child, Suleiman, whose father had passed away. One day, September 14, 1963, on the old calendar, Father Paisios filled his bag with biscuits, ascended to the summit of the mountain of St. Epistemi, and went down the other side, seeking the dwelling place of the Bedouins. He walked for six hours, leaving markers for himself along the way so that he would not get lost. He finally found himself outside the hut of Suleiman. As soon as the boys saw him, he started shouting, Abuna Paisi! Out of joy, he wanted to have the only chicken they owned cooked. I will come again, Suleiman, said the saint, and I will bring a little rice. Are there others nearby? Over there, he said, pointing to the desert. And that child ran a distance of half an hour to the, peop to the other camp of Bedouin dwellings to invite them too. And people, children, and women with babies in their arms came all that distance to have a biscuit. There was great joy in the camps of the Bedouins that day. From then on, Father Paisios, knowing the way, descended the back side of the mountain at night and left food and clothing outside the huts of the Bedouins. They would find them in the mornings and say, Abuna Paisi. The charity of Father Paisios was a testimony of the love of Christ for these people who had once been Christians but had later converted to Islam and remained Muslims. One day, when he went down to the monastery, he was told that Sihas, the leader of the Bedouin tribe, was looking for him. He found this strange. I wonder why. Is it perhaps because I go to their tents and leave things? His wonder turned to surprise when Sihas came, embraced him, and said, You walk straight with Injil, or the Gospel. Footnote, Injil is the Arabic term for gospel. It is derived from the Greek word evangelion, which means good news or the gospel. Return to the text. What do you want me to do for you? Father Paisius was moved by this. Look at what is happening, he thought to himself. Some people in Konitsa, who are close to the church, declared a war on me, and this man here, a leader of the Bedouins is telling me, you walk according to the gospel. He asked him not to allow the Bedouins near his keli, so as not to disturb him from his prayer. When necessary, I myself will go and find them, he added. But to the little fatherless Suleiman, he said, you, when you need something, can come any time. Keeping Company with the Animals the most frequent visitors at the Kali were a few birds and some lovely mice that resembled turtles and had fur like a brush. Footnote, this is a reference to the spiny mice whose habitat is the Sinai Desert. Return to the text. These little mice cleaned his yard by eating the sawdust which fell from the wood Father Paisios prepared for his handicrafts. One day the flour soup he was preparing burned, and as he was scrubbing the pot to clean it, Mice and birds that had probably smelled the burned food gathered around. From that time on, however, every time he made some similar sound, as for example when rubbing wood with sandpaper, the mice and the birds gathered immediately. He gave them rice and wheat to eat and deposited it in many places so they wouldn't fight over it. His sensitive heart felt sorrow for them as he saw that they were thin and smaller than those he had seen in Greece. Whatever lives in the desert is needy, he used to say. His winged visitors even entered his small cell through the door which he always kept open because there was no window. Once while trying to lift a large rock, he injured his back and remained lying for twenty days flat on his back on the stone ledge that he used as a bed. One day a little bird entered his cell and stood on his chest, looking at his face and chirping very sweetly for hours. He commented later in life, Just imagine being sick and having birds visiting you. 
and they are not concerned about eating, they just sing sweetly. The birds even followed him when he was away from the Kali to the crags and the caves he visited. There he would chant various hymns on the mountain of Sinai. Footnote, the Hermos of the Ninth Ode of the Canon of the Paracletici for Monday and Saturday of the Third Mode. Return to the text. Holy God, or it is, it is truly worthy in others. As soon as the first words came out of his lips, the birds started to gather around him. As he chanted, more and more birds came. They flew around him, sat on his shoulders and on his head, and they also chirped. When he was done, he threw a little rice for them. If he wanted to have absolute Hezekiah, he knew that he should not chant at all. Later he would remember, once there was one troublesome chanter which would not let me pray. Wherever I went, it came with me. It was a lovely little bird. One of the men working on the preserving, preserving the icons at Sinai had heard, and it did not seem to him at all strange, that Father Paisios even gave food to dangerous insects, such as poisonous spiders that exist in the desert, and also to snakes, which never seemed to harm him. Later the saint wrote, O blessed desert, you help so much in reconciling the creatures of God with their Creator, because you transform yourself into an earthly paradise, where once again the wild animals gather around the man whom you have tamed. Demonic Temptations At Sinai, Father Paisios encountered intense attacks from the devil. After a six-month stay in the desert, he wrote in a letter, Of course you will consider me fortunate for being in the desert, where one way or another I am relieved of the causes of sin. But I must tell you that the devil himself goes to where he cannot send his cohorts. So please pray that I may be strengthened and protected by the grace of God. Besides the first demonic trial already mentioned, there are also a few more that are known. One night as he was descending the precipitous crags below the Kali, he attempted to light the lighter to be able to see. The lighter would not light, it only produced sparks. It doesn't matter, he thought, I'll descend by the light from the sparks. At that very moment, before he could take a step, a light as powerful as a spotlight fell on the opposite escarpment and illuminated the entire area. He immediately realized it as something demonic. I don't need such lights. None of your lights for me, he said with aversion, and returned to his cell. That night he did not go anywhere. He later commented, The devil wanted to be of some service to me, or so he thought. It's a pity for him to be tormented. I'd rather give him some lights. If I had been deluded and believed that the light was from God, or at least if I had felt a prideful satisfaction, he would have then shown me Christ, Panagia, etc., and I would have suffered great harm. Another time the devil tried to mislead him in order to fling him off of a cliff. There is a ravine that is five meters deep, just off the cliff at the edge of the Kelly's enclosure. One day as he was sitting near the edge of the yard, sandpapering the wood for his handicrafts, he heard a voice next to him say, You can fall down there and not get hurt. He turned in that direction and saw a dark shadow with a large head. There goes that devil again, he thought, and paid no attention to it. But the demon would not go away and repeatedly said, You can fall down there and not get hurt. For fifteen minutes he kept repeating the same thing. The saint acted as if he did not hear, but finally said, Well, I'll throw a stone. Not even Christ thought of that. He gave a better answer than Christ himself, said the devil. Then the saint retorted with exasperation. Christ is God, not a clown like me, sitting here and gaping at you. Get out of here. With those words, the devil disappeared. On another day, his alarm clock had stopped working. So he shook it, hoping to make it start again. Then the devil brought an intense thought to his mind. You lost soul, what are you doing here? If you were in the world, instead of an alarm clock, you would have children, 
rocking them in your arms and tucking them in. So what are you doing now? Reacting to that thought, the saint threw the clock with all his might against a crag three meters away. But the clock, just before hitting the rock, stopped suddenly in midair and started falling slowly, slowly to the ground. It finally stood upright in the ravine, which was 20 meters deep. The saint climbed down there and to his great surprise, found the clock working. Just look at that devil, he thought to himself. Not only did nothing happen to the clock, even though it fell down so many meters, but it's even working. So he took a rock, hit the clock, and broke it. He preferred to be without an alarm clock rather than to hold on to a, quote, trophy, unquote, of the evil one. For Great Lent of 1963, he desired more austere asceticism and went to the cave of St. Stephanos, which is in the foothills of Mount Horeb. He took the tin can and the cord so as to bring up water from a small well that was near there. However, the first night the devil declared such terrible war on him, they decided to leave the next morning. I'm not worthy to remain here, he said to himself. He meant, of course, to be below the holy summit. Later he remarked, I was defeated. I did not stay on the front lines. I reasoned that I would have nothing to gain if I were to become totally exhausted in such an intense battle with the devil. He had learned to do battle with Levantia, humility and discernment. Divine insight about the ancestors of God, Joachim and Anna, and consolation from Panagia. At Sinai, Father Paisios experienced a superior su spiritual life and sublime spiritual conditions. Among the hidden mysteries spoken to the ears of his reasoning, was a revelation about the sober and blessed relations between the holy ancestors of God through which Panagia had been conceived. About this he later recounted the following. After praying fervently to God for a child, the holy ancestors of God, Joachim and Anna, came together, not out of carnal desire, but out of obedience to God. They had no carnal frame of mind at all. They were the most dispassionate couple that ever lived. As soon as a dispassionate couple had been found, just as God had created man, and as he had wanted people to be born, Paniya was born, and she was all pure because her conception had taken place without sensual pleasure. I experienced this revelation at Sinai. Also at the Kali of St. Epistemi, Father Paisios very intensely experienced the maternal affection of Paniya who appeared to him as a good mother on the eve of the day his own mother in the flesh died. The saint had already completed a year in the desert, and during that period of time he suffered greatly. Each time he recalled the harsh words he had said to his mother as they were parting. If it is time, you can die now. He had confessed those words as well as all the worries he had brought upon his mother from his childhood and on. And he prayed that his mother would not be aware that her death was approaching, so that she would not feel his absence. And so it happened. On the morning of October 6, 1963, his mother Evloia awoke well, and shortly afterward gave up her blessed soul to God. The previous night, while the saint had been praying in his kali, Paniya had suddenly appeared before him as fully alive as he. She kissed and embraced him, and he felt her sweet affection and divine consolation so intensely that he could not contain himself and shouted like a madman, My Panagia, my dearest mother, my Panagia, my dearest mother. And when he went down to the monastery for divine liturgy, his heart leapt and his eyes flooded with tears. As soon as he recognized Panagia, just as she had appeared to him, in the image of an icon hanging in the Catholicon of the monastery. A few days later, he received a letter from Konitsa informing him of the repose of his mother. The great maternal love and warm affection of the Panagia, which the saint had experienced that night at Sinai, always remained within him. He later counseled monks, in order to intuit Panagia as your mother, you must entirely uproot the love you have for your own mother in the flesh. 
the providence of God. Even though Father Paisios had attained to such a great spiritual state that he wanted to dedicate himself only to prayer, he spent many hours of the day making his handicrafts in order to be able to provide things for the Bedouins. However, one day he thought, that I come here to help the Bedouins or to pray for the whole world? And thus he decided to limit his handicrafting. That same day, it was December of 1963, a Greek doctor who lived in Vienna had come to visit him. As soon as the saint saw him, he said, Come, I've been waiting for you. Through the gift of insight, he revealed some personal things from the doctor's life to him while they were conversing. The doctor was so shaken that he offered Father Paisios 100 liars, saying, Here, Father, take these liars so you can help the Bedouin children without cutting back on your program of prayer. Father Paisios could not bear how deeply he himself had been moved. Leaving the doctor alone, he went into his cell and stayed there for 15 minutes. The providence and the love of God had literally dissolved him. The doctor remained at St. Epistemi for two days, and when he returned to the monastery, it was clear that he had been transformed. He had not simply found consolation in Father Paisios, but something more profound and more essential. As a doctor, however, he expressed the opinion that the saintly man could not endure the ascetic life in the desert for long. Departure from Sinai Father Paisios did not want to be separated from the desert with its many and good prerequisites for any reason whatsoever, as he had written in one of his letters. However, his impaired health strained all the more against him. The alternations of temperature and the lack of oxygen in the high elevation of the completely barren mountains aggravated the disease in his lungs. He had not even been a whole year at Sinai before he had begun to have frequent headaches and much shortness of breath. He often even lapsed into unconsciousness. In a letter he wrote, When there is no wind, I get a headache and feel like I can't catch my breath. But fortunately, God is very near and nourishes me with the heavenly manna, His divine grace. I thus feel great joy. One night, while praying in a small cell, he had the sensation of losing all his strength, and he collapsed. Perhaps the time has come for me to die, he wondered, and he continued to pray, anticipating his death with longing. After a little time had elapsed, however, he feared that what he was doing might be suicidal. He therefore slowly dragged himself out to a certain spot in the yard where there was a current of air that formed a breeze. He stayed there praying until he recovered. If I had not gone outside, he later said, I would have been finished. But I loved it then. I felt such joy. The doctor from Vienna had advised him to go down to a lower altitude in hopes of improving his condition. Thus, in February of 1964, he decided to stay for a little while in the monastery, which is 250 meters lower than the Kali of St. Epistemi. If his health improved, he intended to settle in the cave of St. John Climacus, which is located at a lower altitude than the monastery. He had even acquired sheets of particle board to build a small kelevi next to the damp cave. During that time, he wrote in a letter, In any case, I see that God is bringing me down lower and lower. In the event that I should suffer even here, I will leave and return to Greece. I leave things in the hands of God, and he who is by nature good will do what is in the best interest of the soul of each one of us. He stayed in the monastery for a month and a half, but did not improve. His asthmatic shortness of breath also hampered him in the unceasing prayer. He could not say the prayer in the manner to which he had become accustomed to saying it, with the inhalation and exhalation of his breath. What is the value of staying here if I cannot even say the Jesus prayer, he admitted. Thus, on April 25, 1964, on the old calendar, he departed from Sinai, very much pained at having to leave his beloved de desert. In the desert of Sinai, Father Paisios, as he often said, had celebrated the monastic life and celebrated it far more there than in any other place. 
he had delighted in the Hezekiah, which in itself is a secret prayer and greatly aids in prayer. He too could reiterate the encomium written centuries before. O Hezekiah, the cause of repentance, O Hezekiah, revealing to man his sins, O Hezekiah, bringing man to a peaceful state, O Hezekiah, the school of prayer and study, O Hezekiah, cheerfulness of heart and soul, O Hezekiah, the abode of Christ which bears good fruit. Footnote, see the great Eurantikon, volume 1, chapter 2, from the Holy Hezekasterion. Nativity of the Theotokos, Panorama, Thessaloniki. Return to the text. In the absolute outer Hezekiah of the desert, the saint had acquired inner Hezekiah, the peace of the soul. He came to know himself deeply and sincerely, and he also came to know the great love of God and his infinite benevolence. Divine Eros flared up in his heart, consuming every bit of rubbish within him. It made him give himself so completely over to God that he remained ever more indifferent to all earthly things, since only his body was on earth while his noose was in heaven. And so in that state he no longer differed in virtually anything from the angels, because he too was in heaven day and night, praying noetically and unceasingly. The visions and revelations the saint had when he escaped from his own self and the gravity of the earth and soared into heaven of the paradise Tysical life remain unknown. The only thing we know is that from that time on, his words and his deeds had collateral security in the spiritual mine of the desert, where he, while working there, had found the precious pearl. Matthew 13:46, Jesus Christ. And having acquired him, he acquired heavenly wealth and enriched the people of God with marvelous deeds and wise words. For the rest of his life, Father Paisios longed for the completely destitute and completely wealthy desert. He always yearned to live at Sinai just one more day. Two months before he fell asleep in the Lord, he said, Oh, if I could only have the endurance to go to Sinai for a year to the Keli of St. Epistemi, to live monastically, to chant angelically, to die over there with Palikaria. Chapter 9 at the Skeet of Iveron of St. John the Forerunner at the Calivi of the Archangels Father Paisios returned to the Holy Mountain in May of 1964, and the first matter to which he attended was to find an elder in order to practice obedience. He left his few belongings in a store in Karyez and went to Kapsala, where the Russian confessor Father Tikhon whom he had met ten years earlier in the monastery of Esvigmenu, led an ascetic life. He asked him to receive him as a disciple, and in fact had already found a keli in that region. But when he returned to Karyez to retrieve his belongings, he ran into the representative of the Philotheo Monastery, and he suggested that Father Paisios take up residence at the keli of Elder Augustinos who in his old age was then being cared for at the monastery. Father Paisios did not want to go there, since he already had found a Kali, but the insistence of the representative, he finally said, may it be blessed, and followed him to Philotheo Monastery. There another senior monk, who did not agree with the representative, told him to find a Kalivi at the Skeet of Ivaran Monastery. Again, Father Paisios said, may it be blessed, and went directly to the skeet where the fathers were offered, fathers there offered him the Kalivi of the Holy Archangels. The fifteen Kalivya of the Iveron skeet of St. John the Forerunner and Baptist are spread out upon the hillsides of a wooded and very verdant ravine. The Kalivi of the Archangels is located high up on the hillside and gets more sun than the others. It consisted of a large house, a chapel, and three rooms, which were all in need of considerable repair. Father Paisios made some minor repairs to the one room in which he was to stay, and later in the summer of 1964, he repaired the entire Kalivi. He also cultivated the abandoned vegetable garden, 
cut firewood for the winter, and gathered the olives which provided the olive oil for the year. He himself would have been content with the least of things. He undertook the labor, however, because some of the young men he had met in Athens and at Sinai were thinking of coming to stay near him. In anticipation of that, he wanted to secure all the essential prerequisites, so that they could dedicate themselves, free from distractions and cares, to the main work of a monk, prayer, and study. I see things moving in the direction of creating a small brotherhood, he wrote in a letter dated July 1964. Footnote. There are three chief types of monastic life. The eremitic life, wherein hermits, ascetics, or anchorites lead a perpetually solitary life in caves or kalivya. The cenobitic community life, wherein monastics dwell together under a common rule in a regularly constituted monastery. The semi eremitic life, wherein two to six monks may or may not live together but are under the guidance of an elder. Return to the text. It is true that this distresses me a great deal, he wrote, because I have lived alone and see myself as able to advance better alone. I beseech the Lord for this at length, but I see that this is his will. I consulted my spiritual father, Elder Tikhon, and he told me that I should accept all who want to stay with me. And he also said, at least make a small kalivi nearby so that you may have a bit of Hezekiah. I've started repairing the Kalevi because our friends will probably be arriving soon and I must make whatever preparations I can. I've worked hard during this three-month period. Glory be to God for many things have been taken care of. Within a year, everything should be completed so that the main work, prayer, and study may begin and then later to make a small handicraft on the side. Thus freedom from cares will be established, and with it the brothers will be taken up heavenward. Later I am thinking of making small kalivya for the brothers, 100 meters apart, so that we can be all together and all together apart, because I have experienced all the types of monastic life, and I know that Hezekiah provides the means by which the dregs are settled. Ascetic Sustenance On the grounds of the Kalivi were a large mulberry tree, a cherry tree, and a pine tree. When Father Paisio saw those three trees, he thought that he needed nothing more to live on. In the afternoons, when he stopped his arduous work, he climbed either the cherry tree or the mulberry tree and ate a handful of their fruit glorifying God. And when at one time he had a young deacon staying with him, he took him at midday every day so that they could both climb up the mulberry tree, quote, to the restaurant, unquote, unquote, as he called it, to eat mulberries. Thus he went through spring and summer, eating like a bird of heaven, at first cherries, then mulberries, then pine nuts. When winter came, he ate only a spoonful of pine nuts with a small amount of honey. Soon, however, he realized that he would not be able to live on that. He later commented, The mulberries nourish you more than the cherries, and the pine nuts even more. But Mount Athos does not sustain asceticism the way Sinai does. How can a winter be endured here with only pine nuts? He therefore began eating a small rusk, or he boiled a bit of rice, an occasional potato, or some wild greens. Demonic Attacks The same was determined to continue his extreme asceticism in this skeet too, but the devil also determined immediately started his attacks. A few days after settling in, Father Paisios was subjected to the first demonic trial, Night had fallen, and kneeling on the bed, he was reciting the Jesus prayer when he heard a loud knock on the door. Who is it, he called out, but received no answer. Earlier in the day, a troubled man had stopped at the Kalevi seeking alms, and Father Paisios had given him all the money he had. 
he thought that perhaps that man had come back to ask for more money. As soon as this thought occurred to him, he heard another knock at the door. He got up, lit a candle to have some light, and again called out, Who is it? Once again he received no answer. Soon he heard loud knocking, not from the door, but from the ceiling. Then he realized that the knocking was caused by the evil one. He knelt again to continue saying the Jesus prayer, even as the noise became louder. Suddenly he heard a fearful crash. The demons had thrown a large slab upon the roof. It had broken through the boards of the ceiling, precisely above the head of the saint, and remained hanging there with the point facing down. Having had some experience with such trials, he was not troubled. I get it, he said. This is how we will spend the night. That night he kept a vigil saying the Jesus prayer while the demons continued their knocking. Such demonic attacks occurred many times since the demons gathered from time to time at the Kalevi to test him. He remarked humbly, What can I say? Just as the flies head for a carcass, so do the demons come to me. One night, one young man who stayed at the Kalevi for a few days heard such a strident racket that the Kalevi shook as if a strong earthquake were taking place. In the morning he asked, Father Paisios, what were those crashing sounds? How was the house not destroyed? That was nothing, he answered laughing. You should see what happens when an entire army comes. What a racket they make. Prayer and Study In the skeet of Ivaran, Father Paisios began once again to read the sacred services, even though his prayer had long since become the unceasing Jesus prayer. Once an ascetic asked him, Elder Paisios, how many hours do you pray? How much wine does a drunkard drink when he goes to the tavern? asked Father Paisios. He keeps drinking until he is drunk. Well, that's how prayer is for me. For study, he had the book Parakletiki, which he read over and over. Footnote, this is the liturgical book which contains hymns and canons for the Vespers and the Orthros for each day of the week. Return to the text. I am in love with the Parakletiki, he used to say. It contains so many meanings. He often hugged the book closely to his chest, saying, My holy paracletiki. Reading the hymns referring to the crucifixion and the resurrection of Christ, as well as those to the holy martyrs, he experienced the joyful crucifixional resurrection of the holy martyrs. He too was aflame with the divine fire, which had led the martyrs to martyrdom, and also sensed the divine exaltation that transforms martyrdom into a celebration. He learned the hymns that particularly moved him and lifted up his soul by heart and chanted them angelically, being divinely in love. One of these hymns was the following. Having been cast into the blazing fire, the athlete martyrs, being aflame with the fervent love of Christ, remained unscathed, for they had destroyed the thorns of impiety by means of divine grace. Footnote, this troparion is the martyrican of the Macarismi, the Beatitudes of Monday, Mode Pelago Fourth. Return to the text. Whenever he chanted that hymn, he accentuated each word that referred to burning with all his might. When the love of God is ablaze, he said, the burning of the flame of martyrdom is burned away by burning love. Fire can comfort better than hot springs. There is no pain because joy overflows. And in a letter dated April 1965, he wrote, And when one endures even martyrdom for the love of Christ, his heart overflows with divine pleasure. The same thing happens when he understands the passion of the Lord. Our good Jesus took all the bitterness, together with all the sin of the world, upon himself, and as is apparent, 
He left us the joy and exultation felt by one who has removed the old man within and has Christ living evermore in him. Such a person comprehends part of the joy of paradise while he's on earth. For as the Lord says, the kingdom of heaven is within you. Luke 17, 21. Father Paisios got drunk on the divine meanings of the hymns and was aflame with divine eros, even during the hours he worked on his handicraft, which were at that time carved wooden crosses. The more I carve and form the body of Christ upon the wood he once revealed to someone, the more the love of Christ flames up within me. Once while a young deacon stayed with him for a few days, amongst other things he asked him, Father, should I go to university to study theology? For me, answered the saint, the greatest university is to exult in the crucifixion of Christ. As the deacon was leaving, Father Paisios accompanied him to the harbor, and along the way he asked him, Because I live alone, I cannot correct myself. Show a little love, and tell me which of my weaknesses you may have noticed in order to help me. The basic spiritual work of Father Paisios, and the most essential study of all studies, as he had often said, continued to be the constant observation and correction of his own self. Participation in the Life of the Skeet Father Paisios participated in the life of the Skeet in a plain and straightforward manner. He was never absent from the divine liturgies that were celebrated every Saturday at the cemetery chapel and every Sunday at the Kiriakon. After divine liturgy, he went to the Akandariki to help. As soon as the coffee had been served, he returned to the kitchen. On the few occasions when he sat with the fathers, he remained silent. Whenever they remarked, Father Paisios, you have not said anything. Why don't you say, say something too? He answered reservedly, What can I say, my fathers? He had great reverence and respect for them, especially since most of them had led an ascetic life on the holy mountain since their youth. Among them, Elder Pacomios, from the Kalevi of the Holy Apostles, stood out as an example of most eager obedience and childlike simplicity. On Elder Pacomios, see St. Paisius of Mount Athos, Athenite Fathers and Athenite Matters. Because he picked up serpents without fear, Father Paisios once asked him, Father Pacomios, why don't the serpents bite you? He answered, It is written on some paper somewhere that Jesus Christ had said, If you have faith, you can pick up serpents and scorpions, and they will not harm you. Luke 10.19 The spirit of holy simplicity that permeated the skeet made Father Paisios feel as if he were in paradise, in the spiritual atmosphere of divine grace. Because most of the fathers were elderly, he felt the need to provide some relief for them by doing various things for them. Even if it was raining, he went to the monastery of Iveron or the monastery of Philotheu and even Caries in order to take care of their affairs. He visited ailing elders and assisted them. He even searched for their mule whenever it would stray and get lost. And whenever he heard that monks were doing carpentry work in some Calivi, he offered to help. Helping those considering monasticism. In the summer of 1964, a young man asked Father Paisios to allow him to stay with him, and he consented. In fact, he gave him the Calivi of the Archangels and built himself another shanty, like a kiosk, a little further along, using wood from a chestnut tree and sheets of metal. Inside, he also built a small wood-burning stove and was thus able to get through the winter there. From his shanty, the ravine that splits the skeet of Averon into two can be seen, and the saint became fond of a spot which, as it was hidden in the ravine, was hardly ever seen by the sun. 
That is the most ideal spot for ascetic struggles, he thought. I have not found such a spot for ascetic struggles in any other place on the holy mountain. I will go and stay there. Thus, during the second summer, 1965, he used bricks to build a small kalivi there. To make the sloping roof, he had to cut wood from the opposite side of the ravine and haul it by himself to his newly built kalivi, a walk of about 15 minutes, downhill and up. In the meantime, more young men came, wanting to become disciples of Father Paisios, and they settled in nearby Calivia. The door of Father Paisios was always open for them, but his presence alone was guidance in itself, since he was, quote, a monk in all its perfection, unquote. In order to become one of his disciples, however, total self-renunciation was required. One had to cast off one's old man within in order to enter the orbit of monasticism. In November of 1965, a young theologian came to the skeet to become a monk. Seeing him wearing a tie, Father Paisios removed it and tied it onto a donkey. He thereafter tried various ways of helping him cast off the secular spirit and the tendency for posturing so he that could become so he, so that he could become a monk once for example he did the following noticing how pleased the young man was to hear about the idea that the restoration of certain monasteries might be entrusted to new theologians among whom the young theologian had also included himself father paisios who didn't want his own handwriting recognized colluded with other monks and had a letter written in the style of a formal invitation. Its content went something like this. Because you are an educated man, we want to entrust a certain monastery to you. Please come so that we can discuss this matter. They placed the letter in an envelope and addressed it to Mr. So-and-so, theologian, Skeet of Iveron, and gave it to another monk to deliver. When the young man received the letter, he ran directly to Father Paisios and with obvious satisfaction said, I have been invited to be entrusted with a monastery. The saint let him go on talking and talking, and in the end, he smilingly revealed his trick to be an educational lesson and lovingly explained to him, Do you see how much work we have to do? Do you see how the devil deceives us? These honors are hollow things. Eventually, after a few months, that young man left the skeet. Before leaving, he went to receive a blessing from Father Paisios, who kindly told him, Go with God's blessing. After he had walked three or four meters, however, he called out to him, Come back, I have something to tell you. He said, Look, whether you stay in the world or go to a monastery, become a man of God. Go now. But again, before he had gone ten meters, he called him back. Hey, stop, I forgot to tell you something. Father Paisios again told him, I'm going to tell you something to remember. Wherever you are, it is enough to be a man of God. After the young man had gone a distance of about fifty meters, he once again called him back and repeated the same words to him. The first thing that Father Paisios wanted his disciples to become was fully mindful of was that as monks they could help people more with their prayer and their silent example rather than with missionary activity. If we do spiritual work on ourselves and cast off the old man from within, he told them, then we can also work on others or rather, we will not be doing the work, but the work will get done naturally on its own. He advised them to study the ascetical homilies of Abba Isaac. Abba Isaac has everything, he counseled. This book will be more than enough for you for ten years, but ten years will not be enough for this book. He was stern, as always, on the subject of contacts with relatives. Providing the good example himself, he refused the assistance of his brother Lucas, who together with 
another relative had visited him and offered to stay at Ivaran Monastery in order to help him build the Kalevi in the ravine. Leave, he told them, I don't need help. He did not even keep the blessings or goods they had brought for him, but instead directed them to take their blessings to a nearby Kalevi, where an elderly monk lived. And when they had asked him to go along with them to the monastery of Ivaran, he instead pointed out the way, saying, There, that's where Ivaran is. If you want to go, go. Lucas sat down a little further along and wept, but the saint said, Let him cry. If I consent so that he will not cry, will he benefit? Neither he nor I will benefit. And what will be the outcome? I will only harm monasticism. Great Schema Monk and Dikaios of the Skeet Footnote Dikaios is a monk elected to be in charge of the administration of a skeet. Once a week, Father Paisios went to Kapsala to Elder Tikhon for confession. He, in turn, often asked him, The schema? What about the schema? Father Paisios had never been concerned about becoming a great schema monk. Being obedient, however, he received the great schema on January 11, 1966, on the old calendar, the feast day of St. Theodosius the Cenobiarch. The tonsure took place at the Kelly of Father Tikhon, who was his sponsor. Four months later, Father Paisios, in obedience, assumed the responsibilities of the chaos of the Skeet, which involves primarily looking after the Kyriakon and assisting the pilgrims. He offered the same solicitude to his disciples and the fathers of the Skeet as that which he offered to all the pilgrims who arrived there, either out of piety to venerate St. John the Baptist or out of mere curiosity. One day at the Kyriakon, he met a long-haired young man who had been wandering throughout the holy mountain for many days. Having discerned a demonic cleverness within him which would have led him to atheism, Father Paisios good-naturedly approached him, and even though the young man was blasphemous and impudent, he brought him to his senses. He even gave him a haircut. In the end, he told him, Listen, may your mother be well. Your mother's prayers brought you here. Yes, you're right, the young man admitted. Not even I myself realized how I came to be here. She will be so happy to see me so transformed. Whenever Father Paisios did not have any work at the Kyriakon, he left a note for visitors to get in touch with him by ringing the bell, which he could hear from his Kalivi. One afternoon, the fathers told him that a visitor, who had waited for many hours, had not rung the bell because he had not wanted to disturb anyone. The saint went and found him, and because he had been impressed by his philotomo and had detected the grace of God, on his shining face, he asked him about his life. The visitor then related his story. He was a poor family man, a porter in Piraeus. When he was still a child, his father had passed away, which is why later he so loved his father-in-law, who unfortunately was a blasphemer. In spite of his son-in-law's many appeals to break that bad habit, however, his father-in-law had remained unrepentant. One day, returning from work, he found his father-in-law dead and became so upset about the state of his soul that right then and there, and with great anguish, he prayed to God to resuscitate him so that he could repent. Miraculously, the dead man arose and lived in repentance for another five years. At the end of his story, the porter said, My dear father, who, who was I to experience such a thing? The only thing I want in life is to thank God who had done that good thing. That day, Father Paisios returned to his Kalivi, having been greatly benefited by the porter's simplicity and humility, a humility so great that it had never even occurred to him that it was because of him that the dead man had been resurrected.
the final blow. As Father Paisios traversed the ravine each day to go to the Kyriakon, the area echoed with his coughing, and the father soon realized that he had a serious problem with his health. During the winter of 1965-66, to 66, he had stayed in the Kalivi of the ravine, where the humidity was so great that even the nails in the ceiling dripped water. A small stool and his covers had even turned green with mold. Thus his health, which ten years earlier had already cracked like a piece of earthenware, as Elder Savas of Philotheo Monastery had told him, was completely shattered, and as it seemed, it would be very difficult to completely restore it. Once again, his symptoms included coughing up blood and vomiting, low-grade fevers, and exhaustion. By the end of July, the saint could not stand on his feet and remained almost constantly in bed. One day he vomited so much blood that he fainted. He himself had realized that the dampness was especially harmful to him and that the fathers were right to insist that he undergo medical examinations in Thessaloniki. He later related, A particular place can bring one solace, but it can also do him harm. That sight in the ravine was one such place. Every time I looked at it, my heart leapt. I could not hide my eagerness to build a Kalevi there. I found such strength to cut the wood and to carry it to the spot. Oh, and the joy I felt! My heart beat ever so sweetly. However, when the heart beats sweetly like that, oftentimes, that joy is not entirely spiritual. One may be rendered useless because that joy deceives him. And I, I too, had been so deceived. How could I have known that I was to receive the final blow to my health there? Ill at the Sanatorium Pale and weak, Father Paisios went to Thessaloniki to undergo medical examinations, accompanied by Father Vasilios, one of his disciples. The next day, which was a Sunday, they attended divine liturgy at the sacred temple of God's wisdom. Father Polycarpos, the presiding priest of the church, seeing the two monks standing unassumingly in one corner of the sanctuary, asked Father Vasilios who the elder was and if he could be of any assistance to them. Father Vasilios explained that the monk was Father Paisios from the Holy Mountain and that he was to visit a radiologist to have chest x-rays taken the next day. Father Polycarpos eagerly offered to help them, and even though they had said that they did not need any help, he met them at the clinic the next day. From the x-rays, the, the radiologist confirmed that the bron bronchiectasis had spread and was exacerbated. Furthermore, he said that it was imperative that he be admitted to the Center for Diseases of the Thorax, the sanatorium. Footnote, the reference is to the General Hospital Papa Nicoleo in Thessaloniki today. Father Polycarpos offered to help with the admission arrangements. In the meantime, the two fathers from the Holy Mountain stayed in a hotel. During the first night, the noise from the automobiles made things somewhat difficult for Father Paisios, who had been living in Hezekiah for so many years. But he thought to himself, Glory be to God, at least there is no war, so no tanks and cannons are heard. How many at this time are living through a war and being killed and wounded? Throughout that night he prayed ceaselessly for those people. Three days later, Father Paisios was admitted to the sanatorium where the physicians related that he required a surgical intervention. Because it was necessary that he first undergo a series of tests as well as therapeutic treatment, Father Basilios returned to the Holy Mountain. Thus, the attendance to Father Paisios was undertaken by Father Poly Polycarpos, who in turn assigned it to the spiritual sisters of an atypical sisterhood which was under his guidance. At first, Father Paisios stayed in a room with many patients, 
However, this did not hinder him from continuing his rule. Fasting, vigils, and prayer. He did not go to the common refectory for the patients for the first few days and remained virtually without food. But this was quickly noticed by the staff of the hospital and they compelled him to go to the refectory. Nevertheless, he removed the meat from his plate and only ate a little of the remaining food. When the physician looked at his blood test results, he said, You must eat, Father, because if you do not become physically strengthened, we will not be able to proceed with the surgery. The spiritual sisters who were taking care of him received instructions from the hospital's head nurse, who said, Tell him to eat in obedience, because if he continues like this, we will not be able to perform the surgery. The sisters then began to cook nourishing foods for him, which he forced himself to eat, all the while deploring himself. At night he kept vigil by kneeling on the bed, and once the other patients had fallen asleep, he began doing prostrations. One patient who had noticed the nighttime struggles of Father Paisios asked the doctors, How will you ever be able to perform surgery on him? Whatever he gains during the day, he loses at night with the prostrations. During those years, the sanatorium was filled with tubercular patients, some of whom had been there for a long, as long as 20 years without having been completely cured. Some had lost hope. Others created various problems by quarreling, exchanging blows, or stealing, while still others tried to entertain themselves by disturbing and vexing the weaker and more elderly patients. Very few were those who had retained their mental health. From his first day there, Father Paisios had shown interest in those people, and although he had been transferred to a private room some twenty days later in order to have greater quietude, he only stayed there at night. All his daytime hours were spent visiting all the patients in turn in their rooms. His presence was a god godly balsam to the souls of the ailing. He spread joy and consolation, but also provided more profound spiritual help. With his hoarse and weakened voice, he narrated stories, not only from the Gerontikon, but also from his own life. And he tried to strengthen their faith, boost their patience, and lead them to repentance. When their behavior was not proper, he discreetly corrected it, and when he noticed anyone reading vulgar periodicals, he gave the reader money to cover their cost and then took them and tore them up. Whenever anyone was close to dying, Father Paisios remained supportively close to his side. And when he heard that someone had died, he read the Amamos Psalm for him. Footnote, this is the name of Psalm 119 or 118 in the Septuagint, which begins with the phrase, Blessed are the undefiled in the way who walk in the law of the Lord, and which is read at the funeral service. One day when the chaplain of the hospital was absent, the nurses were trying to find a priest so that a patient who was at death's door could confess and receive communion. Don't you hear confessions? The dying man asked Father Paisios, who was at his side. He did not know that a simple monk could not execute the mystery or sacrament of confession. At last, and with a sense of agony, he uttered, My dear father, my soul surrenders. Will I not be confessed? Father Paisios then consented to hear his sins. Several months later, after Father Paisios had returned to the holy mountain, he confessed the sins to Elder Tikhon, who told Father Paisios that he himself must observe the three-year canon which that person would have had to, obs to have observed. Father Paisios had become so loved by every patient that if he delayed in visiting some room, the patient sought him out in his own room. There everyone, doctors, nurses, and visitors, found him in the same position, kneeling on the bed with his eyes lowered and his arms crossed over his chest like a small child. He was so united with God that he did not interrupt his prayer, 
even when there were many visitors around him. And even though he was very weak and as yellow as bees, a beeswax candle, they did not sense that they had an ailing man before him, before them. On the contrary, they were filled with awe. They perceived that this incorporeal monk was holy. The few words he spoke stemmed from his experiences, and his vivid eyes saw beyond the visible. To a woman who later became a nun, whom he saw for the first time and knew nothing of, he said, Your self-will is a bronze wall which separates you from God. Another time a young woman, who had just come from France, visited him, and although it was the first time he had ever seen her, he welcomed her, saying, Welcome, Maria from Paris. Gradually the renown of Father Paisio spread, and people from all of Thessaloniki flocked to him to get to know him. The sisters who were tending to him and bringing him food visited him on a daily basis. The help which they received in return from him, however, was naturally far greater because it was spiritual help. From the very beginning, they confided their great problem in him. They wanted to become nuns and live together in a monastery, but the Metropolitan of Thessaloniki had not granted permission for the establishment of a monastery. The saint empathized with them because he understood from personal experience what it meant to want to become a monastic and be compelled to remain in the world. One day, he therefore told them, As soon as I get out of the hospital, the monastery shall grow like a mushroom. Within a year, you will be in the monastery. The surgery and the, quote, martyrdom, unquote, that followed. In November of 1966, although three months had already gone by since he had been admitted to the hospital, the surgery had not yet taken place because he was still physically weak and also because the doctors did not want to lose such a precious patient. It would be a blessing to have one or two more monks like you, they told him, to act as a counterbalance in this place and to have the patients follow our instructions. He, however, felt like a fish out of water. In a letter he wrote, I am out of this place here. I am out of place here. This situation has caused me to feel as if I've gone at least three years backward in my life. Spiritually, I've become bankrupt. In fact, he had actually packed his bag in order to leave the sanatorium more than a few times. Finally, the surgery was scheduled for November 15. The surgery of another patient who also suffered from bron bronchiectasis had preceded his. So Father Paisios visited him every so often to see how his incision was mending because he was worried about whether he would be able to care for himself after the surgery. Will I be able to wash my clothes? He asked the patient who was recovering. You have so many people taking care of you, he answered, and yet you ask about washing your own clothes? On the eve of the operation, he prayed fervently throughout the night. My God, if I am to live and be pleasing to thee, let the surgery go well. But if I am to displease thee, then let this be my final night. He underwent a difficult 11-hour operation. He received a transfusion of 12 units of blood, all donated by the sisters. The upper lobe of his left lung and a part of the lower lobe were removed. He was subsequently connected to a device that continuously monitored the intake and elimination of fluids. That device, quote, the martyrdom, unquote, as he called it, caused him an unbearable headache and severe pain in his back and chest, to which the little tubes had been attached. And although other patients had been kept on that device for only eight days, he had to be kept on it for 18 days. It is true that I suffered a great deal, he later wrote in a letter, but it was a worthwhile price to have paid without having an additional malady, and to have undergone such a small martyrdom because I benefited greatly. Prior to my surgery, 
I read both the passion of the Lord in the sacred scriptures and the lives of the saints as if they were simply stories. Now I will, quote, feel them, unquote, since I have felt some pain myself. Eventually the device was removed on December 4th, the feast day of St. Barbara. The elder had expected St. Barbara to help put an end to his, quote, martyrdom, unquote, on the eve of that day, which was a Saturday, but the doctors never showed up. The next day he was sad. If it was meant for St. Barbara to help, she would have helped by now. Now the doctors have gone for the weekend. Today being a Sunday, there's no way they will come. A small complaint also came to his mind. How many times had I myself lit the vigil oil lamps in the chapel of the saint? How many wicks and how much oil had I provided? How many times had I cleaned and straightened things up? And now how can it be that two draining tubes cannot be taken out of me? Then he immediately reconsidered. It seems that I may have in some way saddened St. Barbara, which is why she has not interceded to have the tubes removed. Suddenly he heard the sound of a hospital cart and saw the doctors coming into his room. We have received orders to remove your drainage tubes, they informed him. Very early that morning, even though it was a Sunday, the surgeon had told them, go and remove the tubes from the monk. St. Barbara had wanted her miracle carried out precisely on her feast day, and indeed, for the even greater reason of its being a Sunday as well. Concern for the establishment of the Hezekasterion. Ten days later, he was informed that he was to be discharged from the hospital. Within three hours, the saint went through all the rooms to say goodbye to all the patients. He spent the next few days before his return to the Holy Mountain in a house the sisters had in Neapolis, Thessaloniki, where the climate was rather dry. There almost all the sisters gathered every afternoon to read Vespers. Afterwards the saint read them portions from Abba Isaac, which he explained. Primarily he tried to help them understand that monasticism is a supernatural way of living and that the mission of the monk or nun is of greater importance than human philanthropy since a monastic's silent prayer results in God's help wherever it is needed. This was why, when he heard that there was some thought about also having a philanthropic foundation within the monastery, he said, if you are thinking like this, it would be better to stay in the world. Two days before Christmas, as the matter of Episcopal permission for the establishment of the monastery was still pending, he told the sisters, Tomorrow, which is the last day of the Christmas fast, we will pray all night long that God enlighten the bishop to provide an answer as to whether or not he will give his permission for the monastery. On the following day, the Metropolitan of Thessaloniki summoned Father Polycarpos and informed him that he had decided against the establishment of the monastery. Father Paisios then thought of asking for assistance from Father Agathangelos, a hieromonk he knew, who was from the Konitsa area and served in the neighboring metropolis of Cassandrea. The hieromonk interceded with Metropolitan Senecios of Cassandrea, who gave his blessing to establish a monastery in his region. Afterwards, with the help of Father Agathangelos, Father Paisios even found a site for the establishment of the monastery. It was a level spot on the side of a mountain between the villages of St. Paraskevi and Soroti. The land was soon purchased and the construction of the monastery began almost immediately. Also the saint, having prior experience from the difficulties he had encountered at Stomion Monastery, advised the sisters to take the necessary steps for having the new monastery recognized as an as a casterion and thus be self-governing. Footnote. Hezekasterion, in the world, outside Mount Athos, 
is a cenobitic monastery in which the local bishop has the right to intervene in spiritual matters alone, not in administrative matters. Having resolved within two months the long-standing problem of the sisterhood, all of whom had helped him for only a short period of time, he returned to the skeet of Ivaran in March of 1967. He did not, however, settle in the Kalivi that was in the damp ravine, but in the small shanty that sat in the sunlight. While the hardships of the surgery were certainly over with, it had left him with great sensitivity to cold and dampness, as well as with a serious problem with his intestines, which were already sensitive from the asceticism he had carried out at Sinai, and had become further impaired by the strong antibiotics which had been administered after the surgery. The saint therefore had to move to a place with a dry climate as soon as possible. Chapter 10 At Desolate Katanakia Settling in at the Kali of Hypatios The search for a place with a dry climate brought Father Paisios to desolate Kadunakia. In the middle of July of 1967, he settled himself in the northernmost Kali of Kadunakia, which having no church is known as the Kali of Hypatios, which was the name of the monk who had lived there before Father Paisios. The shabby Kali, isolated as it is in a narrow gorge, gave solace to the saint. It benefits me, he said, in that I don't see even a single house. I feel alone, really alone. The Kali consisted of four small structures, each with a separate entrance, and all of which were in such a state of disrepair that they looked more like chicken coops than living quarters. One of the fathers from the nearby brotherhood of the Danielites asked him, Footnote, having taken its name from Elder Daniel of Smyrna, reposed in 1929, the Brotherhood of the Danielites dwells at the Hezekasterion of the Holy Athenite Fathers, which had been founded by the Blessed Elder Daniel. Return to the text. They asked him, Father, will you renovate the Kelly? What can I renovate here? It is I who will be renovated for up there. He answered, pointing heavenward. He repaired only the sheets of metal on the roof of the one cell where he intended to stay and cleaned up the other three small cells to use them. One is a workshop, the other as an arkandariki, and the third for storing wood. In his cell he found a low, narrow chest which he used as a bed. Because of his recent operation he placed a woven rag rug on it for a mattress and spread a black sheet over that. Aside from that little chest, there was no space for anything else in the cell. There were a few icons on the wall and two skulls rested on the door lintel. Father Paisios kept it all just as he had found it. The Hesychastic Program The surrounding area was also ascetic. There were mostly holm oaks and very few other trees, a few poplars and two or three walnut trees on which the squirrels skittered up and down, not leaving a single walnut. In one of the two or three soil-filled terraces, there was a small garden where Father Paisios planted potatoes and onions. The potatoes did not thrive, but the onions did, so he ate on the onions with rusks. Although he lacked even the bare necessities, whenever anyone brought him provisions, he did not accept them. I can't eat anything because everything gives my intestines trouble, he said. Moreover, without even opening the packages he received, he instead took them to some needy elderly monks. He was so utterly without any possessions that even when he wanted to treat a passing visitor, he had nothing to offer him. Once someone tried to steal from his Kali, but did not find anything at all. Feeling pity for Father Paisios, he returned to bring him some bread and also to ask for his forgiveness. 
The utter lack of everything moves even thieves, the saint later commented. Isolated in the desert of Katanakia, he devoted himself to his hesychastic program. That one year at Katanakia turned out to be the last year he alone determined his own program. No one knew me then, he later observed, and I moved about as I pleased. I had my own tipicon. His tipicon was prayer, study, and handicraft. Since he could not do many prostrations after the surgery, he instead raised his arms aloft and standing thusly prayed for hours. Sometimes he clambered up the rocks above the Keli of Hypatios to the cave where Elder Ephraim the Talas had once lived. Footnote. Talas means the unfortunate one, the wretched one. See El Paisios of Mount Athos, Athenite Fathers and Athenite Matters, pages 129 to 131. That cave had been a hideout for robbers during the Ottoman reign of Greece. Father Paisios commented that the cave was later sanctified by the holy life of Elder Ephraim. Father Paisios carried out the church services with his combaschini, except for the services of hours, which he read each one at its appropriate time. At the end of each hour, he also used a combaschini of 300 knots to pray for various situations and other problems people had. Footnote regarding the hours, the first hour is read at 6 a.m., the third at 9 a.m., the sixth at 12 noon, and the ninth at 3 p.m. During the first hour, the saint offered prayer with the combaschini for infants and those living in virginity. During the third hour, he prayed for clergy. During the sixth hour, he prayed for all the people, ill people, and so on. And during the ninth hour, he prayed for the deceased. Return to the text. After the first hour, he also read a cathisma of the Psalter, while after the remaining hours, he read or worked on his handicraft, making small icons using wood or plaster. Footnote, the cathisma or cath cathismata are a fixed group of psalms. The Psalter is divided into 20 cathismata, which are included in the daily cycle of prayers. Return to the text. In the afternoon, after Vespers, he ate and then read the Synaxarion of the saint of the next day. After that, he said the Apodipnon with the Combaschini, and then began his vigil with its sweet immersion into the Jesus prayer, as he referred to it. He slept for not more than two hours, but even then the prayer did not stop. It continued within him, self-activating and unceasing. His inner work was remembrance of death, self-reproach, and glorifying God. In a letter he wrote, it is true that I receive more benefit from the illness and a little patience than I have from great spiritual struggles. Gratitude and glorifying God transform every bitterness into a spiritual sweetness. When one cultivates love for his Creator, it longs for the day, that blessed day, when he will pay off his two debts, his flesh to the earth because it is of the earth, and his soul to God for whom it from whom it comes. The holy martyrs understood and experienced this great mystery, awaiting the hour of their martyrdom with joy, just as worldly people anticipate a festival or a marriage. Likewise, the desert saints were inebriated with the love of their sweetest Jesus, as they wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and caves of the earth, where every pain, bitterness, and grief was transformed into spiritual exaltation through glorifying and thanksgiving to God. His face was often bathed in tears of compunction. One day, Father Daniel, from the Brotherhood of the Danielites, knocked on the door of his Kali for a considerable time, but there was no answer. When Father Paisios opened the door, he held an onion and a piece of rusk in his hands, while his eyes were filled with tears. How do you do, Father, said Father Daniel. Can't you see I am eating? I am always eating. Father Daniel was impressed, not only by the spiritual transformation 
reflected on the face of Father Paisios, but primarily by the manner with which he attempted to conceal his inner state. Communication with the Other Fathers On Saturdays and Sundays, Father Paisios at times attended Divine Liturgy at the Kelly of the Danielites, and at other times at the small skeet of St. Anne, or even further, at Carasia. Usually he left immediately after the Divine Liturgy without receiving a treat. His ascetic appearance, as well as his few words, made an impression on all the fathers. Whenever he assisted during the feast days of those Kelia, the fathers had the opportunity to interact with him a little more, and they also perceived how unobtrusively he ministered to them. Seeing Father Paisios ministering, Father Daniel later commented, You realize that whatever a spiritual person does, he does it willingly. He was a man born to live for his fellow man. Moreover, even though he was still suffering because of the operation, he often went to Kapsala, a distance of several hours on foot, to visit Elder Tikhon and for confession as well. In quest of spiritual benefit, he also visited the bedridden elder, Father Gabriel, at Corulia, where he lived in a cave in one of the precipitous rocks. Footnote, the ascetic Kali of Elder Gabriel was located there together with a chapel dedicated to the Holy Archangels. He also communicated with another veteran ascetic, the Romanian Elder Daniel, who lived at a lower level at Carasia. One day, Father Daniel asked him, You, Father Paisios, what Tipicon do you observe? First tell me your own Tipicon, so that I will then be able to recall my own rule, said Father Paisios in response. I, he said, as soon as I get up at night, I begin with the canon. He meant, of course, that's C-A-N-N-O-N. -N. He meant, of course, the canon, C-A-N-O-N. Elder, you have given it the right name. It is indeed a canon, C-A-N-N-O-N. -N. At the newly established Hezekasterion, Father Paisios frequently received letters from the sisters who were then in the midst of building the monastery and asking him to visit them and help them at the beginning of their monastic life. He, of course, felt greatly obliged for even the smallest amount of their solicitude, as well as for their donated blood, but he did not want to do something without firmly believing that it was the will of God. Thus, in August of 1967, barefooted, he ascended the peak of Mount Athos in order to pray and receive a sign from God as to his will regarding the matter. He also consulted with Father Tikhon, who told him to help the sisters since they were asking for his help. So it was that in December of 1967, after the first sisters had settled in the monastery, he went and stayed with them for two months in order to help them at the beginning of their monastic life. Soon enough, he ascertained that the sisters did indeed have a great deal of work, meaning, of course, spiritual work to do, starting from scratch. Furthermore, he would need to be extremely patient since God had sent him there. The first thing that he, together with their spiritual father, put in order was the selection of one of the sisters to minister as their sister superior, since the monastery had not yet been officially recognized in order to conduct the election of an abbess. First he spoke individually to each of the sisters about the matter, and then he said to all of them, in order for the monastery to embark upon a spiritual course, one must take the lead and the others must follow. This is a basic rule. This is why one of you must be the sister superior. The saint organized the daily program of the newly established Cenobitic Monastery and stipulated that the church services follow the Tipicon of the Holy Mountain. He considered devoutness, however, to be a matter of primary significance. He advised the readers and chanters to be well prepared and especially vigilant during the services, 
so that there would be no awkward breaks during the chanting or reading. Thus those who are praying will journey to heaven unhindered, he counseled, since the airplane will not encounter any voids. One day when a sister chanted without having prepared properly, he reproved her sternly. Did you think that you could open the book at the last minute, as if you were some great head chanter? What was that stuff you were chanting? And when he heard another sister chanting, Lord have mercy in a worldly manner, he approached her and whispered softly, What songs are you singing? Better to say one simple Lord have mercy with your heart. Another time, upon seeing a sister animatedly swinging her arms while she walked into the church, he reproached her. Why are you moving about like that? In church one must walk like the angels during the great entrance. Have you seen how the angels walk in the icon, the heavenly divine liturgy? That icon represented how Father Paisios wanted the sisterhood to present itself, not only in the church, but everywhere, attire, walk, gaze, speech, everything. He wanted everything to be properly suited to the monastic, the nun. As their daily study, he recommended the sisters read one chapter from the sacred gospels and the epistles of the apostles, one psalm from the Psalter, and a short section from the Evergetinos. Reading the gospel and the Psalter, he related, sanctifies one, even if he doesn't understand them. The ever yet he knows is a tremendous gift. Keep this book open next to your pillow. He also arranged that weekly short night vigils be kept by each sister in her own cell. The day after the vigil, he asked each sister whether she had any difficulties in observing it and was therefore able to scrutinize their progression. On some Sundays, when a priest was not available to them, they did not celebrate divine liturgy, so he recommended that they follow a program, which he called the Eremite One. After the service of Orthros and the Hours, the Ecclesiasticos rang the small bell, and the sisters went to their cells for an hour and fifteen minutes, which is the duration of the divine liturgy. They read the chapters that refer to the birth of Christ, his holy passion, and his resurrection from the gospel according to St. Matthew. And then for the remaining time, they said the Jesus prayer until the bell rang again. In the refectory, Father Paisios sat at the head of the table, and after the meal he answered questions from the sisters or interpreted something from the reading, which was usually the life of the saint of the day. Before Vespers, he talked with each sister separately and guided them in their personal struggle. Some of his advice included the following. You must be obedient. You must struggle humbly and reverently seek the mercy of God. You will begin to make progress in your own self when you cease looking to see what others around you are doing. Sanctify the start of your journey toward Christ by trusting in Christ for all things. The more you avoid human consolation, all the more will divine consolation draw nearer to you. Even the simple incidents that occurred each day provided opportunities for spiritual guidance. One day the aunt of one of the sisters visited the monastery to attend divine liturgy and also to see her niece. Father Paisios, however, who was strict about contacts with relatives, said, she will see her in the church. He assigned that sister to be reader that day so that the aunt could see and hear her niece. After the meal, he spoke about the incident to the other sisters and summed up, what do the aunt and the niece have to say to one another? The aunt saw that the niece is well and struggling. Isn't that what she wanted? During that time, the saint was often troubled by seeing the lack of devoutness and spiritual sensitivity in the sisters. One day he heard some of them calling a goat by the name of Marika, and that's a diminutive name for Maria or Mary, which is also the name of the Panagia. Did I hear right? 
Did you name the goat after the Panagia? No, they answered. The people who gave us the goat called it by that name. From now on, call it Gembelia, which means from the mountain. He said, having in mind the tribe of the Bedouins in the desert of Sinai. At another time, when he learned that one of the sisters did not proceed with appropriate devoutness while she was cleaning the holy sanctuary, he became upset and scolded her so severely that he later asked her forgiveness. Afterwards, the sister superior spoke to Father Paisios and said, Yaranda, forgive us for our ignorance. Please help us and we will be obedient. Two weeks before leaving the holy mountain, he gave his place at the head of the table in the refectory to the sister superior. Slowly, step by step, I must descend, descend, until I leave, he explained. And he spoke again to the sisters about the meaning of obedience. Just as a policeman is obedient to the captain of the police and a priest to the hierarch, so must every nun be obedient to the sister superior. From the moment you decided to become a nun, you must recognize that you are not prostrating to the person who is merely your friend just yesterday, but to a ranking officer of the church. On the eve of his departure, the sister superior pleaded with him, Yeranda, tell us something so that we can work on it until you return. What more can I say? I've said so much already. Upon her insistence, he added the following, There is but one virtue, humility. However, since this is not easily understood, then I would also add love. And one who loves, is he not also a humble person? When he returned to the Holy Mountain in February of 1968, he sent the sisters a letter in which, among other things, he wrote, As soon as I got back to the spiritual America, the Holy Mountain, my first job was to remember my sisters as a good elder brother. First of all, I will write a few words to my sisters, and then immediately I will begin the work, being the spiritual one, of tending to my sisters being properly settled in, spiritually settled. I pray that when I return, I will find that you are in a very good spiritual state, so I won't be forced to wound you. The truth is that I have greatly wounded you. However, the Lord knows how much it costs me. When a father has to discipline his children, he feels pain in his own heart. When the children receive a little slap, it only hurts the cheek. It follows that the pain felt by the heart is greater than the pain felt by the cheek. In any case, what I want to stress is that I have done everything out of spiritual love and concern for you. In the Divine Light Five months later, one late afternoon in July of 1968, Father Paisios began as usual his vigil. Following Apadipnon, he began saying the Jesus Prayer, and the longer he said it, the more his tiredness diminished, while a great feeling of joy grew within him. All of a sudden, at around 11 o'clock at night, his kali was filled with a sweet light, a heavenly one. It was very strong, yet it did not dazzle him. Bathed in divine light, he found himself in another spiritual world. He felt an ineffable exultation, and his body felt light. It was as if he was weightless. He sensed the grace of God in divine enlightenment, and divine insights ran swiftly through his mind like questions and answers. He asked, and simultaneously he had the answer. They were divine answers conveyed with human words. And they were so many that if he were to have written them down, they would have resulted, as he had said, in another ever yet he knows. That condition lasted throughout the night until nine o'clock in the morning. When that supernatural light faded away, everything afterwards seemed dark. He exited his kali, and all was dark as if it were night. What time is it? Has it not yet dawned? He asked a monk who was passing by there. What did you say, Father Paisios? 
he replied, baffled. What did I say? He asked himself and went back into his kali. He looked at the clock and then realized what had happened. The time was nine in the morning. The sun was already high and the day seemed like night to him, as if there was an eclipse of the sun. I was like one suddenly thrown from strong light into utter darkness, he recounted. The contrast was so very great. After that divine condition, I found myself in the other, the natural, the human condition, and started following my usual daily program. I did a little handiwork, I read the hours, I dipped a rusk into some water to eat, but felt all the while like an animal that sometimes scratches itself, sometimes grazes, and sometimes ga gapes idly. And I kept wondering, just look at what I've been occupying myself with. Is this how I have spent so very many years? Throughout that afternoon, I experienced such great exaltation that I did not feel the need to rest, so strong had that inner state been. Throughout that entire day, the saint saw, but only dimly. He could barely do his handiwork. Only on the following day was he again able to see normally. One month after that divine experience, Father Paisios left the desert of Katunakia in order to go to the holy monastery of Stavronikita. Chapter 11 At the Kali of the Precious Cross Elder's Departure from Katunakia Father Paisios stayed in the desert of Katunakia for only one year because it once again became necessary for him to leave his poor Kalivi. The reason for his departure this time was the sacred community's proposal to two of his disciples, who were hieromonks, who had dwelt at the Skeet of Ivaran. They were asked to undertake the reorganization of the Idurhythmic Monastery of Stavronikita into a Cenobitic one. The two hieromonks, Father Vasilios and Father Gregorios, hesitated at first, but Father Paisios encouraged them to accept the proposal, while he himself offered to assist them by staying in the monastery with them in the beginning and helping them later on by living nearby. Thus in August of 1968, the three of them settled themselves into the practically ramshackle monastery of Stavronikita and embarked on its material and spiritual reorganization. In a letter the saint wrote, we have, in a manner of speaking, been recruited. In effect, three men are in charge of virtually the entire monastery. We run the gamut of being supervisors to cleaners in order to organize all the duties of the diaconia. The Falling Asleep of Elder Tikhon Father Paisios was away from the monastery for the first ten days of that September, in order to tend to his elder Father Tikhon, who was then living in the Kali of the Precious Cross, which belongs to Stavronikita, and is about a twenty-minute walk from the monastery. Father Tikhon had been bedridden since mid-August, and was not eating anything. He drank only a little water. He did not, however, want anyone beside him so as not to interrupt his unceasing prayer. When he realized that the last days of his life were approaching, he consented to having Father Paisios remain with him. On the eve of his falling asleep in the Lord, September 9th on the old calendar, he told Father Paisios, Tomorrow I will die, and I don't want you to sleep so that I can bless you. For three hours, in spite of his great exhaustion, the saintly elder kept his sanctified hands upon the head of Father Paisios while he tearfully blessed and kissed him. My sweet Paisios, he said to him, we will have precious love unto the ages of ages. I will serve divine liturgy in paradise. You will pray from here, and I will come to see you every year. If you stay in this Kali, I will be happy, but as God wills, my son, on September 10th, Father Tikhon fell asleep in the Lord 
and on the next day he was buried in the grave which he himself had excavated next to his Kalevi. He had asked that he be left in that grave until the second coming of Christ, because he did not want his body to be exhumed. Three months later, in December of 1968, Father Paisios began reading, readying the Kali of the Precious Cross in order to move into it. He tired himself out while cleaning up areas which had not been cleaned at all for many years. At the same time, however, he was greatly moved by the absolute self-renunciation with which Father Tikhon had lived there. He had tinted only, tended only to the purity of his soul. He did not find one half-decent thing in the elder's Kali which would have been of service. Nevertheless, for Father Paisios, all the old and worn-out things of Elder Tikhon had great value, for they had been sanctified by his holy life. The night shineth as the day. One late afternoon, during the time he was setting the Kelly in order, Father Paisios, completely loaded down and carrying a bag full of things as well, set out from the monastery of Stavronikita to go to the Kali. He had gone about halfway, just before taking the path that descends into the hollow of Kaliagra, as the area is called, when a very confused young man who had many problems stopped him and started talking to him. Father Paisio stood there and listened to him, despite the drizzling rain and the approaching fall of night. Gradually they both became drenched, but the young man had not stopped talking. At some point the saint wondered to himself, How will I find the Kalivi in the darkness? I do not even have a flashlight. Nevertheless, as he did not want to upset the young man, he did not interrupt him, and so they remained there until midnight. When they parted, the young man headed for another Kali, where he was to receive hospitality, and the saint took the path leading to the Kali of the Precious Cross, which was difficult to trek, even in the light of day. As he walked in the darkness, he slipped on the mud and fell into a thicket of briar bushes. His shoes fell off his feet, his bag caught on the branches, and his garment had gathered up around his neck. As he could not see anything in the darkness, he could not make even the slightest movement. He stayed calm, however, and decided to remain there until daybreak. I'll begin saying the Apodipnon, he thought, and continue with the midnight prayers and the Orthros, and by that time dawn will break and I'll find my way to my Kali. I wonder, will that poor young man find his way? Will he find his bearings? He started saying the Apodipnon, but only got as far as the Trisagion prayer. As soon as he had started saying, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, his head became like a lamp from which light emitted. What occurred next is what another psalm recounts. The night shineth as the day. Psalm 139, 12, or 138, 12, the Septuagint. He figured out where he was, disentangled himself from the briar bushes, located his shoes, and took the path upon which a supernatural light was shining. As soon as Father Paisios reached his Kali and lighted the oil lamps in the chapel, that divine light vanished. Life at the Kali of the Precious Cross Two months later in February of 1969, Father Paisios resigned as supervising monk at the monastery of Stavronikita and settled into the small and unadorned Kali of the Precious Cross. Liberated from administrative concerns, he felt like an immigrant who had returned to his spiritual country, sweet Hezekiah. Isolated in the hollow of Kaliagra, the Kali of the Precious Cross was very peaceful. Everything about it was ascetical. A low, narrow door led into a small hallway. To the left was the chapel, dedicated to the exaltation of the Holy Cross. Opposite the entrance was the cell in which Father Tikhon had previously lived. It contained only a bed and a stool. Father Paisios had attached two boards to the two sides of the bed, 
which were not against the wall, for protection from the cold, such that the bed resembled a coffin. That ascetic bed was the sanctuary of his cell, as he referred to it. On the wall above his bed, he had placed a cross and an icon of the Panagia. Kneeling, he prayed for hours at a time on the bed, and from there he ascended high up to heaven. One day, as he was saying the Jesus prayer while kneeling upon the bed, he felt as if someone was pulling him, little by little, upward, even though he was on earth. His head had reached the sky, and he saw white, rarefied clouds surrounding him. He felt as light as a feather, and in his heart there was a heavenly exaltation, a spiritual airiness, as he had called it. From then on, he often repeated the word, a sense, a sense, Psalm 84, 5 or 83, 6 in Septuagint, especially when he wanted to motivate one to struggle for divine ascents, for ascending in virtue. Even the small cell which he used as an archantariki was ascetical, and that cell which was accessible from another exterior door were two simple counters, one opposite the other, made of boards resting on tree stumps and draped with old blankets. On the very rare occasions when he hosted a guest in his Kalivi, that is where the guest slept. My Kalivi does not agree with my heart, the saint related, because he had wanted to offer additional comfort for his guests. The Kalivi of the Precious Cross, however, was a sanctified place because of the many divine events that had taken place and continued to take place there. It had a profusely warm spiritual atmosphere, and thus it offered spiritual comfort, solace for body and soul, to each visitor. When the weather was pleasant, the saint received visitors outside in the yard under an olive tree. Near that open arcandariki, there was a cistern in which he collected the rainwater from the roof gutters. It was the same water that he also offered the guests. Once, some guests who had noticed there was only a very small amount of water refused to drink it so as not to deprive him of it. It is better if I am deprived of it, the saint told them, so that I can thank God for the water I have, I have had up to now and beseech him to grant some for those who do not have any. In the garden, he had planted wild cabbage and two to three tomato plants. To those who asked why he lived so frugally, he answered, I don't want to have concerns so that I can have more time for prayer. That is also why I don't make a variety of foods which would require shopping and cooking. I warm up a bit of water and rice, and soon enough my food is ready. An old blackened metallic vessel with a handle a small metal pot, a tin can, and a couple of tin plates and cups, which he had found among Elder Tikhon's things, along with a makeshift spirit lamp, were all that comprised his housekeeping articles. Someone who had seen him make tea in the tin can bought him a briki. This is a special metal coffee pot used to make Greek coffee. Now you must also bring me a nail on which to hang it, the saint told him, and detergent so that I can wash it. It will be better if you take it back. It was with considerable difficulty that he consented to keep some blessing he had been given. And as for the money that some secretly left for him, if he noticed it before they departed, he gave it back to them immediately. Otherwise he too hid it in books, which he gave as a blessing to students, or he repaid it exorbitantly, with small icons from his handicraft. He did the same thing with the money he received by mail and letters, as he had given instructions to the post office to return any checks sent to him. Once a doctor had sent him 1,000 drachmas in gratitude because he knew that the elder had been praying for his sick little girl. From the moment he had received the money, Father Paisios felt as if it were hitting him on the head like a rock as he had said, and he had no peace of mind until he had sent the money to poor children. 
getting paid for prayer is not possible, Father Paisios declared. Yerunda, how do you provide for yourself? Some people asked the elder. I have no problem, he answered. The water is free, refreshing, and provided by the rainfall. The Public Power Corporation is not needed at night. The stars and the moon give off light. I use the small amount of money I earn from my handicraft to buy a year's worth of rusks as well as my other needs. The permanent concern and work of Father Paisios continued to be his careful scrutiny of himself and his communication with God. To someone who had written asking about how he got along at his Kali, he had replied, I tried to carry out my duties and to avoid people who seek idle talk and prevent me from talking with God. I tried to be contrite before God, to present Him with my sins and my ingratitude, to ask humbly for His mercy and to be grateful to Him by glorifying Him. This particular study of God comforts me more than any other study. Each night at sunset, He began His vigil. He began by repeatedly whispering, O oh God, cleanse thou me a sinner. Luke 18, 13. For a short period of time, and then using the Kambaskini prayer rope, he said the Jesus prayer and did many prostrations. He usually kept vigil in the yard. Sometimes in order to support himself upright, he linked his arms through two loops of rope he had hung from the olive tree, and he prayed thusly for hours on end. Divine Eros set his heart on fire, inflamed his bosom, and rendered him entirely ablaze. When he was in such a state, he did not feel any need to sleep. A little before dawn, he dozed off, sleeping lightly for two or three hours, even though his heart was awake. Song of Songs 5.2 Oftentimes, while he slept, he venerated saints and was awakened by the sound of the kiss. At other times, he felt his guardian angel on his shoulder and immediately got up and kissed his own shoulder out of reverence for the angel. Once he woke up hearing angels chanting the doxology, Glory to thee who has shown us the light. He knelt down immediately and remained motionless to listen. That angelic doxology was imprinted on his mind and on his heart, and he also chanted it, sometimes aloud, and other times mentally. He occupied himself with his handicraft during the day. He made wooden icons, usually in stamped relief, which he for the most part gave away as a blessing. He left them outside the fence of, his, of the Kali with a note, a blessing, so that pilgrims could take as many as they wished, even though it was a lot of work for him to make them. He had very patiently made the molds by himself by carving out the steel plates, with his only tools being some broken files which he had manipulated like chisels by using a hammer to strike them upon the steel plate in order to form the negative of the images. He heated the molds in the fire and afterwards as he pressed the wood against them by using a small hand vise, the sacred images were imprinted upon it in great detail and with a particular grace. While his hands worked to produce those objects, from time to time, the words, Glory to thee, O God, sprang from his heart. The saint had entirely become one praying heart. One day, Father Paisio stood praying for many hours in the chapel. He felt no weariness at all, but as the time passed, he felt as light as a feather and sensed a sweet comfort and an inexpressible exaltation. At some point he thought to himself, Since I am missing two ribs, I will wrap myself in a knitted sweater so as not to catch a cold, and then I can continue to pray for as long as I can. As soon as that thought had occurred to him, he fell down into a heap on the floor. It took him a quarter of an hour to manage to get up and go to his cell to lie down. He later referred to that incident and commented, A natural human thought came into my mind, and look at what happened to me. Imagine what could have happened if I had had a prideful thought. 
the Divine Liturgy was not frequently celebrated at the Chapel of the Precious Cross. However, some priests who had celebrated the Divine Liturgy there had been spiritually transformed by the devotion and heartfelt chanting of Father Paisios. He chanted sweetly and unassumingly, immersing himself completely in prayer, as if he were in heaven and praising God as an angel. Once at the point when the priest came out to the beautiful gate to exclaim, Always, now and ever, and unto the ages of ages, he saw Father Paisio standing above the level of the ground. Overcome with awe, he tried to take a closer look, but was immediately compelled to lower his eyes because he could not look at his face. The saint was entirely suffused with light. When the priest exited the chapel, the saint had already prepared the treat, tea, rusks, and olives. Shortly before escorting the priest on his way, the saint spoke to him in a manner that did not allow for further discussion, saying, There is no need to speak of it to anyone. In the Desert But With People For Father Paisios, every day at the Kali of the Precious Cross was a day of resurrection, and a Pascha, the Pascha of the Lord. Having patiently sown his ascetical struggles during the previous years, he had become to, begun to reap the fruits of exaltation. In the small paradise of his poor Kalivi, God nourished him with paradisical joys, and oftentimes he attained a state of divine madness. In a letter he wrote, I too have a little experience of the spiritual madness that comes from divine eros. One reaches a point of divine absent-mindedness and does not want to think of anything else other than God, the divine, the spiritual, the heavenly things. In that state of divine eros, one is inwardly, sweetly ablaze, and from within that divine place of reticence, he madly bursts forth, glorifying God. In that state, he felt completely incapable of living temporal life. When divine eros is fired up, he noted, one does not sleep or eat. He continually prays, practices asceticism, and does prostrations, and feeds more so upon heavenly fervor. And when he is asked to go somewhere, he struggles and tries to come out of that condition, but cannot. That is, he falls down, which in turn is why he goes deeper into the desert, so that he will not be interrupted. But Father Paisios, in spite of his great yearning, could no longer go more deeply into the desert. As time went by, his name attracted more and more people to his Kalevi, and he came to the point of considering his name his greatest enemy, since it became a hindrance to his life of Hezekiah. The only thing he could do was to distance himself for a short while by going either nearby or further away on retreats, to hideaways as he referred to them. His usual hideaway was a simple Kalevi that he had made in a ravine just below the Kali. There in a dense thicket, in the lowest pit, he withdrew from people and delighted only in being assimilated to God and his fervent love. Once a hunter mistook him for a wild boar and fired at him, but God protected him and he was not killed. The incident itself did not trouble him in the least. What troubled him and caused him greater concern was when he realized that someone had seen him there, praying on his knees. I would have preferred that he had killed me rather than seen me, he said. Whenever he left his Kalevi, he also left some lukumia outside the gate of the fence along with a small box with a note that read, Write your names and what it is you want, and leave them in the box, and I will help you later with prayer. I did not come here to be a teacher, but to pray. And in a letter dated 1976, he wrote, As the years pass, I feel a greater need to distance myself from people. An entirely unknown place would be most helpful in allowing me to draw closer to God and help his creatures in a more positive way. 
This hope is constantly in my prayers, and I await the answer of God. Father Paisios indeed beseeched God to bless him to distance himself from people. But those seeking spiritual help and consolation flocked to him all the more. The lover of the desert had become a prisoner of his love for the people, and especially for those who were suffering and tormented. Even though he had beseeched God to allow him to enter more deeply into the desert, he had also asked a judge, an acquaintance of his, to find a way to place him under arrest so that he could help the imprisoned. Finally, his love for the suffering people, a pure and noble love which seeketh not her own, 1 Corinthians 13.5, obligated Father Paisios to sacrifice his love for the desert. Thus, in a letter dated 1978, he wrote, Unfortunately, I have become a production of the people and I do not run this production of mine, as I had a few years ago. Instead, others sort out its schedule. Basically, I myself run it, because my love for others obligates me to go out to them. The saint kindly and unpretentiously received people, attentively and patiently listened to them, and humbly and discerningly spoke to them, not as a teacher, but as a brother. He usually began his responses with, I think, or the thought occurs to me, and ended with, forgive me. He seated people on chairs higher than his own, and had great difficulty in allowing them to kiss his hand. Whenever my hand is kissed, he remarked, I am repulsed by my own self. While he thought of himself as a tin can that shines in the light of the sun, the people, on the other hand, thought of him as gold. It so happens, he related, that people with great faith come to the Kalivi to meet a saint, or so they think, and God, in order to reward their faith, galvanizes me, the tin can, and makes me shine in their eyes as if I was gold. Thus they increase their faith, but I, when they leave, remain as before, full of rust. To a group of young people who asked him to give them a word, he replied with deep reservation, what can I tell you, my children? What can I tell you? For years I have been struggling to reach zero, and I have yet to reach it. Enthusiastically greeting the elder's words, a professor commented, You, Father Paisios, are a saint. The saint answered, I am worse than the criminal who had committed only twenty crimes, although he could have committed forty, given what he had inherited, his background. I, however, if I have done twenty good things, should have done forty good things, analogous to what I have received in my background. What the visitors saw before them was the radiant face of an ascetic monk who imparted serenity and divine consolation. Just by hearing him say, Glory to thee, O God, which stemmed from his heart, they were transferred for a little while into his own spiritual atmosphere into glorifying God and constant communion with Him. Entering with Him into the little chapel of the Holy Cross was entering a place of prayer. Once, just as a young man was kissing the icon of the Panagia in the chapel, the saint remarked, If the Panagia were to appear before us now, do you think that we would spend time searching for the right tone in which to chant her hymn with my temptation surrounding me? the Troparian first O plagal of the fourth mode. Small supplication can to the holy Theotokos. No, instead from the depths of our heart, we would accentuate the syllables as we shouted to her. With my temptation surrounding me, searching for salvation, I have sought refuge in you. The heartfelt prayer of the saint profoundly moved the young man. At another time, a civil servant who was embittered with his supervisor, who had cost him a promotion, visited Father Paisios. The saint listened to him attentively, and then tenderly put his arm around his shoulder and led him into the chapel. He showed him the crucified Christ and said, Look, Christ forgave those who crucified him. Can't you forgive that supervisor? The man's heart softened, and he replied, Yeranda, I forgive him.
interactions with other ascetics and monastics. Oftentimes in the early mornings, Father Paisios visited fathers who lived in Kelia in the surrounding region. In kinship with those obscure strugglers and moved by their self-renunciation and monastic precision, he recorded their enlightening words as well as incidents from their lives. Usually he went to visit other Philaritos, who lived with his disciple Father Bartholomew a little higher up in the Cali of St. Andrew. Elder Philaritos is mentioned in Athenite Fathers and Athenite Matters by St. Paisios. Sometimes he went even higher to the blind Elder Manas and to Elder Trifon near the summit of Kapsala. He also visited Elder Cosmas, who lived in Ambilikia of the Holy Monastery of the Pantocrator. Many bore witness that the sunburned face of Elder Cosmas sometimes beamed so brightly that it blinded them. Even Father Paisios had seen his face beam the last time he had spoken with Elder Cosmas. Nearly every week or every two weeks, Father Paisios also went to the monastery of Stavronikita for Saturday Vespers and Divine Liturgy on Sunday. He took the opportunity to discuss various matters concerning the monastery with the abbot and also gladly offered his advice whenever other brothers sought it. However, most of the brothers, whose number had increased in the meantime, preferred to visit him at his own Cali. Among those who visited him frequently was Euthymios Scleris, as he had been known in the world, who six years earlier had followed Father Paisios to Sinai and had since then become a great schema monk, having received the name Athanasios in the Stavronikita Monastery. Father Athanasios had maintained his initial zeal for the monastic life, as well as his great love for Father Paisios. Father Paisios indeed rejoiced to see him struggle in a philotoma-filled way, in spite of his many health problems. Interactions with the Hesychasterion of the evangelist John the Theologian During that time, Father Paisios also helped the sisters of the Hesychasterion of St. John the Theologian. He frequently wrote letters to them, as well as responses to their letters, and also visited them from time to time, usually twice a year, obliging their persistent requests. They offered him hospitality in an isolated calivi, which he kept very clean and tidy, as if it were a chapel. Once he had fixed the date of his departure, he prepared his small bag two days in advance and did not allow the sisters even the chance to plead that he stay longer. In a letter to the sisters, the saint wrote, The goal of monasteries is a spiritual one, and there should not be any worldly element present, but only the heavenly one, so that souls can be inundated with the sweetness of paradise. But it is impossible for monastics to experience divine consolation, the sweetness of paradise, if they do not shun worldly consolation, and if their worldly frame of mind does not perish. Having experienced such things himself, the saint was saddened and greatly pained, knowing that although all monastics can also experience these same things, some got lost amongst things that are good for nothing, as he often remarked. He did everything he could, especially for the Hezekasterion, in order to impart a monastic spirit, a Hezekastic spirit, one without worldly interactions, without detailed deoconia, free from cares, worldly handicrafts, worldly comforts, and so on. He did not want the sisters to be preoccupied with activities that could distract them from their inner spiritual work and distance them from the goal for which they had gone out of the world. He was very troubled whenever he saw such tendencies and ambitions. He considered such traits to be an affront to monasticism and contempt for the Holy Fathers. In a letter to the abbess, he wrote, Perhaps I am very harsh and unyielding in my manner of thinking because I live under different conditions. I will help you in whatever I can in my own way until you become weary of me 
and are no longer able to endure my harsh manner and my unyielding line of thought. Father Paisios was unwavering in his belief because he always kept the will of God and the high expectations of monastic life, which is akin to the life of angels before him. If he ever came to the supposition that the entire sisterhood was unable to follow his unyielding line of thought, then he was determined to break his interactions with it. However, since he could see that there were sisters who sincerely desired authentic monasticism, he gave way to their supplications, or rather to the will of God. He therefore asked himself, Paisios, Paisios, who brought you here, the people or God himself? In fact, there are more than a few times that he had received a sign from God to continue helping the sisterhood. The saint also visited the Hesychasterion in another way, the spiritual way. One day, this happened in August of 1974, for example, while saying the Jesus prayer in his Kali, he suddenly found himself in the Hesychasterion near the sisters, who were at that particular time hauling buckets of cement. He walked past them and watched them while they worked, but the sisters did not see him. During one of his visits afterward, he asked the abbess, Do you remember, Yarandisa? When I came while you were hauling buckets of cement, you didn't treat me to one lukumi, or even give me a glass of water. I kept calling out, Yerandisa, tell one of the sisters to bring me some water, but not one of you heard me. At another time, he told her, I see everything through the television. If I had a telephone, I would have called to have asked you, how are you? With his spiritual television, he also saw two sisters, each in her cell, carrying out the first and foremost work of monastics, the inner scrutiny of the self and repentance. To the one sister he sent a letter wherein he wrote, This time it was worth it to find the best paper and write to you, and I believe that I will not harm you. I have a rule when I see something good, I like to point it out and commend it, and when I see something wrong, I must speak out against it. If you maintain the condition you were in on November 11th at about 6 o'clock in the morning, you will certainly win spiritual first prize. On that specific day and at that specific hour, the sister had been preparing for confession and felt profound contrition within. This occurred in 1975. To the other sister, the saint sent a page torn from the calendar with the date of December 26th in 1976. The synaxis of the Theotokos underlined, along with the following notation. At 3.30 at night, approximately, on top of all else that you are disobedient to, the Panagia, I will not write more. I await the letter in which you will write me of the thoughts you had had that day and of the struggle you had undertaken. On the back side of the page, he added, Panagia brought me a television that day, and I saw you in a very good state, and I rejoiced. It seems that you had suffered out of Philotimo and had very humbly and very contritely struggled. The sister replied that at that particular time, she had been pleading with Panagia for forgiveness because she had earlier argued with the superior sister. In a subsequent letter to her, the saint wrote, Most of the time a spiritual person is well because he can sense that he has been very bad after some disorderly conduct, etc. And thus pained, he repents for having displeased God and the superior sister. That had been the case that day. Entire years of intense supernatural struggles cannot raise the soul as much as one humble thought can raise it in one single minute. Do you see, my sister, how easy the struggle is for a soul to be saved and become holy? In September of 1970, Elder Paisios decided to transfer the sacred relics of St. Arsenios the Cappadocian to the Hesychasterion. He went, therefore, to Konitsa, where he had left the relics, upon departing for Sinai. Eight years having gone by, the people of Konitsa rejoiced to see the monk of Stomion Monastery again, 
although he himself was very reserved and virtually silent. Out of a sense of gratitude, however, he chose to visit the elderly mother of Katie Pateras, who had offered him hospitality in her home so many times. He found her in the village of St. George of Filipiada, where she was then living. As soon as Katie Pateras saw him, she said, Father, you went through so much trouble to come here and see my mother. It's no problem, he said. It will be over twenty years before your mother and I meet again. And to her mother, as he was saying goodbye, he added, We will meet again twenty years from now. Indeed, she departed from this life a few months later, July 1971, while Father Paisios reposed twenty-three years later. Writing the Life of St. Arsenios Upon returning to the Hesychasterion, Father Paisios placed the wooden chest containing the sacred relics of St. Arsenios under the altar of the Catholicon, without revealing its contents to the sisters. However, St. Arsenios revealed himself in a miraculous way to some of the sisters, and when the elder was informed of that, he spoke to the entire sisterhood about the life of St. Arsenios and the many miracles he had done in Farasa. In fact, he decided to write his life so that the new Cappadocian father would become known to the whole world, and other souls could be nurtured by his spiritual wealth. Father Paisios, of course, had not known Father Arsenios personally, but it was as if he had actually grown up in his presence, inasmuch as he had been nurtured since childhood by the stories of the miracles associated with the saintly father. Moreover, upon returning from Sinai, he had asked his brother Lucas to gather information about Father Arsenios so that it can be recorded, as he had said. On the basis of what he himself remembered and on what information his brother had gathered, he started with devotion and fear of God to write the life of St. Arsenios the Cappadocian. When Father Paisios had completed it, he gave his written material to Father Basilios and to Father Gregorios at the monastery of Stavronikita to see whether it required correction. Seeing that the text was not merely a simple narrative of the events in the life of Father Arsenios, but that hidden beneath the text were many spiritual experiences of Father Paisios himself, they told him not to change a thing, but only to write an additional chapter explaining how he had come to know Father Arsenios. Shortly after that, St. Arsenios himself visited in order to reward his devout Philotimophilled effort. The visit occurred on the first Saturday of Great Lent, February 21st, 1971, on the old calendar in the afternoon. While Father Paisios was reviewing what he had written, the saint appeared and caressed his head just as a teacher caresses the head of a student who has produced a well-written paper. The sweetness and heavenly exultation that Father Paisios felt was impossible for him to withstand. When St. Arsenios disappeared, he started running like a madman outside of his calivi, trying to find him. At times he shouted loudly, My father, my father! At other times he called out softly, My God, my God, hold on tightly to my heart. Let me see how this night will end. When it became dark and he had lost every hope of seeing him again, he turned his gaze yearningly heavenward, as had the disciples at the time of the ascension of the Savior Christ. Later on he entered his calivi. He did not want to eat or sleep for many days afterward. He felt that nothing could keep him on earth. He wanted to soar up into heaven to be near his saint. St. Arsenios appeared to him again the following month. It was midnight of March 29th on the old calendar, the feast day of the holy martyrs Ferracesios and Ionis, to whom the holy church of Farasa is dedicated. As he said the Jesus prayer while keeping a vigil in his cell, 
he saw himself in a large field that had been planted with wheat, of which he had to harvest a small portion. At the other end of the field, there was a communications unit in a building in which he also had an office and a responsible job. Thus, he sometimes harvested and other times ran to the office in order to transmit the messages which had accrued. Each time he went to the office, however, he found an officer working in his place. The officer sometimes went out and said to those who are not harvesting, Since Christ will pay you, why aren't you harvesting? Fearing that the officer might rebuke him, Father Paisios hesitatingly said, Please forgive me. I have only half a lung and cannot work any harder. The officer kindly responded, I know that you have only one lung, and what makes me love you all the more is that you do not accept checks by post. I also watch you in the post office. The officer then took him aboard a strange vehicle that traveled as fast as lightning over the earth. As they were talking, the officer was transformed. He took on the form of Father Arsenios, and he embraced and kissed him. Before I even had the chance of getting my fill of him, Father Paisios wrote, Saint Arsenios shouted aloud, Stop! Stop! Immediately the vehicle stopped above the Cali of the Precious Cross, and Saint Arsenios said, You will get off here. I will get off in Thessaloniki, since I live near there. Father Paisios considered those final words of St. Arsenios to be an affirmation that he was pleased that his sacred relics had been transferred to the Hesychasterion of St. John, the theologian, which is located near Thessaloniki. After that miraculous interaction with St. Arsenios, Father Paisios decided to meet with the Frasiotis scattered throughout various parts of Greece in order to verify the information he had included in the life of the saint and to gather even more information. After Pascha of 1971, he went to Thessaloniki to meet the Pharisiotes he had known from the time he had been a soldier. With great joy, they offered him hospitality, and as they noticed that he ate so little and did not even touch the bed they had prepared for him, he reminded them of their beloved Haji Afentis. They told him whatever they knew and recommended that he also visit their relatives who lived elsewhere. Thus from Thessaloniki he went on to Plati and from there to Konitsa by way of Ionina. He met someone he knew from Konitsa at a travel agency in Ionina. So they took the bus for Konitsa together. As they were leaving Ionina, a truck coming from the opposite direction went out of control, causing a multi-vehicle crash. However, the bus on which the saint had been traveling found itself a few meters off the road, as if it had been guided by an invisible hand, and had therefore avoided the collision. The man from Konitsa attributed that amazing event to the presence of Father Paisios, who at the time of the incident had had his eyes closed. It had appeared as if he were asleep, but he had actually been praying. Father Paisios, the man from Konitsa later said, if you had not been there, we would have all become a pillar of salt. Did you see anyone making the sign of the cross? responded the saint. When you get on a bus, pray that you will travel safely. From Konitsa, he collected the books and handwritten notebooks of St. Arsenios from his chanter, Prodromos Kortsinoglu, who had saved them, and then he went on to Athens to continue his research. There, however, he realized that the association of Pharasiotis preferred to remain silent about the miracles of Father Arsenios, and instead to promote the Metropolitan of Caesarea, Paisios II. Saddened by that, he then went on to the villages of Drama to meet with other Pharisiotes who still maintained the Anatolian aroma of devoutness.
the visit from Elder Tikhon. In September of 1971, Father Paisios received his first visit from Elder Tikhon, who before falling asleep in the Lord had promised that he would come each year to see him. Three years, however, had gone by without a visitation, which made him think that perhaps he had erred in some way. While saying the Jesus prayer at around midnight of September 10th in the old calendar, he suddenly saw Elder Tikhon enter the cell. Immediately he ran up to him, embraced him, and then knelt and began to reverently kiss his feet. He, however, quickly freed himself from his hands, headed toward the chapel, and disappeared. Father Paisios immediately lit a candle in order to mark the date on the calendar. When he saw that it was September the 10th, that is the day Father Tikhon had fallen asleep, he was very saddened that he had not noticed it earlier. However, on the previous day, he had had many visitors from the morning on, and so he had been very tired when he had started his vigil at night. After that heavenly visitation, he spent the rest of the night in thanksgiving and doxology to God. There may also have been other visitations of Elder Tikhon, of which we do not know. Once, however, when the devil appeared in the form of Elder Tikhon in order to deceive him, the saint looked at him searchingly, and discerning a coldness in his presence, said, You are not my elder. At the Laico General Hospital in Athens During Great Lent of 1972, Father Paisios went to Athens because Father Athanasios Scleris from the Stavronikita Monastery was an inpatient at the Laico General Hospital. The doctors had diagnosed cancer in the lungs, a metastatic cancer of the eye which had been removed, but were hesitant to inform him. What are we going to do, Father? they asked the elder. Should we tell the brother about his condition? You must inform him, he replied. We are monks after all, die to the world when we enter the monastery. We no longer exist. He himself remained with the ailing brother and helped him face up to his illness as a monk with absolute confidence in God and without seeking out the human consolation of his relatives who frequently visited him in the hospital. It is not appropriate for you, a monk, to expect help from your family, he told him. Indeed, Father Athanasios endured the difficult illness without complaint and underwent such a spiritual transformation that he shone with joy. He was no longer looking at death before him, but rather at the real life that was to follow. With the presence of Father Paisios in the hospital, God provided that many other souls were also helped. Each day the waiting room and the hallway outside Father Athanasios' room was filled with doctors, students, and unpretentious people who waited to talk with the elder. One day, five young men, seeing many people around a monk, approached and began making critical remarks. You monks are lazy. You are right, replied the saint. We are vagabonds and anarchists, they continued, which is why we have beards and long hair. I too have a beard and long hair for Christ. I too am a vagabond, but for Christ, he responded. The young men were impressed. They took him aside and were interested in learning about the life of monks. In the end, they asked, Where do you live so we can come and visit you? On another day, as Father Paisios was talking with a group, two oddly dressed students with long hair approached him. The saint, discerning that one of them had a good disposition, abruptly stopped the conversation and began talking about prayer. Then that particular student interrupted him. Father, he said, I have never prayed in my life, nor have I ever had anyone pray for me. Do not worry, Christos, he replied, I will pray for you. Christos later visited Father Paisios on the holy mountain and was greatly helped. 
based on such incidents and other similar ones, the saint one day remarked, The young people have ideals, but they do not have models and are without leaders to guide them. They see many Christians who are tightly buttoned up, all made of the same mold, and they react negatively to them. And so they want to do away with everything. Some catechetical teachers try to restrain the young with ethical lessons when what is actually needed is the motivation of their philotimo, and for the teachers themselves to lead a simple but authentic Christian life in order to inspire them. For me, a vagabond with a good disposition is better than a hypocritical Christian. Father Paisios remained in Athens for almost an entire month until the Sunday of Thomas, when a monk from Stavronikita Monastery replaced him in ministering to Father Athanasios. Come on, let's fly. Before returning to the Holy Mountain, Father Paisios again visited six villages in the region of Drama, desiring to find some devout elderly Pharisiotes who were still alive and had known St. Arsenios. An acquaintance of his, an unassuming and genial man named Eleftherios, who had offered him hospitality in his home in Thessaloniki so that they could have an early start the next day, drove him to those villages. Shortly before awakening the next morning, Eleftherios dreamt that he saw Father Paisios, who asked him, Do you have faith? I do, he replied. Do you have faith? he asked again. Yes, I do, he again replied. Then Father Paisios said, Come on, let's fly. He put him on his back and started to fly, higher and higher. The sky had the color of lead, and as they were flying, Eleftherios could hear Father Paisios shouting to repel the devils, which he could not see. Eventually they entered a church just at the time the divine liturgy was ending. Other monks were there, and the celebrant was St. Arsenios. His face was the color of a ripe quince and overflowed with grace. He was entirely aglow. When they had descended and stood upon earth again, Eleftherios felt that he had re-entered his body as a foot enters a shoe. He opened his eyes and as he did so, felt as if he had not been asleep. He was still intently experiencing what he had seen in his dream and ran directly to Father Paisios to tell him about it. Before he even said anything, Father Paisios smiled and asked him, did we fly? Did we fly? Greatly surprised and deeply moved, Eleftherios started making prostrations before him and kissing his hands. You will not relate this to anyone, the saint said sternly. From that time on, each time they met, Father Paisios, smiling, asked him, Are we going to fly? Are we going to fly? The departed one smiled at him. As soon as Father Paisios returned to the Holy Mountain, he sent a letter to the ailing Father Athanasios, in which he wrote, among other things, the following, I rejoice because you joyfully proclaim life, which is wrapped up with the mortal flesh. This great mystery is not easily understood by those who are merely flesh. However, the letter did not reach Father Athanasios in time. He had already departed for the true heavenly life. When the deceased was brought back to the holy mountain for burial, the brothers at Stavronikita Monastery and Father Paisios went down to the dock to receive him. At that moment, the saint saw that he was shining so brightly that if others had not been present, he would have shouted aloud with joy. Later, when he went to offer the final kiss, he was deeply moved and said what he used to say to him in jest at Sinai. Hey, you asleep at the wheel, governor. And then he re the repose Father Thanasius smiled.
in Constantinople and in Farasa. After his last visit to the village of Drama, Father Paisios' heart was burning with the longing to visit Farasa. The good God provided that his longing soon became a reality. In October of 1972, the abbot of Savernikita Monastery needed to travel to Constantinople and to the Ankara to request certain documents for the monastery from the Registry of Deeds. He was accompanied by Father Paisios, and so a visit to Farasa was also scheduled. In Constantinople, the saint marveled at the magnificence and grace of the churches, but was also pained over the deplorable conditions to which they were subjected. In the church of Hagia Sophia, he stood behind a column and prayed tearfully. A guard who had noticed him angrily pushed him away and said, It is not permitted to pray here. The saint then took the guard by the hand and led him to a spot where there was urine on the floor. Is this allowed? He asked him with an air of censure. From Constantinople they went to Ankara, and from there to Caesarea, where they started to ask how to get to Farasa, which was no longer marked on the map by that name. Some elderly Turk told them that a holy priest called Hagiophantes, who could heal sick people with his prayer, had once lived in that village. After many difficulties, they found their way to Farasa, where by then only Turks lived. Forty-eight years had gone by since the Greeks had been uprooted, and there was no longer anything to remind one of the previously well-kept large Greek market town. The houses were in ruins, the streets filthy, the church of Saints Ionis and Veracasios had been turned into a mosque. The cemetery church of St. George was practically demolished. The cemetery itself had also been devastated, with many bones scattered on both sides of the forest road that passed through it. Anguished Father Paisios gathered as many of those bones as he could and buried them in one corner. A Turk who had lived in Farasa before the population exchange, and knew the dialect of the Farasiotes, pointed out a flattened spot of land. It was where the cell of Hagiophantes had once stood. In addition to that Turk, they had also been followed by the teacher of the town and some other villagers, one of whom commented. For him to come back here, his parents must have told him that they had hidden a cache of valuables here. Father Paisios did indeed find a cache, but not the kind the Turks suspected. He had found sacred traces of the Holy Father Arsenios. He returned from his trip, deeply moved by the pilgrimage he had been able to make, but also deeply saddened by what he had encountered. What magnificence there had been in Hagia Sophia, back then in Byzantine times, he exclaimed. The visiting Russians had been so odd that they proclaimed it to be heaven on earth, and look at the condition of Hagia Sophia now. My soul was in pain. Then he further reflected, didn't God want Byzantium to exist? He wanted it to survive, but the sins of the people and of their leaders were the reason why it was lost. God sent sustenance. In 1973, the problem Father Paisios had with his intestines worsened. He suffered from pain and diarrhea, and had gotten to the point where he could not drink any water at all without eating a little food of some substance. Substance. In a letter he wrote, I have observed that when I go to the monastery and eat something of substance, and drink a little astringent wine, my intestines do not bother me at all. In other words, it is as if they are asking me to go easy on them. From the monastery he received rusks, nuts, and wine, which had actually become medicinal for him. 
Once, however, instead of wine, they accidentally gave him a bottle of vinegar. And the saint, because he had thought that it was what God had willed, did not ask that they give him wine, and so he drank only water. His condition again worsened. Even the little water he drank created a big problem for him. Thus, after forty days of suffering, he even stopped drinking water. Then an amazing thing happened to him. At one point, thirsty as he was and about to faint, he entered the chapel to light the oil lamps. And what did he see? In front of the iconostasis, beneath the icon of Panagia, was a bottle of wine. In a letter he wrote, The bottle was mine. I recognized it. But how had it been filled? No one had visited during those days, and I myself had gone in and out of the chapel and had not seen a thing. It was an astringent wine, medicinal and beneficial to me. Other amazing incidents also took place. On Sunday of the Blind Man in 1973, the saint did not go to Stavrinikita Monastery because he was ill. At noon, he felt great fatigue, and he thought the thought occurred to him that if he had a little fish to eat, it would benefit him. He went out into the yard at some point, and looking to the horizon, saw an enormous eagle flying towards him. As the eagle flew above Father Paisios' head, it lowered itself and allowed a fish to fall from its talons. The saint was puzzled because the eagle had not come from the sea, but from the other side. He feared that it might be from the evil one, and immediately entered the Kali. Having prayed and reassured himself that it was from God, he went out again and found the fish still quivering. He later remarked, The good God provided a fish from the mountain, either because I was ill or because of the great exhaustion I had felt after fasting. He received such strength from the amazing event that he felt that he no longer had need of the food. Do you have the heart to eat after such an experience? He asked himself. He took the God-sent fish to Elder Philaritos and to Father Bartholomew as a blessing. As a memento of that amazing event, he drew an eagle holding a fish with his talons on the board he had placed on the side of his bed. He also wrote a brief note about the event in the margin of the entry for the Sunday of the Blind Man in the Pentecostarion. He later cut the page where he had written the note. However, to avoid accidentally cutting out any of the hymns on the other side of the page, he was obliged to leave some of his note and so erased only some words so that nobody could make any sense out of it. What remained is as follows. Glory to God and thanksgiving to those who pray and dispatch mercy silently with the birds of God to the creatures of God. He told the sisters of the Hezekasterion that it was they who had sent him the mountain fish as an offer of mercy. At another time, as he was going to a nearby small hill to say vespers, the saint saw a large white mushroom. He thanked God for the rare find and thought of retrieving it when he returned in order to use it that evening. Upon his return, he found that the mushroom had been halved. Some animal must have eaten the other half, and he took it, thinking that it was as much as he should eat. Further on, he found another half-mushroom, which was spoiled. He left it, again thanking God, who had perhaps protected him from getting poisoned. So that evening he ate the halved mushroom, thanking God for the abundant food he had provided for him. The next day, upon exiting his Kalevi, he encountered a strange sight. The entire area was filled with beautiful mushrooms. He was moved and broke out into a doxology. 
He used to refer to that event as if it had taken place in the life of another monk. He used to say, That monk thanked God, both for the whole mushroom and for the half, for the good mushroom and the bad one, and for the one as well as for the many, thanksgiving for everything. Pilgrimage to Tinos and Egina It had been a year since Father Athanasios had fallen asleep, and his brothers had still not told their elderly mother. Because they could not bring themselves to tell her, they asked Father Paisios to visit and tell her himself. Out of love he yielded, and in July of 1973 he went to Velo of Corinth to meet her. He talked with her for more than four hours, and in defense of Father Athanasios, who had not visited her, he said, Father Athanasios and I have agreed that for the sake of our monastic exile, he will visit my parents and I will visit his. Consoled, she then replied, As long as I live, it suffices for me to know that my son is on the holy mountain. Afterwards, Father Paisios told her children not to tell her anything. His visit also afforded him the opportunity to accept the offer of some friends to accompany him to the island of Tinos, where he could reverence the miraculous icon of the Panagia, the Megalocari. As soon as they arrived on that blessed island, the saint perceived an intense fragrance and when he venerated the mesmerizing icon of the Panagia, he was overwhelmed. He stepped aside a little so as not to block the others and could not take his eyes off of the icon of the Panagia. He looked upon the Panagia with tears in his eyes and noetically, out of the great abundance of her grace, took it all in. He commented that such a small icon has so much grace in a letter he also wrote, Glory be to God who enabled me to reverence her holy icon. I am thankful and not worthy to see her in person in heaven. I am very pleased and grateful to her, and I will be grateful to her throughout my life. The same group of people also accompanied him to Agina, where he reverenced the tomb of St. Nectarios. There he also perceived an intense fragrance. It was obvious that he had been transformed after both of those pilgrimages. To a priest from Agina, he said, What a wonder you have over there. What is it that we have, Yaranda? My, what a wonderful fragrance. The whole area is fragrant. As soon as I set foot on the two islands of Tinos and Agina, I perceived an intense fragrance. A priest who was from Tinos asked him, what did you see in Tinos, Yaranda? Tell me so I can write it in a book. The things I saw are not to be spoken of, he replied. They are unspeakable words. 2 Corinthians 12.4 I will tell you one thing. Panagia is very much alive. Very much alive. The Life of Father Arsenios and His Icon Father Paisios completed writing the life of St. Arsenios in February of 1974 and then went to the Hezekasterion to edit the text with the help of the sisters. However, he did not accept all of the corrections suggested by the sisters. In his writing, he applied rules which, although they differed from the rules of grammar, were dictated by his devoutness and spiritual sensitivity just as devoutness had been the core essential throughout his life. For example, he capitalized the word meaning island when referring to the island of Kirkira. This island has incorrupt sacred relics, he declared. And are we now going to spell it with a lowercase letter? He wanted the same treatment for the word cemetery and asked, have you thought about how many crosses there are in a cemetery? And when the sisters suggested that he remove 
the conjunctive verb also from the sentence, May the good God grant repose also to the souls of all those faithful who kept with devotion the traditions of the Holy Fathers of our Church and who also preserved in their pure memory the life of their Holy Father, he became very troubled. For me, that also is a burning issue. I did not put it there by chance. Do you understand? Are we then to exclude all those others who have fallen asleep and to pray for God to give rest only to the others? The elder often interrupted the work in order to give the sisters a break. During one of those breaks, the elder told them about the time during his childhood when an elderly Farsioti, who every time they ran across each other in Konitsa, asked him, Arsenios, do you remember what happened that time in Farasa? Naturally, he answered, No, I don't remember. But the Farsioti insisted and asked again, Don't you remember? From the time the saint had told that story to the sisters, whenever he wanted to refer to some particular event from his own life, he asked them, Do you remember when? To the answer, No, Yeranda, he sometimes responded, Since you do not remember, I will tell you. And then he went on to relate the event. At other times, however, he responded, Since you don't remember, what can I tell you? And then he stopped the conversation. Thus some of his, do you remember, remain unanswered, as per the following. Do you remember what happened in the chapel of St. Barbara in 1948 and 1958? Do you remember what happened at the summit of St. Catherine? Do you remember who buried the Bedouin? Do you remember how much time it takes for one to go around the world? The amazing answers to these amazing questions remain unknown. The corrections to the text of St. Arsenius' life were very carefully inserted by the elder himself so that everything was written by his own hand. As soon as the corrections were completed, he started writing a clean copy of the entire text from the beginning. When he reached the epilogue and was writing the sentence, as a celebrant he shined in the world, his pen gave off sparks as he wrote the word shined. He felt the living presence of the saint even more intensely then, and his heart was flooded with great joy. In parallel with penning the life of St. Arsenios, Father Paisios also assisted the sisters as they painted his holy icon. Indeed, he was constantly next to them so that they could render the image of the saint as precisely as possible. Just as he himself had seen him in a vision, and just as the elderly Pharisiotes had described him, he particularly insisted on the cheekbones of the face. He stressed that they should be the color of a ripe quince, and they be differentiated with colors that are soft and humble rather than hard and bright colors. He wanted the beard to appear soft, like cotton. He did not want the monastic hood to be pointed. He said that a halo should not be included in the icon, since Father Arsenios had not yet been officially proclaimed a saint by the church. The Visitation of St. Euphemia She is commemorated on the 16th of September and on the 11th of July. Father Paisios returned to the Holy Mountain on February 26, 1974 on the Old Calendar. On the following day, February 27th, at about 10 o'clock in the morning, while doing the service of the hours with the Combeschini, he suddenly heard a knock on the door and a soft female voice say, through the prayers of our Holy Fathers. He was startled and asked, Who is it? He heard the same voice say, Euphemia. Which Euphemia? 
he wondered to himself. Did some woman do a crazy thing and come to the holy mountain? The knocking was repeated three times. At the fourth knock, the door, even though it was locked with a bolt, opened on its own, and St. Euphemia, the great martyr, entered. She was accompanied by St. John the Theologian, who did not enter with her, but disappeared immediately. St. Euphemia was entirely alight. Her garments, as well as the clo cloth shoes she wore, were a heavenly blue color. In her presence, the saint felt a peace that became a divine elation. But in order to be absolutely reassured that it was truly St. Euphemia and not some demonic fantasy, he asked her to venerate the Holy Trinity with him and said, Say in the name of the Father. She repeated the phrase softly and made a prostration at the same time, but not towards the chapel as he was doing, but towards his cell. The saint was puzzled by this, but soon realized that St. Euphemia was looking at the small icon of the Holy Trinity, which was hanging above the door of his cell. Say it louder, he told her. St. Euphemia said it a little louder. A little louder, he told her again. And she repeated the phrase a little louder. And of the sun, said the saint. And of the sun, repeated St. Euphemia. And of the Holy Spirit, continued the saint. And St. Euphemia repeated it and made the prostrations. And now I will also venerate you, he told her, and prostrated reverently before her. He kissed her feet, her hands, and the tip of her nose. Then they sat in the small hallway, where there was a small chest and a stool, and St. Euphemia recounted her life and her tortures. As she recounted the events, the saint did not simply hear, but felt that he saw and experienced them. How did you endure so many tortures, he asked her. If I had known how much glory the saints have in heaven, I would have wanted to endure even greater tortures, replied St. Euphemia. Afterwards, he asked for her advice on three matters that he was concerned about. One was an ecclesiastical matter. People had asked for his opinion on it, and St. Euphemia reassured him that the answer he had given was the correct one. The second matter was about the publication of the life of St. Arsenios, and the third matter had to do with two issues regarding the Hesychasterion. When St. Euphemia departed, Father Paisios was in a state of divine madness. He remained shut up in his calivi, inundated as it had been with a divine fragrance, in that paradisical atmosphere which St. Euphemia had brought with her visitation. His mind was focused on her holy appearance, while his heart was about to burst out of sweet love and inexpressible joy. He kept shouting, Saint Euphemia, you have made me into a madman, a madman. Do you know what you have done to me? Oh, what an exquisite sweetness. Twelve days later, the saint visited the Hesychasterion, wanting to share the heavenly elation he was still experiencing with the sisters. During the days he spent with us, it was clear that he was still living in the atmosphere of that divine visitation. One evening, a sister found him fervently kissing an icon of St. Euphemia. He was entirely divinely transformed. He bubbled over with divine love, and his breaths were loudly resonant. Each one sounded like the gushing of a warm steam. The state he was in was similar to the one he had been in four months earlier and which he had described in one of his letters. True love for God, together with its sacrifices, sweetly warms the heart, and like steam, divine eros, which cannot be restrained, gushes out, and one is thus united with God. 
from the Epistles of St. Paisios. Later, in remembrance of the visitation, the saint wrote a hymn which he chanted with his whole heart whenever he was alone. With what hymns of praise can we honor St. Euphemia, who condescended from on high above to visit a wretched monk residing in Kapsala? Three times she knocked on his door, miraculously it opened with knock number four. And with heavenly glory, the martyr of Christ did enter, and together they did venerate the Holy Trinity, confirming in this way delight divine and of peace a certainty. He also assisted the sisters in painting the icon of St. Euphemia, which depicts her standing and knocking at the door of his cell. He kept a small wooden icon that held a picture of that icon on his pillow in his cell on the holy mountain for a long time. Due to his many fervent kisses, the icon had disintegrated and the form of the saint was no longer visible. Although the image had left the paper, it had become imprinted on his heart. In one of his letters, the saint wrote, The saints rejoice when they are imprinted on the hearts of people. When a Christian venerates the holy icons and asks for help, if he is devout, then through his heartfelt kiss he takes in not only the grace of Christ, of Panagia, or of the saints, but he also draws all of Christ, or Panagia, or the saints into his heart, so that they become part of his own inner temple. For man is the temple of the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians 6.19 his great love for the great saint, who although she had been unknown to him, had so greatly honored him through her visitation, continued to burn within his heart, until twenty years later, on the day after her feast day in 1994, when Father Paisios went to meet her in paradise. The Treat of St. Arsenios during the time that the saint stayed at the Hezekasterion, after the visitation of St. Euphemia, another miraculous event took place. One afternoon, while he was with some sisters, making some final changes to the life of St. Arsenios, the cell they were in was suddenly flooded with an intense fragrance. It was as if many bottles of perfume had broken, as wave after wave of the heavenly fragrance enveloped the faces of the elder and the sisters. They immediately realized that the fragrance was emanating from the holy skull of St. Arsenios, which was in the cell. Deeply moved, they venerated the holy relics with great joy, and afterwards the elder went to the window and began to shout, Come, we have fragrances here, we make incense. All the sisters went and reverenced the holy and fragrant skull. The elder then said with great joy, St. Arsenios has given you a special treat for the work you have done. He, of course, was referring to the help the sisters had provided on the final draft of the saint's life. Help to One Fallen Asleep on the morning of November 30th, 1974, on the old calendar, the feast day of St. Andrew, Elder Paisios was in his keli on the holy mountain saying the Jesus prayer while kneeling on his bed when a young man suddenly appeared before him and said, We must go because you are a witness. A witness? he asked doubtfully. Yes, a witness in a court of law. Immediately, without realizing how, he found himself standing before a grave in the cemetery of Konitsa. With a gentle wave of his hand, the young man opened the grave, and in it was an elderly woman the saint had known. Even though her body was partially decomposed and had an unbearable stench, he did not turn away from her. He entered the grave and, greatly pained, embraced her. She shouted, Monk, save me! Monk, save me! Then she said, Speak up! Didn't I give you something every time you asked for it? 
You always gave me far more than I had ever asked, replied the saint. Then the young man, who was her guardian angel, and who knew everything about her soul, told her, Sleep in peace. Covering the grave again, he told Father Paisios, Let's go. At the sound of Let's Go, the saint found himself in his previous position, kneeling on his bed. Because of that event, he realized that her soul was in great need of much prayer. For indeed, even though she had been wealthy, she had not offered charity to her poor fellow villagers. With him, however, she had not been stingy at all, because she had loved him a great deal. The saint prayed fervently for her soul, and two months later, on January 30th, 1975, on the old calendar, he was informed that the good God had heard his prayer. While he was again saying the Jesus prayer, he saw before him a huge chasm like a cone, and deep inside it were many people, including hierarchs, who shouted desperately as they were being tormented. High above that fearful chasm, he saw that elderly woman seated on a white cloud. Next to her stood that same young man her guardian angel, who was rubbing at and cleaning her face, which resembled the face of a young girl. Then the saint embraced her again with joy this time, and felt an exultation within himself. He then stepped aside so as not to be seen by the damned, and thereby increased their suffering, and chanted the Chersagi on him as a thanksgiving to God. The saint had certain certainly had other similar experiences, since in a letter he had written two years earlier, he had noted, The good God helps those who have fallen asleep, and at the same time he informs monks by granting them an inexpressible exaltation after their anguished prayers for their brothers or sisters who have fallen asleep. It is as if God is saying, Do not worry, my children, I have also helped those who have fallen asleep from the epistles of St. Paisios. Appearance of St. Catherine Although he did not reveal them, St. Paisios must have made many unusual visits just as he had also received many divine visitations. In another letter he wrote, The deprivation, estrangement, even of human spiritual consolation, allows the soul to ascend high into paradise, and allows saints and angels from heaven to descend in order to visit the image of God, man, and to keep company with him. In May of 1975, he was also visited by St. Catherine. While in his cell at the Hezekasterion, she appeared, very much alive, right before him, seated on a throne. The saint kneeled down and very reverently kissed her feet. When he related that divine event, he observed, St. Catherine is not as she is depicted in some icons. She is tall and thin. He sees souls departing for heaven. On May the 30th, 1975, on the old calendar, Father Paisios departed the Hezekasterion, to return to the Holy Mountain, and went the next day to visit Elder Falaritos and Father Bartholomew. As he approached their Kali, he became aware of a strong fragrance which intensified the moment he opened the door. Upon entering, he found Elder Falaritos in a heap on the floor, with fluid oozing from his feet, which were full of lesions. While such a condition would normally have produced a foul smell, Elder Philaritos was actually fragrant, as all the things around him were also fragrant because of his fragrant soul. Father Paisios took care of him as best as he could and asked Father Bartholomew for permission to stay that night with them in case they might need some help. Father Bartholomew did not consent to Father Paisios' offer to stay that night, but instead told him to come the next day 
and so the saint returned to his kali. At midnight, however, as he was doing the midnight service with the, the Kambaskini, he suddenly saw other Falaritos, with the bright face of a young child, depart for heaven within a heavenly light. With that he realized that his sanctified soul was at peace in the Lord. On another occasion, while praying in his kali, he suddenly saw, as if on a television screen, a funeral taking place at the Hesychasterion, and the soul of the one fallen asleep, who resembled a young twelve-year-old girl, ascend to heaven and go directly to the chorus of the monastics. He could not make out which sister it was. He could see her, but he did not recognize her. He thought to himself, She is not young, she is not one of the older ones. It appears that she is unknown to me. She was in fact an elderly woman, who although seriously ill, had gone to the Hezekasterion, become a nun, and twelve days later departed for the true life. The Publication of the Book, The Life of St. Arsenios In September of 1975, the life of St. Arsenios was complete, and Father Paisios, after much prayer, decided that it be published by the Hezekasterion without referring to him as the author. With due diligence, he himself looked after the final details. He made a final comparison of the text with his own handwritten text. He chose the illustrations, he checked the maps, and asked that more place names be added, and he tended to the cover, which he wanted to be as simple as possible. He wanted one symbolic image, and preferred that it be a small boat, a symbol of the church, that was also a, rem a reminder of the arrival of the Pharisiotes in Greece. He also recommended that there not be even one blank page in order to keep the cost of the book to a minimum. The book was published in December of 1975. Warfare from the Demons during the following year, the saint attempted to help a 16-year-old boy who was under demonic influence. Georgakis, as he affectionately called him, had grown up in Tibet, where he had learned various magical and demonic concepts. On a trip to Sweden, however, he met an Orthodox priest who helped him understand that the power of demons is impotent before the power of the true God. After that, he asked to be catechized in the Orthodox faith, and that was how he came to be on the holy mountain at the Kali of the Precious Cross. As soon as Georgiakis saw Father Paisios, he said, I came so that we can talk. The saint, wanting to speak first with the monk who had accompanied the young man, told Georgiakis to go to, into the Kalevi and wait there. Not much time had passed, however, when he came flying out of the Kalivi like a wild man. He was foaming at the mouth. You do not have the power I have, he bellowed. How do you break rocks? With the heavy iron hammer, replied the saint. I can break rocks with a wave of my hand, said Georgiakis. And immediately, with one wave of his hand, he broke a large slab of rock into pieces. The saint then bent his head and started saying the Jesus prayer. Georgiakis tried to break another slab, but the power of the prayer hindered him. Don't look there, he roared at the saint, because you are obstructing me. The saint gave him a small stone to break, but he could not break that one either. Hold on, Georgiakis, he told him. Let me try. And as soon as he made the sign of the cross on the stone, it broke into the shape of the cross. The demons, enraged because of that, grabbed Georgiakis and threw him several meters away, throwing down upon him the shattered pieces of the slab which he himself had broken. 
the boy shouted, Elder, save me! Elder, save me! The saint approached Georgiakis, and in loving care for him, advised him to stay in the monastery where he had been offered hospitality and to visit him once a week. That same evening, the demon wanted to take revenge on Father Paisios for having helped Georgiakis. At ten o'clock, having gone out of the Kalivi for a bit, he heard someone shouting, and so he called, I'm coming. As he did not see anyone, he turned to go back in. Just before he entered, however, he saw a fearsome demon outside the door. He looked like a dwarf with a huge head the color of sulfur. The demon said, The hour is a quarter to twelve. Father Paisios was taken aback by that, because before he had gone out, he looked at the clock and read ten o'clock. When he entered, however, he noticed that the clock read a quarter to twelve. Footnote, in referring to this event outside of the holy mountain, the saint used the reckoning of time in the world. Outside of his Kalevi, at the point where the demon had appeared, he drew an arrow on the wall and wrote 3 p.m. Byzantine time. Return to the text. Even though he had experienced demonic temptations, he was deeply disturbed by the sudden fearful manifestation as well as by the demonic action that had changed the time. The next day, a monk found Father Paisios in a state of great agitation. Before he had the chance to ask what was wrong, the saint said, May God protect us from falling into the hands of the devil. Woe to the man who will fall into his hands. Nevertheless, the next time Georgiakis came to visit Father Paisios, the demons also came that night. They made noise on the ceiling. At the beginning it was like the pounding of heavy hammers, and then it was like the rolling of huge logs. The saint kept making the sign of the cross towards the ceiling and chanting, Before thy cross we bow down in worship, O Master, and, Lord, as a weapon against the adversary, you have given us your holy cross. As long as he chanted, the demons did not make any noise. As soon as he stopped chanting, they started pounding again. He later remarked that he had experienced the most pleasant night with psalmody and entertainment. Subsequently, each time Georgiakis came to visit, the demons also came on the night of that visit, sometimes with noises and shouts, sometimes with loud knocks on the door, and other times with a foul smell invading the cell. Each time they came, the demons had something different to present, the saint said. He, in the meantime, prayed fervently for the difficult situation of that young man. In a letter he wrote, Pray for Georgiakis, because all the demons are waging war against him. Since they wage war against me when he comes to me for help, Imagine how much more intense the warfare against him is. One day, while they were talking in the yard, Georgiakis suddenly became ferocious. He stood up, grabbed the hands of Father Paisios, and turned them backwards, as wrestlers do. He grasped them fiercely and said most impudently, let Haji Afentis come to free you now. The saint considered those words to be blasphemous. Go on, you devil. Get away from here, he said. And with that slight movement of the saint's hand, Georgiakis was tossed aside. Angered by that, he jumped high, as he had been taught to do when learning combat techniques, and attempted to strike the saint with the heel of his shoe. He did not succeed, however, for as soon as his foot came close to the face of the saint, it stopped as if it had struck a wall. The saint went directly into his kalivi, and after a while he saw Georgiakis coming toward him, his body pierced through and through with thorns. What happened to you? he asked kindly. 
Satan punished me by dragging me through the brambles because I didn't prevail against you, said the boy contritely. O Georgiakis, he then said in a sweet way, why do you behave like that to me who loves even the worms? After six or seven months, Georgiakis began making the sign of the cross. Previously, the demons had not allowed him to do so. When he had recovered considerably, the fathers anointed him with holy myrrh, for he had been baptized in his infancy, and they also gave him holy communion. That day, Georgiakis went to Father Paisios with a bright face, joyful and full of gratitude. The philotimo I saw in that soul, the saint wrote in a letter, gave me much joy because it is a sign of great progress. Even though he has been in the hands of sorcerers and evildoers since childhood, the grace of God had not abandoned him, but had preserved him pure and with a noble heart. Unfortunately, however, Georgiakis again gave rights to the devil, so Father Paisio stopped helping him because he was not obedient. I abandoned him into the hands of God, he wrote in a subsequent letter, because he does not want to be freed. I believe that he will suffer because of what he wants, and afterwards he will come to his senses. Now he curses God and doesn't listen. I told him not to come any more because he takes advantage of my kindness, and when he does that he harms other people. Father Paisios gave himself entirely in order to help some person. However, if he noticed that the person insisted on his wrong, particularly with impudence, or if he realized that the person used his relationship with him to carry on with his own will and to confuse others, then the full of love saint withdrew his heart, as he said, and cut off all communication with him. One day the saint saw a man who was possessed standing outside his fence. He was being followed by an entire phalanx of thousands of demons. Even though he felt great pain to see a man in the image of God followed by a whole army of demons, he did not let him in because he had realized that there was no way to assist him and that it would be in vain as he himself could fall into temptation. However, he did help some other possessed people to be liberated from the demons. Once a possessed child was brought to the Kali of the Precious Cross. The boy was tied with chains because he had so much strength that it was possible that he could harm himself or others. Father Paisios looked at the boy silently for a while with a compassionate look in his eye. And then he entered his Kalivi and brought out a sacred relic of St. Arsenios. As soon as he made the sign of the cross upon the child with the holy relics, the child immediately became calm before the astounded eyes of all those present. At another time, he again had such great compassion for a possessed man that he squeezed him very tightly in his embrace with much love and anguish. At that instant, in addition, to the divine consolation the possessed man felt, he also felt that the demon was being choked by that tight embrace of love and was thus delivered. The saint later wrote, Tightly held love that is pained for the possessed chokes demons and liberates souls. From the Epistles of St. Paisios The burning of the heart for all creation. Father Paisios was even anguished for the demons. One night, as he was praying on his knees, he said, My God, you are God, and if you want, you could find a way to save even those unfortunate demons, who, although they had such great glory at first, now have all the evil and all the deception of the world. If you had not protected us, they would have destroyed all of humanity. Very much pained as he said those words, 
beside him he saw a canine head stick out his tongue and make fun of him. God had permitted that to happen so that Father Paisios could realize that although he is ready to accept even the demons, should they repent, they in fact do not want their salvation. The merciful heart of Father Paisios can only be described by the words of Abba Isaac. And what is a merciful heart? It is the heart's burning for the sake of the entire creation, for men, for birds, for animals, for demons, and for every created thing. Love for Animals The spiritual person, the saint had said, gives his love to God first and then to the people. He gives the overflow of his love to the animals and to all of creation. In a letter he also wrote, Ed my Calivi, I have jackals, rabbits, weasels, turtles, lizards, serpents, in addition to all the birds, and they are all filled with the overflow of love. And I am filled when they are filled, and we all praise, bless, and worship the Lord. Beasts and all cattle, creeping things and flying fowl. The jackals moved his sensitive heart because he explained they cry like babies when they are hungry. He often left something edible near the fence and later the jackals came down at night to eat. Sometimes they came hungry as they were right up to his window and he then threw something to them from whatever he had. But they too were obedient to him. Once at midday, the saint called a jackal over in order to scare a boy who had the bad habit of blaspheming. The boy had been helping one of the loggers who worked on the holy mountain. On that particular day, as they were trying to load the mules, the boy got nervous and blasphemed. At that same time, a monk walked by and pretending not to have heard, simply hastened to his pace. Seeing his reaction, the logger became fearful that the monk might report it to the monastery and that the authorities would then deport his helper. He thought to himself, what can I do? I'll go to Elder Paisios with the pretext of asking for water and then I'll ask him to help me. He emptied the water from his canteen and headed for the Kali of the Precious Cross. When the saint saw him, he said, Well, Mr. Yanis, you didn't have to pour out the water. Yerunda, he said, a monk heard my young helper blaspheme, and I am afraid for him because he is an orphan, and the authorities may deport him for being a blasphemer. Bring him here to me, the saint replied. And when the boy arrived, he was told, My good young man, why do you blaspheme? Don't you believe in God? The boy, however, reacted negatively. So the saint told him, Well then, I will immediately call the jackal to come, and we'll see how you react. At that exact moment, a large growling jackal came pouncing directly toward the boy, who got so frightened that he shouted, My Panagia, my Panagia! Ah, now it's my Panagia, my Panagia, the saint said, and with a gesture of his hand he sent the jackal away. From the time of that incident the boy put an end to his bad habit of blasphemy. The saint also felt sorry for the rabbits, because they are always frightened. The rabbit, he explained, is constantly on the lookout, and out of fear it cannot sleep. What you see is an innocent little creature. The hunter kills it and eats it. Sometimes he caught rabbits and marked their foreheads with a red cross, as he had done at Stomion Monastery. He then let them go, and also gave them his blessing, so that no hunter could harm them. He prayed the same way for the wild boar. One day, while going to Stavarnikita Monastery, he came across a herd of wild boar 
and a hunter who was taking aim at them. Father Paisios made the sign of the cross toward them and prayed that no bullet would hit them. From then on, there were many times when one wild boar seemed to be waiting for him as he passed by there, and the boar always grunted loudly as if to thank him. Out of all the animals, however, the saint pitied snakes the most. The poor things, he exclaimed, all winter long they are buried in their holes, and in the spring, just as they stick their little heads out, man goes and kills them. Nobody seems sympathetic to them, yet if you show them love, they understand your love and do not harm you. The area around the Kali of the Precious Cross was known to have many snakes, which is why snakes so often appear whenever the elder was conversing with visitors. He had nonetheless sent them on their way with an unaffected air. Don't you see that I have visitors? Go somewhere else, he told them. Amazed, the visitors saw that the snakes obeyed the saint and actually left. Once while speaking with someone in the yard, the saint suddenly interrupted their conversation and said, Come on, you can come too. And the man saw a large snake coming towards them. Out of fear, the man ran into the Kalevi, and from the little window of the door, he saw the snake prostrate before Father Paisios. Cautiously, the man came out, and then the saint told the snake, Prostrate before the man, too. After also prostrating before the man, the saint said, Okay, go away now. We have work to do here. Whenever he realized that some people visited him out of curiosity, in order to see how he communicated with the snakes, he behaved differently. Someone once asked him, Yerunda, do you have a snake here with you? The snakes I have are here, the elder replied, forcefully striking his own chest with both hands, meaning, of course, the passions. To a young deacon who asked the same question, he pointed to his own heart and said, And here is where I have the snakes. When you become a spiritual father, then you may come and I will show them to you. Out of all the beasts and all cattle, creeping things and flying fowl, Psalm 148.10, the saintly elder distinguished one philotimophilled bird. It was a red-throated bird which had approached him one day while he was carving wood icons under an olive tree. It flew joyfully all around him, playing in the air. The elder gave him the name Olet, which in Arabic means child. After that, whenever the elder called out, Olet, the little bird flew right to him. Not long afterward, the elder transferred the place of their meetings to a nearby ridge, where he had used stones to form a cross on the ground. Whenever he went there and called out, Olet, Olet, the bird flew to him immediately and ate raisins, little crumbs of dried bread, or chopped up dried fruit right out of his hand. If, however, the bird had not seen him for a long time, it did not pay any attention to the food, but instead flew around him, crazy with joy, because he much more preferred his company than his food. And when the saint started on his return to his Kali, the little bird went along, jumping and flying all around him. Other animals come to me, but they come to eat. Olet, however, has philotimo. He comes and sits with me like a disciple, the saint wrote in a letter to the nuns. He wanted to use Olet as an example in order to instruct them about the noble behavior of a good disciple. All of these things are for you. During the winter of 1976-77, to 77, a lot of snow fell, 
and Father Paisios was snowbound in his calivi and also sick in bed. He could not light a fire because the matches had gotten wet. He gathered snow from the window sill into his tin can in order to drink a little water. He remained like that in the cold and without food for two days. On the third day, he said, It seems that I will die. And as he lay in bed, he stretched out his hand and took down the schema of Father Tikhon, which had been hanging on the wall next to his bed. He placed it upon himself and started saying the Jesus prayer, awaiting his death with joy. Suddenly, however, he felt a divine power convey him in a most peculiar way out of the Kalivi. Everything around him was luminous, and in that sweet light he saw all of creation, the trees, the animals, and the birds, the sea with the fish, the sky with the stars, all were glorifying God, their Creator. At the same time, he heard a voice say, All of these things are for you, for man. When he reverted to his normal state, he had acquired so much energy that he got through not only that day, but also through the rest of the days that he was snowbound. During those days, the saint experienced absolute abandonment by people and the most fervent presence of God. From that time on, the desire to die alone was kindled within him, alone without any help, deprived of any human consolation. I have one desire, which is that there will not be anyone to assist me during my final days, he declared, and when I think that God will grant it to me, I am ecstatic with joy. When I had the surgery on my lungs and was in the sanatorium, my room had become like a grocery store because of all the things people brought me. Everyone had been mobilized to offer me any assistance they could. Despite all the attentiveness I had received, it cannot be compared with what I once felt here in my Kelly when I was sick and unable to provide the most basic necessities for myself. The consolation I received from God was much greater. Someone asked him, What did you feel, Father? Tell us more about it. I felt what a child feels in the embrace of his mother, replied the saint or like a bird which is shivering in the cold and then suddenly finds itself in the warm hands of a person who loves it. That's how I felt too, blessedness, soulless, peace. To another person he confided, When I think about getting old and being alone, abandoned, without anyone knowing it, and without being able to do anything for myself, not even to light a little fire, I feel such sweetness within. For during the times when I had no human consolation whatsoever, I experienced divine intervention. I cannot say anything more. In Australia, before Great Lent of 1977, Stilianos, Archbishop of Australia, invited the abbot of the Stavrnikita Monastery, Father Vasilios, as well as Father Paisios, to help prepare the Greek community there for Pascha, through repentance and confession. They traveled by airplane for 26 hours, during all of which time the elder held tightly onto a heavy bag that also contained small icons. He did not want to set it down anywhere out of reverence for the icons. At some point he felt light enter the airplane, and at the same time he also sensed profound grace. He asked where they were and was told that they were flying over Syria. He then realized why it had happened. It was because Syria had been sanctified by the struggles of many saints and martyrs. Conversely, while they were flying over India and Tibet, he felt a demonic iciness. Regarding Australia, he said that it had not yet been sanctified by local saints, but in time, saints would distinguish themselves there too. During the one month they stayed in Australia, they went to various parishes, where Father Vasilios heard confessions, while Father Paisios prepared the people for confession. The presence of this saint inspired devotion and deep humility. He walked with his head bent, 
and made a small bow to all wherever he passed. He hardly ever spoke at all before the archbishop and the abbot. When the people requested, Why don't you tell us something too, Father Paisios? He gestured to the archbishop and the abbot and replied, What can I say? I don't know anything. I'm just a simple monk. In private conversations, he answered only when he was asked a specific question. His answers were simple and short. To all, he stressed that they have patience during temptations, faith in God, and trust in divine providence. A young man asked him, Father Paisios, should the faith we are obliged to have in God be a blind faith? Our faith should not be blind, but philotimophilled, he replied. He then related how Christ had appeared to him in the chapel of St. Barbara when he was fifteen years old. As soon as the philotimophilled thought that it was worthwhile for one to sacrifice his own life for Christ without expecting anything in return, neither paradise nor anything else, had crossed his mind, was when he had seen Christ very much alive right before him. One woman kept pleading with Father Paisios to convince her husband to go to confession. And even though he had told her, don't worry, the time will come when he will go to confession, she kept insistently asking, even in front of her husband, tell him, Father, to go to confession. Then the saint took her aside and spoke to her sternly. You women must understand what manly philotimo is. You do a lot of damage with this type of approach. Look after your own soul and leave your husband alone. The time will come when he will make his confession. And that is exactly what happened. At one parish, the priest asked him to speak first to the parents and then to their children. The children did not know Greek, so the priest served as translator. Father Paisios told them that man must be simple and that his life must be simplified. And moreover, that every creation of God is blessed and we must therefore respect all of it, not only the people but the animals and the plants as well. The priest asked him to say a few more things to the children, but silence followed. The children remained motionless with their eyes on the elder while he looked upon them affectionately and did not speak. Finally he got up, made a deep prostration to the ground, and said, I bid you farewell, may Christ always be with you. The unexpectedness of that gesture made a deep impression on the devout priest, who later said, the children would have soon forgotten whatever words Father Paisios could have said to them. They will not forget, however, what they saw with their own eyes, that farewell with a prostration to the floor which revealed his humility. On Clean Monday, Father Paisios, the abbot, the archbishop, and those who accompanied them went to the monastery of St. George of the Mountain, which is located outside of Sydney towards the mountains. The saint, taking his starting point from the name of the monastery, said, Those who have a bit of madness leave the city and head for the mountains. If the madness is godly, they head to the mountains and go to the monasteries. From there they ascend directly to heaven. As they were traveling from Sydney to Canberra, the saint directed the archbishop's attention to a place where a monastery could be built. It is necessary that monasteries be built in Australia, he said, before the Pentecostals and the Buddhists come and start leading people astray with fake lights. From Canberra, they went to Melbourne, where they were accommodated by the priest of the Holy Church of St. Nectarios. Each morning a certain priest drove them to other nearby parishes. One day this priest took Father Paisios to the Royal Melbourne Hospital, where a man who was originally from Zakynthos, Dionysius Speliotis, a 32-year-old head of a family, was being treated. The previous year he had had an aneurysm which had resulted in a cerebral hemorrhage 
After having undergone five surgeries, he was not able to communicate with his environment. The saint made the sign of the cross upon him with the sacred relic of St. Arsenios, and in a little while the patient began to recover. On the next day, when the priest returned to the hospital, the patient was able to kiss his hand and say to him, A miracle! The people from Konitsa who lived in Melbourne had gathered one day in the church of St. Nectarios to meet with their compatriot, Father Paisios. They asked him, Father, how often do you go to Konitsa? How long has it been since you have seen your family? The saint smiled and said, The last time I went to Konitsa was in 1971 to get a book. He meant the books of St. Arsenios, not to see my siblings and my relatives. And he went on to say, All people are my family. I see all people as my brothers and as my relatives. In the home where he was being accommodated, upon seeing how quietly he moved about as if he were not there, and how he only consumed rusks and tea, the Presbytera told her children, A saint is staying in our house. She kept the blanket she had spread on his bed as a blessing. Three years later, when she was suffering from vertigo, she covered herself with the blanket and prayed, Father Paisios, you are a saint. I gave you a place to stay here, and this blanket was on your bed. Please help me to be healed. Indeed, from that time on, her vertigo never returned. After Melbourne, they visited Adelaide. One Sunday, they attended divine liturgy in the Holy Church of St. Spiridon, and afterwards the faithful who had gathered insisted that Father Paisios tell them something. He did not want to speak, but in the end, he did answer some of their questions. One of the questions they had asked was about disagreements that take place between members of the same family. He replied, everything can be resolved with patience and love. At the end, he gave them the following advice. You must do missionary work here since you are among so many people. All these people can become orthodox. The elder was saddened at having seen that the worldly West European spirit existed in Australian society. In Australia, he said, I saw that the European spirit, what the European spirit is like. In a park, a lady fed her dog some chocolate, while a poor, sad-looking little child looked on. It was as if she was saying, the child is not mine, so why should I feed him? This is the European spirit. He was also pained at seeing so many women dressed so immodestly. He remarked, They resemble beautiful Byzantine icons that have been thrown into the rubbish bin, except these women have thrown away themselves. In one of the churches they had visited, when a sexton who was wearing shorts had justified himself by saying that they worked best for him, the saint spoke very sternly, what you are wearing is appropriate for the seashore. That is where you should go. On the other hand, he discerned that the faith was deeply ingrained in the hearts of most of the Greek Orthodox people there, and that their desire to hear the word of God and to struggle spiritually was intense. The Greek people who have migrated to Australia, he said, have come much closer to God than other immigrants who are closer to Greece, because they found themselves alone very far from relatives and without help from anyone. The distance is what helped them hang on even tighter to God. He also said, in Australia, I found godly souls who are struggling because they undergo many temptations, which they endure with great patience. When the time approached for them to depart, the archbishop invited the priests and parish leaders to the archdiocese in order to bid them farewell. After he had thanked them, and after the abbot had also said a few parting words, the archbishop invited Father Paisios to also say something. But he only bowed slightly and placed his right hand on his chest. After a few moments, the archbishop repeated his request, but again the elder repeated the same gesture and remained silent, 
bowing, a Combeschini in his hand. When the same thing had occurred for the third time, the archbishop then noted, As you see, the fathers of the holy mountain speak with their silence. The visit of Father Paisios to Australia was historic. Twenty years later, one Greek immigrant said, Many Greeks who come to Australia come to take. They think that we are wealthy here. They do not know how hard we work and struggle. There was only one monk, Father Paisios, who did not take anything. When he visited, we asked him, What do you want us to give to you? He answered, We came to take away a little of your pain. Footnote, this was related in 1998, when the Greek community of Holy Trinity in Sydney celebrated its first 100 years. Return to the text. The fellow Greek Orthodox people in the cities he had visited felt that a saint had traveled through their country and had blessed it. Today they believe that his visitation is perhaps the greatest blessing the continent of Australia has ever received. When Father Paisios returned to the Holy Mountain, however, he observed, it would have been better if two spiritual fathers had gone to Australia instead of me. It is the Epitrochelion, the priestly stole that is needed there, so far away in a foreign land. The Appearance of Christ After the long journey back, the saint felt an intense need to shut himself away in his cell. I sense so much sweetness in the cell, he said, that I don't even go into the chapel, nor do I care to go out and enjoy the sunshine and the beauty of nature. For in the cell one experiences paradise and feeds on heavenly things. As Holy Pascha approached, he dwelt in an intense spiritual atmosphere. On Palm Sunday, something happened to him, which, however, he did not reveal. It is not to my advantage, he wrote, to report on it. After the vigil of the resurrection of the Savior at the Stavernikita Monastery, he returned to his Kalivi. Although he had shut the door behind him, he celebrated the agape alone, but with many. Footnote, this is the Vesper service on the Sunday of Pascha. As he related, During Bright Week, the week of renewal, he did not accept any visitors. For a long time afterwards, he must have continued to have experienced something remarkably different. In a letter dated in early May of 1977, he wrote, I understand the great love of God that bends hard bones, illumines the outer person, and transforms the inner one. And at such a time, one devoutly venerates not only God and the saints, but also the icons of God, man, and all of creation, large or small, significant or insignificant, little stones or little sticks. He reverently takes up all of these things and kisses them all, as they are a blessing from God, his Creator. On the evening of May 25th on the old calendar, the eve of St. Carpus the Apostle, the saint felt that he was in a different inexplicable spiritual state as he referred to it. He carried out his usual vigil, and then because he felt rather blithe and could not sleep, he started writing up certain events from the life of Father Tikhon. He had written a number of pages when he realized that the same inexplicable spiritual state in which he had been when he had started writing continued, but even more intensely. Morning dawned and he still did not feel the need to sleep. He therefore stopped writing and began saying the Jesus prayer. Suddenly, at about half past five in the morning, as if someone had drawn a curtain, the western wall of the cell was removed, and at a distance of five or six meters, Christ appeared, flooded with light, just as he is depicted whilst praying in the Garden of Gethsemane. His face was shining, the saint wrote later in a letter and with his sweet countenance he completely melted you. Naturally, I could not reckon the time, one or two minutes, and then I lost sight of him. I saw him with the eyes of the soul, because as I realized, the eyes of the body are useless in such circumstances. 
what impressed me was his illuminated countenance with that sweet divine beauty. Thou art fairer than the children of men, as one of the Psalms says, Psalm 45.2 or 44.3 in the Septuagint. And what I cannot put out of my mind is how people dared to behave so inhumanly to the God-man, Jesus Christ, who as a man was sinless, and whose sweet countenance and boundless goodness even melted rocks. I also cannot explain what made Christ appear to me, since I cannot see anything good in myself. All I can see are passions and sins. I think it is worth the effort for one to undertake, if he can, all the struggles that had been undertaken by all the ascetics from the first century to the twentieth in order to see Christ, not just forever after in paradise, but for just one minute. I, the wretched one who saw him for approximately two minutes, will not be able, no matter how much I struggle for the rest of my life, to settle up my account. May God have mercy on me. Pray for me. The saint was somewhat obliged to have written that letter because a few days after that divine event, he received a note from his sister at the Hezekasterion which read, May 26, 5.30 in the morning, you will relate the rest to us. However, when another sister also asked him to write to her about the divine event, he replied, I try not to forget the event with St. Euphemia. It is the opposite with the event with Christ. I tried to forget it and have already forgotten it entirely because I considered an effrontery to even remember it. His tremendous condescension requires both a sense of control and a sense of enormous obligation. It is like one who has a huge debt which he is unable to pay off throughout his entire life. So he tries at least to forget about it so that he will not be tormented without reason, since after all he cannot do anything about it. The next time he visited the Hezekasterion, he tried to help the sisters paint the icon of Christ just as he had seen him. In particular, he insisted that the expression on the divine face be one of divine conviviality and of immense divine compassion. He should not be an austere judge, he said so that neither one who is suffering nor one who has sinned will fear when he looks upon him, but will instead have hope in his compassion and worship him as God. Paniya passes by the chapel. In the letter which described the divine event of the appearance of Christ, the saint had also written, it had always been the case that I could not move comfortably toward Christ in prayer out of much devotion and respect because he is God and whenever my mind was occasionally distracted at the time of prayer I was not troubled because I reasoned what business does an impure mind such as my own have in the presence of Christ while on the contrary I considered Panagia as my mother and often with childlike insistence, I very simply asked her for something. He had also written about Panagia in another letter. When I hear others read, or I myself read, the hallowed and divine dwelling place of the Most High, or, O Mary, Mother of God, precious tabernacle of fragrance. This is from the Theotokion, first of the seventh ode, in the fourth mode of the Resurrectional Canon, in the Orthros of Sunday, the other the fifth mode of the canon for the service of Holy Communion. My heart leaps and is about to burst out of my ribs to go to find Panagia. A few months after the appearance of Christ, another divine event took place in the life of the saint. At the moment he heard the reading of the hymn, O Mary, Mother of God, Precious Tabernacle of Fragrance. It was the eve of the Feast of the Holy Cross, and a young monk had come to visit him. As soon as the elder saw him, he told him in jest, Welcome to you, my good deacon. In fact, I needed a deacon for the feast day. We have invited a bishop, and formal chanters are also coming. I have ordered one hundred kilos of fish for the refectory. 
Afterwards, he told him, Please stay here tonight. We'll have a vigil, and in the morning, the priest from Stavarnikita will come for divine liturgy. They cleaned and put the Kalivi in order, and at five in the afternoon, they started the vigil, each praying with his kambaskini. Father Paisios was in his cell, and the deacon in the small Arkandariki. Each hour, he knocked on the wall and asked, Deacon, are you well? Are you sleeping? At about one o'clock after midnight, he invited him to read the prayers for preparation for Holy Communion together in the chapel. He placed him in the only reading stall and gave him a candle so as to be able to see and read. He himself stood beside him and before each troparion made a prostration to the floor, raised his hands in prayer, and with contrition said the following verse, Glory to thee, our God, glory to thee. When the deacon started to read the Theotokian of the Fifth Ode, O Mary, Mother of God, Precious Tabernacle of Fragrance, they heard a soft sound, as if a mild breeze had risen about them. Immediately the chapel, which was virtually dark, as it was lit only by the vigil lamps, was suddenly illuminated by a boundless and immense light. At the same instant the vigil lamp over the icon of Panagia began to move serenely back and forth like a pendulum, while the other vigil lamps remained motionless. Astounded, the deacon turned toward Father Paisios, who signaled for him to be silent. For more than half an hour, the deacon stopped the reading and watched as the vigil lamp above the icon of Panagia went delightfully back and forth. As the chapel was filled with light, and as the saint remained bowed all the way over to the floor, with his arms crossed over his chest. At some point, the deacon decided to resume the reading of the prayers of Holy Communion on his own. After a short while, the light disappeared and the vigil lamp stopped moving. After the service had ended and they had gone out of the chapel, the saint was spiritually transformed and did not speak. They sat in the small hall without speaking, and in a little while the deacon asked, he don't know what was it. What happened? It was nothing, said the elder. Is it possible, Yerunda, for that to have been nothing? It was nothing, he told him again. Don't you know that on the holy mountain the Panagia passes through the monasteries in the Kelia every night in order to see what the monks are doing? Well, she passed by here too and saw two foolhardy men reading so she moved the vigil lamp to greet them. Up until the priest arrived for the divine liturgy, the saint also told the deacon about other divine events that had occurred in his life. On another occasion, however, he revealed to him that he had also seen the Panagia that night. Earthquakes in Thessaloniki and fire at the Hesychasterion in June of 1978, earthquakes took place in Thessaloniki and the surrounding region, and many asked Father Paisios, who was at the Hezekasterion, What will happen, Yaranda? Will the earthquake stop? We shall continue to pray, he said, and particularly the young children should pray for God to take pity on the people. When small children pray as well, God will help. He will work things out providentially. On June 20th, he was very worried. We are not through with the earthquakes yet, he said. And indeed, that night the most powerful earthquake took place. It caused serious damage, and many people lost their lives. In fear, the sisters had gathered in the church, and the elders said, Now that we have experienced the powerful shaking of God, we shall offer prayer from the heart for all those who have need. On the next day, he was more at peace and tried to comfort all those who had come to the Hezekasterion. Do not be afraid, he told them. When you were children, didn't your mother rock you in the crib? Well, now that God is rocking you, will you be frightened? As for the destruction that had taken place, he said, Because of the earthquake, Thessaloniki has become ill and it will not be desirable to our good neighbors. During the afternoon of the same day, the sisters saw a fire outside 
the western fence of the Hezekasterion. Reeds were being burned in a nearby field, and because the wind was strong, the fire had got out of control and was headed toward the monastery. They all ran, taking the watering hoses with them, and Father Paisios took the holy skull, skull of St. Arsenios. Do not be afraid, he said. We will have Hagi Afentis put out the fire. He stood at a point where there was wide visibility, and he blessed the four corners of the horizon and made the sign of the cross with the holy skull of St. Arsenios. Then he said to someone standing next to him, Blow a little. Do some foo foo. The man, thinking that he was joking, replied, What are you saying, Father? How can the fire be put out like that? Then the saint himself blew, and the wind automatically turned and blew from the opposite direction. The fire also turned like a person and went backwards to the burned out areas where it died out on its own. That summer, many who went to visit Father Paisios on the holy mountain told him about the earthquake. Desiring to help them toward repentance, he had them read one of the hymns from the canon of the earthquake of October 26th. The earth being mute, its wounds groan and cry out, Why have all people defiled me with so many evils? And the Lord who spares all scourged me. Come to your senses, O people, and please God with your repentance. Footnote The fourth hymn of the ninth ode of the canon for the earthquake. See the October Menaean. It's the commemoration of the great and fearful earthquake in Constantinople in 740. In the time of Emperor Leo the Armenian, there was a terrifying and long-lasting earthquake in Constantinople. The people felt that it was punishment for their sins and entreated Panagia and St. Demetrius to intercede for them. Light from the Icon of Christ on October 19, 1978, on the old calendar, another amazing event took place in the life of the saint. At night, while kneeling on his bed, he had started doing the Apodipnon with the Kambaskini. On his pillow, he had placed a paper icon of Christ, which was a print of the icon the sisters had made according to his directives. Just as he started to pray, the icon began to emit flashes of light. He picked it up and started kissing it with tremendous reverence, and as he kissed it, it again emitted flashes of light. The same thing happened when he touched it at the spot where Christ holds the Holy Gospel. That night he was also accommodating a monk, who at that same time was doing the Apadipnan in the chapel. He called him and he too saw the divine flashes of light coming from the icon. Caress it yourself, he told him, but he was so dazed that he pressed too hard on it. It doesn't happen with pressure, he told him. Caress it gently. He touched it gently, and immediately light radiated from the icon. His hands seemed translucent, just as one's fingers seem to be translucent when there is a strong light behind them. The miraculous event repeated itself each time the saint touched or kissed the icon. Other monks who also saw it bear witness to it. To prevent the occurrence from becoming too widely known and exploited by the devil, the saint gave the icon away as a blessing to someone. Elder Paisios, illumined by the light of discretion, preferred to deprive himself of the light-emitting icon. Letters Without Stamps As long as divine events take place, St. Paisios remarked, small in the beginning and greater and more abundant later, the more is faith strengthened, the more is the soul warmed, and the more is love ablaze. Then one comes up out of smallness and ascends to great heights. He goes mad and is always giving thanks to God, who in turn reciprocates whenever he asks him for whatever he wants, no longer for himself, since after that mad heavenly flight of his soul, he has thrown his own self aside. 
The saint himself had indeed thrown his own self aside and prayed to God only for others. And God, in fact, responded to whatever the saint asked. Once a police officer sent him a letter asking him to pray for his mother, who had been hospitalized with a tumor in the lungs and was suffering with dyspnea. A few days after the letter had been sent, the ailing woman, while between sleep and wakefulness, had seen two visitors, a woman dressed in black and a monk who with great concern very kindly said, Do not worry, we are here and we will tend to you. They approached her, put their hands beneath the sheet, and then she heard a sound like the sound of cloth being cut by a razor blade. Shortly after that, the woman was relieved of her condition and felt at the same time great joy. Subsequent examinations indicated that there was no longer any tumor and she returned home in good health. When Father Paisos had left the Holy Mountain to visit the Hezekasterion, the police officer visited him there together with his mother, who upon seeing him said, There he was the monk who came to the hospital with the woman dressed in black to heal me. At another time, a grocer from Zanti was very ill, and because the doctors feared that it was something serious, they recommended that he be transferred to a hospital in Thessaloniki. The grocer, however, was indecisive and sent a letter to Father Paisios asking for his advice. A few days later, while he was still in the clinic of Xanthi and his condition had worsened, he suddenly felt much better. The doctors were surprised by his sudden improvement and allowed him to return home. Three months later, the grocer visited the saint, who upon seeing him joyfully asked, How are you, Theodore? You did receive my letter, didn't you? I didn't write to you, but you did receive the message. He immediately understood what had happened and was deeply moved. Once when a French man who was orthodox could not decide which life to lead, the monastic one or the married one, the saint told him, Go to France, and in two months I will send you a letter without postage stamps. And that is what happened. The Frenchman returned to his country, and two months later he received, quote, the letter, unquote. He met a young lady who agreed to become Orthodox, and shortly thereafter they were married. Father Paisios wanted to pray for every person who had need, at one time wanting to offer special prayers for specific circumstances, he asked a friend to send him newspaper clippings of tragic events. After a short period of time, however, he asked him to stop. The pain is overwhelming, he wrote. I cannot bear any more. Even without having received a message for help, God's wireless operator was able to send the help of God from the hollow of Caliagra, even to people he did not know who were in danger on the other side of the earth. In the summer of 1971, while speaking with a professor from the theological school about prayer, he referred to the example of, quote, some monk, unquote, who one day had felt an intense need to pray for a seaman he did not know and whose life was in danger. After hours of fervent prayer, that monk had a sense of exaltation which served to inform him that God had helped. He afterwards forgot all about that incident. He remembered it a few months later, however, when a young man, who together with other pilgrims, was visiting him. The young man looked at him inquisitively for a little while and then, without further ado, embraced him and greatly moved, said, It was you, Father, who was praying for us when we were in danger of drowning in the South China Sea, we all saw you on the edge of the bow, or bow, with your arms outstretched out to heaven. It was you, I'm not mistaken. From the manner in which it had been related, as well as the distinctive details to which the saint had referred, the professor realized that that particular event had happened to Father Paisios himself.
spiritual radar. The saint was in constant communication with God, who informed him when some soul needed help. Once while speaking with a young man in the yard, he interrupted the conversation and said, Nikos is also coming. Let's finish up. He will be here in half an hour. Yet on the which Nikos is coming. Where did you see him? asked the young man. He is behind the mountain, he told him, and he will be here in half an hour. You don't know the mountains, but I know them. A half an hour later, they heard the little bell. There he is, the elder said. Go and open the gate. The young man opened the gate and asked the visitor, Are you Nikos? How do you know me? He said in surprise. I don't know you. The elder knows you. That's impossible, the young visitor said. I've never seen him before, nor am I much of a believer. I heard about a monk who does miracles, and I came in order to get to know him. Then they heard the saint say, Come on, Nikos, I know you, but you do not remember me. And smiling at him, he took him into his kalivi. After an hour, Nikos came out in tears. He was spiritually transformed. Sorrowful yet joyful, he said to the other young man who was still waiting outside, Now I understand that there are indeed saints. Now I understand what God is. In December of 1974, Father Paisios was visited by a man who was exhausted from his journey. Although it was the first time he had ever seen him, the saint welcomed him by name and immediately started to draw water from the cistern to wash his feet. Embarrassed, the man resisted him, but the saint insisted, Obedience. As he started to wash his feet, he said, Your mother's name is Pagona. Your father's name is Nicholas. Your father, my son, plays cards, and he plays constantly. He even explained how his father had acquired that bad habit. When the man returned to his country, he confirmed the truth of the elder's words and glorified God, who had enabled him to meet a saint. In the summer of 1975, a teacher visited Father Paisios to talk with him about his sister, who wanted to become a nun, although he himself was not in agreement. The moment he entered the yard, the saint saw him from a distance and shouted, Welcome to Nikos, the teacher and the brother of Vasilia. Surprised by the unexpected reception, the teacher proceeded and with some reservation sat next to him. The saint addressed him in a stern but friendly manner and said, Can you tell me, my good teacher, have you ever found a better father-in-law than God? Have you found a better groom than Christ for your sister? And don't forget that you will have a gr green beret fighting in the vanguard for those in the rear. The teacher did not say anything of what was on his mind, and he departed at peace. In 1978, a man from Crete was heading to the Kali of the Precious Cross. He was uncertain that he had taken the right path. On the way, he met a very ascetic monk with patches on his cassock and a bag over his shoulder. He bowed to the monk and asked him, Father, I want to go to Elder Paisios, but I am not sure of the way. My blessed man, answered the monk, why do you want to see that wretched man? In the Paravali of the Panaia, there are so many virtuous fathers from whom you can benefit, and yet you are searching for Paisios? The man from Crete insisted, however, and seeing that the monk's appearance indicated virtue, he decided to follow him. A few meters down the path, the monk sat beneath a tree and invited the man to sit with him. He was now certain that he was sitting with Elder Paisios. Blessed man of God, the saint told him, we must have faith and all our problems will find their solutions. God provides for all people and all things. In the morning, I left my kali with the aim of going to the forest to cut wood for my handicraft. I had not gone very far when the thought came to me that I should change direction. I thought about that a bit and determined that it had come from God, who did not reveal why I should change direction. 
so I changed my direction and we met. After discussing a number of things, they got up to leave. Just as Father Paisios began to walk, he almost fell. His feet became entangled three times, and each time he had to take hold of a branch to maintain his balance. The devil didn't like what took place, he said smiling, but he will not have his way. Words Taught by the Holy Spirit The true fathers, the saint had said, do not express thoughts produced by their own minds. Instead, they express those thoughts which God brings to their minds, or they talk about experiences from their own lives. They speak about truths they themselves had experienced, truths which are alive and which give life to other people. He himself spoke simply, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Spirit teacheth. 1 Corinthians 2.13 Many educated and intellectual people marveled at his masterful responses, and some who thought his responses were the result of his studies asked him where he had read them. Actually, once the professor of psychiatry, Aristos Aspiotis, asked him, Father, in which book can one find what you have told us? Pentecost, replied the saint, mean the enlightenment of the Holy Spirit. To another who asked a similar question, he answered, The Sea of Tiberius, meaning again the Holy Spirit, who reveals fishermen as theologians. Footnote from the third Idiomelon Stichiron of the first mode for the great vespers of the Sunday of the Holy Pentecost. Return to the text. Once a theologian introduced himself to Father Paisios, I am Mr. So-and-so, a theologian. In jest, he then responded, What are you saying, my son? I know of three theologians. Footnote, only three saints of the church received the title of theologian, the apostle and evangelist John in the first century, St. Gregory Nazianzos, fourth century, and St. Simeon, who is known as the new theologian in the tenth century. Return to the text. Apparently you must be the fourth. He then spoke to him seriously. Look, you may have a diploma from the theological school, but it is your orthodox patristic life that will make you a theologian. Because he had trained himself patristically, Father Paisios had become a practical theologian by visitation of the grace of the Holy Spirit. That is why he could provide help in a positive manner even to the theology professors who often visited him. In his presence they became aware that true theology is the word of God which is conceived by pure, humble, and spiritually regenerated souls. It is not the theology that is taught like a science usually examines things historically. Consequently, it is understood on a superficial level, since this kind of theology lacks patristic asceticism and inner experience. It is full of uncertainty and questions. From the letters of St. Paisios. Once a student of the theological school asked him, Yerunda, how did Moses write the Pentateuch? Footnote, this is the first five books of the Old Testament, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Well, my blessed fellow, God showed him those things as if they had appeared on a television screen, and he wrote them down. Father Paisios replied with an air of natural certainty, since he himself had experienced the, quote, spiritual television, unquote. On another occasion, a theologian who had studied in France insisted that Abba Isaac was not orthodox because he had served as a bishop in a Nestorian atmosphere. But no, the Nestorians were followers of the heresy of Nestorius, which was condemned by the Third Ecumenical Council of Ephesus in 431. Father Paisius tried to help him understand that Abba Isaac is at the very heart of orthodoxy, but could not convince him, something which grieved him a great deal. I felt such immense pain, he said. Had anyone struck me on the head with a hatchet, I would not have felt the pain I had felt over that. Afterwards, an incident took place. 
Those incidents are why I have said that if one is deeply hurt over something, God will then inform him. Pain forms the basis for God's intervention. If the heart is in a lot of pain, God will provide precise information. God had indeed precisely informed Father Paisios about that particular matter. In a vision, he saw hierarchs passing by before him. Among them was also Abba Isaac, who turned towards him and said, Yes, I lived in a Nestorian atmosphere. There were heretics in my province, but I was orthodox, and I opposed them. Afterwards, the saint emphatically proclaimed, Abba Isaac was an orthodox Christian to the core. He even explained how Westerners had slandered Abba Isaac as not being orthodox because he had cultivated hesychasm. That incident was why Father Paisios referred to him as the wronged saint. And in the Menaean in the Synaxarion for January 28th, where the feast day of Saint Ephraim the Syrian is listed, he had added, and Isaac the great hesychast and much wronged saint. Zealous for the Patristic Traditions Father Paisios did not agree with the practice of Orthodox theologians studying in the West because he saw the danger of, quote, spiritual bacteria, unquote, being transported from the West and contaminating our unadulterated Orthodox faith. What will you receive by going there? They don't have anything for us. They have torn everything down. His reply to a French Orthodox hieromonk who had asked him to explain how Catholics and Protestants differ from the Orthodox exemplified his staunch stand on Orthodoxy. Let's suppose that Orthodoxy is like this Kalevi that you see before you. It is made of stones, mortar, and wooden joists. The Catholics removed the mortar, and then the Protestants removed the joists as well. Can the stones stand by themselves? He was also grieved when he learned that certain Orthodox theologians were not feeding on the strong spiritual food of Orthodox patristic texts and not drinking of the crystalline waters of patristic theology, but were instead studying the heretical theologians of the West and drinking of their muddied springs with the result being that they came to false conclusions about the Holy Fathers. Nor did the saint agree with the dialogues that were taking place with the heterodox. Because he had observed that the many Orthodox who were involved in the dialogues and conferences and attempts for union had not been previously united with God themselves, it followed that they could not inform others about leading Orthodox patristic lives. They could not inform the heterodox either, since the heterodox who participated in the dialogues did not have a sincere disposition. In a letter dated 1978, he wrote, The European spirit believes that spiritual matters should also enter the common market. All things must be made equal. On the other hand, those Orthodox who are a bit weak and want to make a show of, quote, missionary work, unquote, convened so-called conferences to create a hullabaloo just to have the newspapers write articles about these events. They think that they are promoting orthodoxy through such conferences by becoming some type of a salad, since they have become tossed together with the erroneous heterodox. Then the ultra-zealots start bucking and take up the other extreme. They say blasphemous things about the sacraments of Christians who follow the new calendar and so forth, and thoroughly scandalize the souls of those who are devout and have orthodox sensitivity. The heterodox, on the other hand, come to the conferences, play the role of teachers, take whatever good spiritual material they find among the orthodox, pass it through their workshops, put their own color and brand on it, present it as original, and the strange people of today are moved by such strange, thing, strange things and are spiritually destroyed. Father Paisios had his own way of speaking the truth, even to the heterodox themselves, without being provocative. In 1978, when the election of a new pope took place, a Roman Catholic monk asked him to pray that a good pope would be elected. 
The saint sympathetically patted the monk's shoulder and said with a smile, Do not worry, my son. No matter who gets elected, he will surely be infallible. During the 1970s, many asked the opinion of Father Paisios about a proposal that priests not wear rasa in public. His response was to show them an olive tree from which he had stripped the bark on the trunk and thicker branches and left only leaves on the ends of its smaller branches. On the stripped trunk, he had carved the following, The trees have cast off their garb. We shall see their progress. He also carved, A priest without his rasso is a prodigal priest. Footnote, he, he also carved, A priest without his cassock equals a prodigal priest. Return to the text. As expected, that olive tree withered. During the same period, there were some pre-synod meetings aimed at preparations for a new pan-Orthodox synod. Among the themes slated to be discussed were many proposals contrary to Orthodox tradition. When the elder was informed about them, he was greatly troubled and spoke about them with much pain of soul. Do you realize what is going to happen? he asked. Tradition will depart and transgression will remain. Do you realize how serious this is? It's like removing a brick from the wall of a house. It appears that nothing happens to the house at that moment, but gradually water gets in and another brick is removed, and then another until in the end the house is in ruins. And when he was told that one of the proposals was to reduce the appointed periods of fasting in the church because the people do not observe them, the saint replied, If one is ill and cannot observe the fast, he is justified in eating. If one is not ill and eats out of weakness, he can repent and say, I have sinned. Christ will not hang him for that. If one can keep the fast, he should keep it. But if most of the people do not keep the fast, and we proceed to abolish them in order to ease the conscience of the many, it is as if we are blessing their weaknesses and their sins. What right do we have to abolish all these things? And how do we know? Maybe the next generation will be a better one and will observe the rule more precisely. Father Paisios was, of course, in the proper sense of the term, a zealot for the patristic traditions. In matters of faith, he made no concessions and no retreats. In his life, he observed all things with precision, not only outwardly, but more so inwardly, out of divine zeal. When he expressed his opinion about any subject, and especially ecclesiastical ones, he spoke with discernment, weighing his words on the scale of precision. And when he had a faint-hearted person before him, he again with precision prescribed the appropriate medication like a good doctor. He had been steeped in the fear of God, which was why he could penetrate the depths of the law of God. He was full of love and had put on hearts of mercies. Colossians 3.12 Therefore he did not simply know the canons of the church, but instead knew through experience that the church is a mother and her canons are full of maternal compassion. Once he was asked for his opinion about a bishop who had recommended that his priests apply the rudder literally as per the penance it, it imposes. Footnote, the rudder is a collection of canons of the Orthodox Church, which contains the apostolic canons, the canons of the ecumenical and local councils, as well as the canons of the Fathers of the Church, with a brief interpretation. The collection was compiled by St. Nicodemus the Hagiorite in, in 1793. Return to the text. St. Paisios said, That seems rather harsh to me, he replied. I, the wretched one, know that a good sea captain turns the rudder of his sheep, ship accordingly. He does not hold it solely in one position, because doing so will cause his ship to founder upon the rocks. He also said, It is not right for the cannons to become cannons with which to bombard people. That's cannon, C-A-N-O-N-S, to become Canon C-A-N-N-O-N-S. P. 
people also frequently asked him about certain scandals that had troubled the Church of Greece during the 1970s. The saint remarked, These scandals should not concern us because we do not have the spiritual clarity required to see these things in depth. God, who is the Father of us all, has created the Church. He directs her, and what He allows to happen turns out eventually to be a benefit to the Church. Nor did he agree with the publicizing of scandals in religious journals. And to those who spoke about cleaning out the church, he replied, If you clean out your own soul, you simultaneously clean out a portion of the church. Once he was informed about a scandal which had been provoked by a bishop. After listening attentively, he said humbly, My blessed ones, what can I say to you now? I do not know about the matter, but if it is as you have related it to me, it seems that this man has allowed his pride to get the better of him. And bending his head down, he continued, And the good God has allowed it so that his soul will not be lost. Still he felt pain whenever devout priests or bishops were accused, and he especially revered those who endured injustices without complaining. Such men are the most beloved children of God, he observed. Interactions with Students Many students visited the elder, especially during the summer months, and he spent plenty of time with them as he had perceived that they had a good restlessness. His advice was practical, as if he himself were living with them out in the world. Some of his examples included... First, we must become good people and then good Christians. You cannot eat a meal and not say thank you to your mother who has prepared it. You should speak politely to your professors. You should speak humbly, even to the professor who failed you. You should say, thank you, professor. Perhaps I should have studied a little more. Often he began a discussion by using the subject of their studies as a starting point. He once asked some students from the physics and mathematics school, Can you tell me which number is greater, two or nine? The students started deliberating about whether the number was positive or negative, but the elder interrupted them. No, my friends, I don't know about such things. If I say something, it is from the gospel. And he explained, Let's say that someone received a talent from God, and he doubled it, while another who had received five talents was not able to make them ten, but had remained at nine. Footnote Matthew twenty five, fourteen to thirty, Luke nineteen, twelve to twenty seven. In this case, isn't the two greater than the nine? Many young people asked him about their plans to start a family. To some of the students, the saintly elder advised that they put that subject into the refrigerator quote unquote, until they had completed their studies. To those who had completed their studies, he advised that they not delay in starting a family and to seek a spouse on the basis of the spiritual qualities of simplicity and humility. Many students who were in a confused state of mind went to Father Paisios. He very patiently unraveled the tangled threads of their thoughts and separated them with discernment. Whenever some of them encountered out of egoism, he humbled them without crumpling them. He did not say, you have egoism, or you are immature and you do not understand. Rather, he explained, when a fruit has not yet ripened, it has an acerbic taste and is not edible. It has to mature in order to become sweet. In the same way, a young person doesn't understand certain things. But as the years pass, he spiritually matures and becomes sweet, and then he understands. There were also circumstances when Father Paisios, through full, though full of goodness, thundered and hurled lightning. That usually happened whenever he spotted great impudence or especially blasphemy. Once a student of the theological school told him that God, not knowing what to do, thought of creating man. Upon hearing that blasphemy, the elder immediately raised his hand 
and gave him a resounding smack. The student started to cry like a small child, while the elder did not say anything for quite a while. Later he took him tenderly by the hand, like a mother does her child, and led him to wash his face, saying kindly to him, You blessed man, how could you have said such a thing? He also gave him a towel to wipe his face, and then advised him that he ought not to talk disrespectfully about God and his creation. The true love of the saint was discerning when it came to giving a caress or giving a smack, which was actually the type of caress that jolts one into reality. Practical Teacher of Monastics Using discernment, the elder also dealt with those young persons who wanted to become monks or nuns. When a student wanted to break off his studies in order to enter a monastery, he was guarded. It is better, he said, to regret once for having got your degree rather than regretting one hundred times for not having got it. He also often advised young men who wanted to become monks to fulfill their compulsory military service first, or even to work for some time in order to make a much more mature decision. Once a young man, who had just received his degree, went to him and said, Yeranda, give me your blessing to become a monk. The abbots give blessings, replied the saint. I am just a simple monk. But if you want my opinion, go and fulfill your military service first, and when you get back, we can talk about it again. But if I go to be a soldier, I might fall into temptation, said the young man. Well, what you have just said is enough for me to insist on what I have said, he replied to him, seeing that he was not yet ready to enter a monastery. He felt pain for young persons who loved the monastic life, but had difficulties in finding a place which could provide them with solace, so he tried to help them. He also sided with the parents who had objected to their children's decision to become monastics. It is necessary for you to explain your decision to your parents and make it easy for them to understand, he said to a young man who is considering becoming a monk, because like you they are also children of God. The saint helped many young monks establish a strong foundation in their monastic life. When they asked him what a monk needs to have, he usually responded, Humility and a fighting spirit. He deemed, however, that confession of thoughts and obedience were the base for a solid foundation in the monastic life. When you reveal your thoughts to your elder and you observe obedience to him, he explained, you ruin the plans of the devil. And to a young man who had asked for his advice before entering a monastery, he replied, You should reveal all your thoughts and do whatever you are told. He was very grieved whenever a monk told him that he was thinking of returning to the world in order to help his relatives. We as monastics, he said, should entrust our parents and relatives to God. Me, I entrusted my family to God, and I was freed. Not that I do not love them, but to whom will you entrust the care for a loved one? To God, of course. He will protect them far better than you. And in a letter to a nun, he wrote, It is true that I feel the love of God and the affection of Panagia very intensely, and at the same time, I feel such great love for the whole world that I am completely liquefied by divine exaltation. I believe that all these feelings are from God because I have entrusted my relatives in the flesh to Him and then forgotten them entirely. Now and then I learn from some compatriot from Epirus, without me asking, that my kin undergo trials and tribulations, illnesses and misfortunes. But again, I am not concerned because I have entrusted them to the hands of God and they are indeed in the hands of God. During the 1970s, Father Paisios rejoiced that many monasteries, both within and outside the Holy Mountain, were being manned by young monks who were educated and had high ideals. At the same time, however, 
he was uneasy, for he had perceived that a worldly spirit had entered monasticism, one with a human rationale and a military discipline, together with an interest in vain and external things that torment the soul rather than comfort it. During that time, he also visited certain monasteries on the holy mountain that were manned by new brotherhoods, and to each of them he emphasized, You young monks must try to struggle as much as you possibly can, because we live at a time when people will become tired of the world, and their only solace will be the monasteries. The next generation will not be like this one. Its people will be tired of and tormented by sin. They will come and seek tangible things, and if you do not strive now to acquire spiritual experiences, you will not be able to offer a few words of consolation to them. In order to help the young monks in particular, the saint began writing brief synaxaria on the lives of Athenite fathers he knew, or had known, or had heard about. These synaxaria contain spiritual leaven, derived from the simplicity, the fighting spirit, as well as the ascetical spirit of the older fathers, such as Father Tikhon, Elder Petros, Elder Augustinos, Father Savas of Esfigmenu, and Father Kyrillos of the Skeet of the Monastery of Kutlumusiu, and other saintly fathers, most of whom were basically illiterate, yet had nevertheless received constant divine enlightenment because of their humility and fighting spirit. Footnote, that's the text, Athenite Fathers and Athenite Matters by St. Paisios. During the ten years that Father Paisios had lived in the Kelly of the Precious Cross, he saw many things change on the holy mountain. One of the first changes was the construction of roads, which resulted in the appearance of motor vehicles in the Paravali of the Panagia. Father Paisios, like many other fathers, did not agree with that worldly development. From the moment the automobiles began to traverse the holy mountain, the countenance of this sacred place has changed, he remarked. To the people responsible, he contended, You are dishonoring this virgin land of Panagia. The holy fathers had made the desert into a spiritual community, and are we to make it into a worldly community? He saw that the roads would also make inroads on the holy mountain, that they would endanger it by allowing for the infiltration of the worldly spirit, which with its many conveniences and avoidance of physical labor would alter the hesychastic character and ascetic tradition of the Paravali of the Panagia. In order to be true to his word, the saint only used the bus which went from Daphne to Caries. He never got into any other vehicle. And when the bus was out for repairs, he walked a three-hour distance. Once when the elder was returning to the holy mountain and the bus could not make the journey due to heavy snowfall, the elder refused to continue the journey in a vehicle which belonged to one of the monasteries. Even though he was ill and had a heavy bag to carry, he started off on his own, on foot, and a young man followed him. In the end, he could not make it to his Kali on the same day. After having walked for about six hours in the snow, he reached Carriez late in the afternoon and spent the night there. The Final Divine Event at the Kelly of the Precious Cross After having stayed at the Kelly of the Precious Cross for ten years, the saintly elder realized that he should seek out another place in order to continue his hesychastic life. On February the 4th, 1979, on the old calendar, at nine o'clock in the evening, preoccupied with what he should do, he could not relax and had a splitting headache. He felt as if he were being struck on the head with a chisel. His eyes were about to pop out, especially the right one. He was writhing because of the unbearable pain. I have never experienced such pain in my life, he said. He could not even say the Jesus prayer. He was able to say only, My Christ, my Panagia. While he was in that condition, he suddenly saw his guardian angel appear over his right shoulder. 
He looked like a very graceful twelve-year-old child with a sweet and radiant appearance. His angel did not speak to him. He only looked at him. That look alone, however, was enough to eradicate the pain as well as every doubt and worry. Immediately, all the problems disappeared, not because of the joy, but because of the divine grace. Later, when he related that event, he said, Joy does not get rid of pain. You may be joyful, but you continue to be in pain. While divine grace, a great matter, it cannot be described. If this is the outcome, I said to myself, let me be struck on the head, not just with a chisel, but with a hammer. It was worth having my head broken just for that divine event alone. A few days later, he finally decided to leave. Chapter 12 At the Kali of Panaguda Searching for a Kali Father Paisios began searching for a Kali, but had difficulties in finding one. During the vigil he kept on the night of February 26 on the old calendar, 1979, he prayed fervently and with great anguish, Saint Euphemia, Saint Arsenios, what shall I do? Please help me. He also besought the holy ancestors of God, Joachim and Anna, whom he especially revered. All these saints did indeed help him. From early on throughout the following day, February 27th, which was the date on which St. Euphemia had visited him, he continued to search, but to no avail. Tired out, he went that afternoon to Cariez, to the Cali of the Ascension, where Elder Joachim lived, in order to see two wooden icons of St. Arsenios, which had been carved by his disciple. There, as soon as Elder Joachim heard that he was looking for a Cali, he said, Panaguda is for you. Panaguda, which means little Panagia, was an abandoned Calivi with a chapel dedicated to the nativity of the Theotokos. It belonged to the Kulumusiu Monastery and was in an area which had originally been a vineyard, but had long since become a forest with cypress trees and dense foliage. As a vineyard, it could not be formally granted to a monk as a Kali. Yet when Father Paisios asked for it, the fathers of the monastery decided to include it among the Kelya of the monastery and granted it to him. In the yard of Panaguda, an olive tree stood at the entrance of the Kalevi, just as one had stood at the entrance of the Kali of the Precious Cross. Here, too, the entrance led to a small hallway. To the right was the chapel of, of Panaia, and to the left the cell where Father Paisios would stay. At the end of the hallway were two other cells which the elder used, one as a workshop and a storage room, and the other as an archandariki. Those two cells opened out onto a fenced enclosure, which was like a balcony attached to the Kalevi, due to its elevated position atop the small hill. The simplicity and the small size of Panayuda pleased the saint. It was suitable for yet another reason. It was only a 20-minute walk from Cariez and a relatively short distance from three monasteries, the Monastery of Kutlumusiu, the Monastery of Iveron, and the Monastery of Stavrnikita. Thus the burden of providing hospitality to the ever-increasing number of pilgrims visiting Father Paisios did not fall on a single monastery. Father Paisios, however, could not settle in immediately, as the Kalevi was run down and required an overhaul. The doors and the windows were practically dilapidated. The roof leaked, the floor and the ceiling were in terrible condition, and a wall in the back which enclosed the balcony was virtually falling apart. Thus the saint once again took up laborious manual labor. The Visitation of Saints Lucilianos and Pantalemon After putting the Cali somewhat in order, he settled there at the end of May 1979. A few days later, he experienced the first divine event. On June 2nd on the old calendar, 
He wanted to know which saint was to be celebrated the next day, so that he could do the Vespers with the Combuschini. Footnote. When a prayer service of the 24-hour period is done with the Combuschini while saying the Jesus Prayer, we also do a Combuschini for the saint of the day. Return to the text. Because the Menea service books, which he had brought from the Cali of the Precious Cross, were still in boxes, he searched for his glasses so that he could read the tiny print on a pocket calendar that he had to hand. In hand. After a thorough search, he had still not found them, so he began Vespers, but for the prayers for the saint of the day with which he used the a Combuschini, he said, Saints for this day intercede for us. For the nighttime service, after having tried again to find his glasses for three quarters of an hour, but to no avail, he began to repeat the same prayers before. Saints of the day intercede for us. Suddenly a military officer in bright clothing appeared before him and approached him with goodness and fatherly affection, transferring an inexpressible exaltation to him. Encouraged, Father Paisios asked, Where did you serve and what is your name? I am Saint Lucilianos, he replied. Since Father Paisios had not heard him, heard of him, he asked, Saint Longinos? No, Saint Lucilianos, he said again. Because the elder did not remember that there was such a saint, he asked yet again, Saint Lucianos? No, Saint Lucilianos, repeated the saint, pronouncing each syllable separately. I too have wounds from the war, said the elder. Then Saint Lucilianos turned to a young doctor in white medical attire who stood next to him and asked him to examine the elder. That tall young doctor with a thin, very white face was Saint Pantaleamon, the patron saint of the skeet of Kutlumusiu, which is located opposite the Kali of the Panaguda. After having examined him, Saint Pantaleamon gave his diagnosis to Saint Lucilianos. His wounds have healed. We'll only take them into consideration for the diploma. When the two saints had departed, the saintly elder felt great joy and was doubly comforted. He looked more diligently for his glasses, and when he found them, he saw on the calendar that it was the feast day of the saint martyr Lucilianos. The presence of the saints is vivid, he wrote in a letter, and when we cannot find them, they find us. Even now, the saint fills me with love and grants me both physical and spiritual comfort with the paradisaical joy he has given me. Working to Repair the Cali Throughout that summer, Father Paisios made the most essential repairs. Firstly, he began to repair the half-collapsed roof. However, the work was often delayed because he frequently had to come down from the roof and speak with the people who, even from his first days at Panaguda, had begun to visit him. One monk who was helping him said, Yeranda, winter is approaching. When will you finish the roof? Shall we tell the people you are busy? How can you say that, you blessed man, he replied. People come from Crete and others from Comotini to disclose their pain and suffering, and am I to be repairing the roof? He worked tirelessly, did the most difficult jobs himself, and avoided asking for help. Yeranda, are you going to mend everything by yourself? What is it that I'm supposed to do here? asked a young man, who was there to help him. This is the nature of monastic life, my son, replied the saint. A monk does not wait for others to do the work. If you want, help wherever you can. When he was repairing the cistern, someone had to get into it in order to caulk the cement. Because a ladder was too wide for the narrow opening of the cistern, Father Paisios carved stairs onto a thick wooden beam 
and using them, went down into it himself. Outside of the cistern, two laymen and one monk mixed the cement and lowered it in a small bucket. When the elder had finished and was on his way out, he slipped and fell. Then the monk said, Do you see, Yeranda, how you need to have someone near you? If you had hurt yourself just now, who would have helped you? When people are not around to help, we are protected by angels, he, he replied. Before the summer was over, he had completed the necessary repairs on the keli and enclosed the surrounding area with a simple wire fence. He did not buy any new materials, nor did he repair anything that was not an absolute necessity. He did, however, order some boards to make a new floor for the chapel and also accepted a donation for one window. He temporarily patched up the broken windows by placing nylon sheets and tin over them. He covered the damaged floors with sheets of plywood. He did not rebuild the half-ruined wall of the balcony, but instead covered it with corrugated sheets of tin. I prefer to buy some small crosses to give to someone who may be suffering or to help some poor child rather than to spend money for the wall. When there is so much need elsewhere, I find some of the repairs to be unnecessary and therefore not to my benefit. In spite of having toiled all day long, he kept a nightly vigil as light-hearted as a bird that has found a new nest. One night his spiritual wireless connected with the prayer of a nun who was tormented with thoughts and had asked for his help. The next day he wrote to her, Yesterday on Saturday, July 21st, I received a telegram from you. Let's get things straight. I was dealing with many open fronts. So just why were you lost among such silly trifling things instead of helping me in prayer? At the Hezekasterion in October of 1979. At the beginning of October of 1979, the elder visited the Hezekasterion of St. John the Theologian and stayed there for about a month. In the Kalevi in which he stayed during his visits, he one day received a visitor with a serious problem and he continued to pray for him in his cell afterwards. When he came out into the hallway, St. Arsenios appeared before him. Gazing affectionately at him, he informed him about the problem the visitor faced. Immediately the elder reverently knelt down and venerated him. Just then a sister knocked on the door of the Kalevi and St. Arsenius disappeared. On October 26, after the vigil of St. Demetrius, Father Paisios appeared to be in another atmosphere, a paradisiacal one. One what wonderful things are going on in paradise, he said. The angels dance and beat their wings with joy. They unceasingly chant the holy, 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 and simultaneously their wings flutter as do the swallows. And as he said this, he started chanting the slow, holy, holy, holy Lord of Sabaoth. Footnote, this is chanted in a slow melody when the Divine Liturgy of St. Basil is celebrated. His chanting revealed the inner joyous fluttering of his soul, since he himself inwardly soared like the angels, glorifying God day and night. From the Epistles of St. Paisios. The following day, October 27th, some nuns from Serbia visited him, and while conversing with them, they pleaded that he share some divine event he had experienced with them. In order to sidestep their question, the saint replied, What can I tell you? Pray that I may see something to tell you. And he went to his kalivi. Two hours later, as he was saying the Jesus prayer while sitting on his bed, he suddenly saw one of the walls of the cell come away, and in his place was a bright cloud which enveloped small children who resembled little angels. From that cloud, small white clouds detached themselves, each taking along one child and vanishing. That heavenly image was repeated for half an hour. The moment the Talanton 
was struck for vespers, one sister knocked on the door of his cell. What is the feast day for tomorrow? he asked her. The protection or skepi of the Panagia, she replied. After vespers, the saint described the vision, which was connected with the protection of the Panagia, who like a cloud envelops and protects the entire world. It was during that visit to the Hezekasterion that the saintly elder first spoke to the sisters about the difficult years that were approaching. The devil, he said, is making a universal effort to destroy the world. In order to be able to render assistance, you must be very vigilant. You must do away with mean-spirited behavior. You must work spiritually. To a female instructor who had happened to be there, he uttered the following prophetic words. There will come a time when the children will throw stones, first at their parents and then at you, their teachers. The educator recalled his words when ten years later, the students of the school in which he taught occupied the building and threw stones at the teachers. During the early 1980s, Father Paisios could foresee that an anti-spiritual era was beginning. During that time as well, through divine providence, his fame had begun to spread far and wide. The saint had indeed become a lampstand bearing the true light which God used for the salvation of souls. A Caravan of People Each Day Most of the pilgrims visiting the holy mountain at that time were either bound for Panaguda or stopped by there on their way elsewhere. In the small boat which journeyed from Ornopolis to Daphne, the usual subject of discussion was Elder Paisios. And when the bus from Daphne arrived at Caries, which is where the pilgrims would then receive their written permission to stay on the holy mountain, most of them took the path leading to Panaguda. Footnote, this written permission from the sacred community of the Mount Athos is for a pilgrim to stay for a few days on the holy mountain. The spectacle was the first of its kind, and it was indeed very moving. A caravan of people of all ages, all headed in the same direction. Descending the once narrow path, which had become wider, visitors came across wooden arrows indicating to Father Paisios, and other signs which read, Do not disturb the other Kelia. The elder himself had been obliged to put those signs up because the pilgrims, in their search for Panaguda, often knocked on the doors of other monks Kelia, with the result being that some of the other monks had become resentful and had even reached the point of casting aspersions against him. Although the saint was saddened to have become the cause of such remarks, he always justified those who made them. They make those remarks with good thoughts in mind, he said, because they don't want the people to trouble me so much, they do it out of love. Arriving at Panaguda, the pilgrims pulled on a plastic thread attached to the gate of the wire fence, which rang a small bell hanging on the balcony at the back of the Kalivi. Those who had also visited the saint at the Kali of the Holy Cross saw a familiar sign on the fence, which read, Write what you want and put it in the box, and I will help you more with prayer. I will therefore have more time to be able to help even more people who are suffering. Next to the sign was a glass jar with pencils and paper, as well as a mailbox in which to place their notes. Yet it was not ever sufficient for anyone to simply leave a note. Everyone wanted to meet the man of God. Some waited there, and others followed an upward path next to the fence that led to a second wire gate. From there the front of the Kalevi was visible, and one could see whether or not the door was locked with a padlock, and thus determine if the elder was inside or away. Instead of a bell hanging on the outside of the wire gate, there was a small plowshare and a metal bar which was used to strike it. There the saint usually left some lucumia with a written note saying, You have a blessing to eat. 
he had also arranged to provide running water and metallic cups. Everyone waited patiently, sometimes for hours, outside of those two entries through the fence, some leaning on the wire fences, some standing, and others sitting down. From time to time they struck the metal plow or rang the bell, and all eyes turned with yearning toward the door of the shabby Kalevi, which concealed such a great treasure. Most of the visitors were happy as they anticipated their meeting with the saintly elder, and many recounted miraculous events they themselves had experienced or had heard about him. There were also many who were impatient as to when the elder would finally appear. If he delayed for a long time, they started to shout, Elder, please come. We are in need of you. We are in need, Elder. Sometimes God informed the saint about the people who are waiting. God informs me with exactitude about some who have serious problems in advance, he said. The others I understand when I see them. When I see a person from a distance, I understand what he is. It is due to experience as well as to a little grace. God has provided the brain in order for one to understand. He also gives us divine enlightenment for the serious matters. Sometimes while looking out of the window to the gate of the fence, he remarked to whoever happened to be with him in the Kalivi, That person has a serious problem. We have to open to him. Or, they do not need anything. They only came for a show. He meant that they had come not for spiritual edification, but out of curiosity. Or, he has turned his heart into a stable. No matter what we say, nothing will come of it. Let him be on his way. Therefore, sometimes he opened the door immediately, other times he delayed, and other times he did not open at all. Usually, however, a day did not go by without his having opened the door. Moreover, from the moment he answered the door, he did not close it until the evening. If I were a priest and a spiritual father, he said, I would not be able to have a fence around my Kalevi. I would be obliged to receive all the people at all hours of the day and night. Since I am only a monk, however, I may shut my door, because the work of a monk is different. It is the work of prayer. But when I decide to open my door, I have the rule of giving myself completely to the people. He received visitors with a bright smile and typically greeted them with, Welcome, Palikaria. His love overflowed from his noble heart. One could discern it in his illumined countenance, in how he held the hand of another, or in how he gave someone a gentle tap on the back. Come on in and take a seat on my armchairs, he said, pointing to a bench and a number of tree stumps arranged outside his Kalevi. That was his small, open-air Arkandariki. Some twenty meters further away, there was another larger Arkandariki, where he had placed two large benches, which he himself had made, perpendicular to each other, and also arranged many stumps. Treats and Blessings the first thing the elder always did was to offer a treat to his visitors, usually lukumia and whatever other treats it had been brought to him. He also had a barrel which served as a reservoir. It had a spigot from which he drew water into two or three metal cups and served everyone. If some hesitated to drink from the same cup, he affirmed, Make the sign of the cross and drink. Christ helps. Together with the treat, he often offered some special physical or spiritual help as well. Once he had offered a peach to a visitor who had had problems with his stomach for years. Because he had been in so much pain on that particular day, the man was afraid to eat. Eat it, my blessed man, and do not be afraid, the saint said. Since the man had cut only a small piece, the saint again said, Didn't I tell you to eat it? You won't be in pain. He ate the whole peach, and from then on, he no longer had stomach pain. 
At another time, while offering sweets wrapped in aluminum foil, he placed one sweet in mud and then offered it to someone and said, Come on, blessed one, take it and eat it. I would eat it, father, but it is filthy, it's dirty, said the man, thinking that the elder was joking. Don't you also feed people filthy, dirty things? responded the elder. He had not understood what the saint had meant, but as, as, as he was leaving Panaguda, his cousin who was with him said, It's because you sell dirty videotapes that Father Paisios did what he did to you. Do you understand now? The next day that man, troubled by the elder's words, went again to the saint, and they talked for a long time. What am I to do now? he asked him. First of all, you must give up your current job, and then come and we'll talk again, he advised him. The man returned to his hometown, closed down his shop, and began looking for work. When he returned to Mount Athos, the elder advised him to go to confession. Thus the man embarked upon a spiritual way of life. Later on, he took up work in the fabrication of churches. There were times when the saint's visitors even experienced the miracle of the multiplication of the loaves. During Bright Week of 1980, the saint wanted to offer a group of visitors some dyed red eggs. Footnote, in Greece and in Greek Orthodox churches, hen's eggs are hard-boiled and dyed scarlet red for Pascha and then distributed or exchanged after the Paschal liturgy. Footnote. Because he had only one such egg, he entered his cell and prayed to Elder Haji Georgis, who during Pascha had dyed potatoes red instead of eggs. Shortly afterwards, he went out and holding in his hand the single red egg, said, Christ is risen, Policaria. Come on, let's crack some eggs. And then what a miracle. At that very moment, they all found themselves holding a dyed red egg. Footnote. This event was witnessed by pilgrims and confirmed by the saints the sisters of the Hesychasterion, who also noted that this miracle took place with the help of Elder Haji Georgis. Return to the text. Thoroughly amazed, they responded to the saint, Truly he is risen. Their hearts flooded with the joy of the resurrection. They later departed from Panaguda. Similarly, during Bright Week of 1992, while the saint spoke to about 30 people, he sliced a small tzoreki that someone had just brought him and gave each person a piece. Footnote, in Greece, tzoreki is a sweet, rich, brioche-like bread made specifically for Pascha, Christmas, and New Year celebrations. It is a tradition. Return to the text. They all received a slice, and some tzoreki remained as well. Once the saint received eight visitors with two young children in their group. Because it was raining, he received them in his kalivi. I have nothing to give you as a treat, he said. He looked and found a box, which they all saw contained only two corabietis. Footnote, these are shortbread cookies made with chopped almonds and rolled in icing sugar. They are also known as Greek wedding cookies. Return to the text. I will serve the children first, said the saint, and holding the box, he offered them to the children first, and then he proceeded to offer a korabis to each of the others. Coming to the last person, he said, There is one left for you, too. As they were departing Panaguda, the visitors acknowledged that Father Paisios had performed a miracle as the two korabietis had become eight. There were many times that the supply of water also was inexhaustible. Nearly every summer, the amount of water coming from the mountain was either very limited or sometimes none at all. The elder went to a nearby Kali in order to fill two small vessels, which he then emptied into the barrel. Nevertheless, that amount of water sufficed 
for the approximately 150 people who visited each day. So many people drink it, he remarked. They wash up and the water doesn't run out. The level decreases by only four or five fingers. It's a miracle. People often brought him blessings or goods, but he seldom kept anything for himself except short and tall candles, which he wanted them to be made by pure beeswax, and which he lit day and night, praying for all the people in the world. If food and pastries were brought to him, he immediately offered them all to the visitors. Some of them objected. We brought them for you, elder, and instead you give them to us? Never mind, Balikaria, he said. When one gives, he feels double, doubly joyful. One because he gives, and two because the other person rejoices at having received. He also sent many visitors to nearby Kelya in order to give their blessings or gifts to other monks. Do you see that Kelly in the skeet over there? he asked. An elderly monk lives there. Go and leave your blessing at his doorstep. Each night he prepared separate packages of the blessings his visitors had either insisted on leaving with him or left secretly for him in order to send them to the elderly monks. With love and discretion, he separated what would be most useful for each monk and sent the packages to the elderly monks at the first opportunity. He, as soon as those packages left his kali, he felt as if a weight had been lifted off of him. A voluntarily poor monk is a high-flying eagle, he said. He did not even want to touch the money that many wanted to give him. Once a ship owner whose child had recovered from a serious illness, insisted on giving him a great deal of money as thanksgiving for his prayers. Take the money, repair your little Kal Kalivi, he said repeatedly. My little Kalivi is a little palace. Why should I repair it, he replied. He kept aside only a small amount of the money some visitors had secretly left for him, in case it was needed to help someone with an urgent need. He gave the rest away as charity without considering whether the recipient had an actual need. He was willing to give away even those items that were most necessary to him. Once Elder Vicentios, an elderly monk, who wandered around Carriez with a bag and gathered various objects from the fathers in order to give them to the poor, came to Panaguda. Elder Vicentios then started to ask for various things. Do you have a raincoat? I do, said Father Paisios, and gave it to him. Do you have five hundred drachmas? I do, he said, and gave him one thousand three hundred drachmas. Elder Vicentios continued to ask, Do you have this? Do you have that? To all that was asked of him, the saint had responded, I do. Thus the saint had given away virtually all of the things he himself needed. Later he said, Either Elder Vicentios is in a great spiritual state, or God has sent him to help us see if our heart is tied down to something material, even if it is something that is a necessity. By not keeping anything for himself and constantly giving things away, the saint deprived himself of even the bare necessities. However, blessings often arrived as gifts from God at the exact moment that he had need of them. For instance, he gave away the tall candles he had and within a few hours, someone brought him others. Or he had used all his candles, but before nightfall he found candles outside his Kalevi. Once when he needed a considerable amount of money, he had opened a box of leukemia in order to treat some visitors, and found an envelope inside with the amount of money he needed. Another time he had ordered wood for the winter, the loggers brought the wood, stacked it, were given a treat, and then waited to be paid. Before he even had the chance to tell them that something unexpected had happened, for which reason he did not have the money, someone came with an envelope in hand and told him, 
Elder, this envelope is for you. He opened it and found the money needed to pay for the firewood. He gave out blessings to most of the visitors he saw as he saw them to the door. In the beginning, he gave them the small carved icons he had made. Later, when the number of visitors increased, he gave them Combesquina, which he called weapons against the devil. He had made many of those Combesquina himself, often weaving them even while talking with visitors. However, since they did not suffice, he also bought some from poor monks. Some monks he knew gave him some from their own handicraft in order to give away to his visitors, even though the saint was not comfortable giving out blessings from the labors of others. It so happened that many visitors who were preparing to leave had forgotten to convey the requests of their friends. A few times, however, those lapses of memory were caught up in the spiritual radar of the man of God. Once a young man had forgotten that a friend of his had asked for a combeskini made by the hands of Father Paisios. As he was about to leave, the saint held him back and gave him two combeskini. Yeranda, I'll take only one, thank you. Take the other also in case your friend also wants one, he said with a smile. He had to remind some people to give him the list of names or the letters they had brought with them. Where are you off to, he asked. You have forgotten to give me something. He opened those envelopes that contained money and returned the money. Is getting paid for prayer possible, he asked himself. To one person he said outright, Please tell so and so that here there is no need for money in order for us to pray. He received those who wanted to speak to him privately, outdoors, next to the Kalevi, and rarely in the chapel, so the people would not leave money there. Usually he stood up while he listened to them, so that they would be brief, because so many began with Yeranda, I will take up but five minutes of your time, and then go on for an hour. Even when he was unwell, he nevertheless listened and carefully avoided making even the slightest move that revealed that he was tired or in pain. Close to People Through Prayer The saint took care to have all visitors depart from his Kalevi before sunset. Come on, you have to go now, he told them, so that I can turn to my Kambaskini. Once, just as twilight was beginning, there were still about forty people in the yard, and even more were entering. Among them was one person who insisted on talking to the elder. My son, I can't now. The batteries are empty, the elder said in a faint, anguished tone of voice. That can't be, father. I must talk to you, the man said. Well then, let's go here to see one person. Let's go there to see another person. Let's go a little further over there to see you, and then I'll go inside to see myself. Oftentimes, even when he had shut the door, there were some visitors who persisted in knocking. He then went down as far as the gate, but did not open it. I must also spend a little time on my spiritual duties, he told them. Give me your names and your requests, and I'll pray for you. That will be far better even for you. He was also unrelenting whenever some visitors expressed the wish of spending the night in his Kalevi. Indeed, some went late at night intentionally, as if they had no place else to spend the night. The elder, however, never allowed anyone to stay. To some he gave money for them to stay at the hotel in Carriez, to another he gave a torch, and to another, who was fearful of losing his way, the elder himself accompanied him. He wanted, as he said, to have the night to himself. He did not, in fact, keep the night to himself. He gave it up, instead, to the whole world, through prayer. Before he devoted his night to prayer, however, he tidied up both the open Arkandariki and his Kalivi. Usually by the light of a torch in the dark night, he washed the cups, gathered the trash, stowed the lukumia, 
and put away the things left behind, as well as the blessings that had been left for him. In winter he removed the ashes from the two stoves, fetched and carried firewood for the next day, and cleaned the mud brought into the Kalivi on the shoes of visitors. He did all those chores with the agility of a young man, and wasted little time so that he could begin his main work of prayer as quickly as possible. After cleaning and tidying, if any letters had been brought to him from the post office, he immediately began to read them by the light of a candle. No matter how tired he might have been, he always forced himself. There is no time to take a break, he said. There is so much to do. All these people are waiting. He read the letters and separated them into categories. Divorces, psychological disorders, narcotics, cancer. And participating in the suffering of all those people, he sighed deeply, wept over their pain, and then his anguished prayer rose to the throne of God. Thereafter, utterly exhausted, he laid down for an hour and slept. Nevertheless, he was not at peace. While he slept, he ached with all the pain he had gathered unto himself from the suffering people throughout the day. In one short hour, he was up again to begin the night vigil. His combeskini in hand, he kept a seven-hour vigil, and did many small prostrations as well as deep prostrations to the floor in between. When the weather was good, he kept vigil in the yard and did his prostrations on the soil, on God's carpet as he called it. He began as always with a humble prayer for himself and then prayed for everyone, the living and the dead. Often as he prayed, he became aware of the prayers of others who were also praying for help from God at that very minute. He often saw little children before him as they too prayed to God. He caressed them, kissed them, and prayed for them. It seems their mothers tell them to pray, he explained, because they have some problems, some difficulties in their family, and seek help from God. They tune into the same frequency, which is how we make contact. Often through prayer he was transported supernaturally near people who were in need. Ailing people, travelers, people in despair, or others who were in danger, which is what had happened with a young man from Athens named Yanis, who had visited the elder in 1982. Yanis was in despair about his life. Even though the elder had tried to help him, he had not come to his senses. One night he got onto his motorcycle and took off at breakneck speed, fully intending to put an end to his life. However, just before reaching the edge of a cliff, the motorcycle stopped. Shocked, he looked up to see Father Paisios standing before him, saying, Yanis, stop! What are you about to do? Deeply shaken by what had just happened, he gave up his evil intention. When he later went again to the holy mountain to thank the saint, he related the event to the monks at Kulumusiu Monastery. One of the monks went to the elder and asked him about it. At first he tried to avoid any discussion and said, He is confused. The young man is confused. The monk, however, persisted in questioning him. Yerunda, what really happened? Did you know about this? Did you go and stop the motorcycle? Look, the saint finally replied. I didn't know the young man was in danger. It often happens that when I pray, I say, My God, you know the needs of every person. Take care of each one as a good father. And at that time, I am transported to places I don't recognize, to hospitals, to families in need, to people about to harm themselves. I see them before me, or I feel that I am present there with them. That is how I found myself near that young man who was about to destroy himself. At one time, the wife of a priest wrote a letter to Father Paisios and gave it to someone who was to visit the holy mountain the next day. That night the saint appeared to her in her sleep and said, Wake up, you are on fire. She did not wake up, but after a while she saw him shake her 
and heard him repeat the same words. And again she did not wake. The third time, the shaking was very fierce and the exhortation much louder. She got up and what did she see? The petrol had leaked out of the heater and the bedding was on fire. She just barely managed to put the fire out. Afterwards she praised God who used Father Paisios to save both her and her children. On another night the saint made contact with a woman whose husband had been ill and in and out of the hospitals for seven months with the doctors unable to make a diagnosis. Finally they told her to take him home because they expected him to soon die. That afternoon, completely exhausted, the woman sat down to rest a little, and as she made the sign of the cross, she begged, My God, since the doctors cannot find what is wrong with my husband, show me. As soon as she closed her eyes for a bit, she saw Father Paisios before her. Look at his teeth, he said. She immediately took her husband to a dentist, who discovered that he had an abscessed tooth full of pus. The tooth was extracted, and immediately the man began to recover. In one week he had completely recovered. In fact, he lived another 20 years until the age of 90. God knows what I would have preferred. Father Paisius had said, When my vigil has ended, my battery has also come to its end, and then I succumb. Utterly exhausted, he laid down on his ascetic bed, but never slept for more than two or three hours. Since the bell began to ring at dawn every day, he had to be up and have enough time to do his program. By seven o'clock in the morning, I have to... F I have to have finished everything, even Vespers, he declared. Otherwise, I'm not sure if I will have enough time or the opportunity before nightfall, because afterwards I might spend 12 to 13 hours nonstop with the people. Each morning he read a chapter from the Holy Gospel. When time permitted, he also read a chapter from the epistles of the Holy Apostles, as well as from the Book of Revelation, in order to keep the Day of Judgment in mind. What he did not want to omit, however, was reading the Psalter. He believed that it provided the most effective assistance to people. He had divided the Psalms into three sections, and every day he stood upright as he read one section. At the beginning of each Psalm, he also read the occasion for which St. Arsenios had designated that Psalm to be used. Footnote. When the prayer book of the priest did not contain an analogous prayer, St. Arsenios had used the Psalms for various cases of illness and other needs. Return to the text. He prayed the Jesus prayer for each matter, adding other similar matters appropriate to the more contemporary needs of the people. Footnote. For Psalm 28, for example, St. Arsenios had determined the following usage. For those who have troubles at sea and are fearful of great storms. To this the saint added, My God, save us from the storms on dry land as well, because the land has become worse than the sea by drowning the people spiritually. How many children suffer upon the troubled sea of the world? Return to the text. Moreover, he supplemented, And for all those who are suffering in soul and body. At the end of each psalm, he said, Grant repose, O God, to your servants who have fallen asleep. And he then proceeded to the next psalm. In this manner he prayed with his whole heart for many particular circumstances, as well as for the entire world. During the summer, since it was quieter in the forest, where he had made a very small calivi out of ferns, he went there to read the Psalter but again he did not always manage to avoid the visitors. As he was leaving for the forest at about 7.30 one morning, Father Paisius was stopped by an acquaintance who asked him to pray for his family. Before the elder had a chance to continue on his way, another young man also turned up and asked him, Where is Father Paisius? 
What do you want Paisios for? The saint countered. Paisios, Paisios, Paisios. Everyone wants to see Paisios. You have attached far too much worth to him. Addressing his acquaintance, the elder then said, Do you see Kostas? I set off to go into the forest to pray. You asked me to pray for your family, but when shall I find time to pray? Right now five more are coming, and after that more will arrive. Indeed, a few minutes later, five more people came, asking for him. Oftentimes he came across people as they proceeded towards Panaguda on the pathway. Is Father Paisios in his Kalivi? they asked him. He may be a little late because someone is delaying him, he answered. Can I be of any help to you? He sat with them for a bit, helped them with some God-enlightened words, and then disappeared into the forest in order to help the entire world from there. Sometimes, while he was in the forest, he was informed by God that a person with a serious problem was coming to visit him, and he then came out onto the pathway in order to meet him. He normally returned from the forest at around ten in the morning, so as to receive those coming from the nearby monasteries, or at one in the afternoon, when the bus from Daphne arrived at Carius. Once as he returned from the forest, he found many people waiting, one of whom was annoyed, and said, Yerunda, you are very late, there are so many people waiting for you. I saw and heard far more people than you on the mountain where I had been. The saint spent each day that way, very patiently ministering to people. In a letter he wrote, Many people, that is my news, weary and tortured people. The number of people continually increases, as do their problems. Pray that my physical strength does not decrease. I put a little bit of my own self aside too, because regardless of whether I am able or unable, I must always be able. Frequently, he did not even have enough time to eat something. For instance, he picked up a potato to clean it. Visitors arrived, so he put it down. Or he put on a bit of rice to boil. Again, visitors arrived, so he forgot it on the fire, only to remember it when the smell of burnt food alerted him. He spent entire days that way, without having eaten a single thing. Above all things, however, was the fact that although he wanted to devote himself to prayer for the endless problems of the people, it was the people themselves who did not allow him to do so. From the crack of dawn, he noted, a person will arrive and shout. Even if I don't open the door, I hear all the shouting, and so I cannot be at peace. Some visitors struck the little bell so persistently that he had no choice but to go out. Come on, boys, I had an open line and you cut me off, he said to some visitors who had interrupted him while he had been reading the Psalter. He was not left in peace even on Holy Friday when he retreated to his keli and didn't receive anyone. He was forced to go out and say, Take my blessing and leave because today Christ is hanging on the cross. There were also some visitors who were so impatient that they jumped over the fence. They even broke the lock a couple of times. He also found some trying to climb up to the balcony. Those who behaved in such ways, he was usually very strict. To many he imposed a rule not to visit him for two or three years. Sometimes, however, his austerity softened, especially when he discerned that the person jumping over the fence had a very serious problem or a good disposition and a good restlessness. One day, someone had crawled under the fence and entered the yard. Father Paisios wanted to send him away. You must go out the same way you came in, he said, like a thief. You are right, Father, he replied. I came like a thief, but only to steal your prayers. The elder then relented, and he said, Come, you blessed one, sit down so we can talk. What troubled him most was that from among those who jumped over or crawled under the fence, one might see him while he was at prayer. 
If I am in some state of prayer, he said, and a person opens the door and comes in, I prefer that he strike me on the head with an axe rather than that he see me at that time. You have not yet experienced such states in order to understand the grief it causes to have been seen in such a state. It is as if you are flying and the other breaks your wings. Once, perhaps by the providence of God, someone saw him in a supernatural state of prayer. He was a priest, who while waiting with others outside of the fence, found a spot to get through, and so he entered the yard. Approaching the Kali, he heard voices inside and thought that Father Paisios was talking with visitors. He knocked on the door two or three times, and since he did not get an answer, he looked through the window. And what did he see? An extremely tall monk stood at prayer and was completely enveloped in a pillar of blue light. Shortly thereafter, Father Paisios opened the door and the priest said, I want to see Father Paisios. All right, he replied, and after going to the Kalivi for a while, he returned. I only want to see Father Paisios and no one else, the priest repeated. He was certain that the monk standing before him was not Elder Paisios, because two days earlier he had met him on the pathway, and the priest had asked him if Father Paisios was in his Kalevi, and he had answered, No, he is not there. Once again the saint entered the Kalevi for a while, and again he came out and told the priest, Sit down. Are there others with you, or are you alone? I am in the company of some professors. They too were invited to come. The elder conversed with them without anything betraying the heavenly state he had been in previously. But as they were leaving, he took the priest aside and said, I had planned to pray today, and you spoiled it. You shall not come back for three years. Yet I meant well, the priest said. No, you shall come again after three years have passed, said the saint. This is between 1981 and 1982, witnessed by Father John Skiadarisis. Divine liturgy was celebrated each Sunday at the chapel, as well as on the great feast days. If occasionally it was celebrated on a Saturday, the saint made a plate of koliva for those who had fallen asleep. Koliva is the boiled wheat kernels. It's a custom among the Orthodox to bring a tray of boiled wheat kernels to church for the memorial service. Once during the time when a priest was commemorating the names of the dead, the saint saw them passing before him as if in a movie. What's more, he could distinguish those who were in a good state and those who were in need of prayer. For vigils on feast days, he usually went to the Kelya of the fathers he knew. Even though he had not rested at all throughout the day, he stood up in his tasidi throughout the vigil without any signs of weariness. His face had a spiritual liveliness to it, a liveliness which he transmitted to others. He was almost always asked to chant something, and so, and so he chanted, O oh, give thanks unto the Lord. That's from Psalm 136 which is chanted on feast days during the service of Orthros. He chanted it with a tone of divine doxology, as well as the communion hymns, with an extraordinary spiritual gentleness. After the vigil, he usually did not have time to rest, because once again a new day of diaconia, or ministering, began for him. One afternoon at about 1.30, some visitors found him in the yard, splashing water onto his face. Welcome to you, Palikaria, he said with a rested, cheerful, and bright look. Last night I was at vigil, and the morning after the vigil some other pilgrims came, and up to five or ten minutes ago I had a constant stream of visitors. Now at midday, along with you, a new batch will come. As I came to the cistern to throw a little water on my face, I said, My Christ, just as you wipe the dust from my face, wipe away my tiredness as well, so that I can minister to the people who are coming. 
At times, his endurance seemed to be inexhaustible. He might not have slept for two 24-hour intervals, but no one ever detected it. The grace of God empowered him, supported him, illumined him, and guided him throughout his difficult diaconia. From childhood, the saint had tasted the joy of sacrifice and the peace he received by denying his own will. Aged and ill, he tasted that same joy and peace each and every day. My own will is denied, not because of one or two people, but because of all of them. Whatever time is convenient for each of them, that is the time they will come. One knocks here, another knocks there. I tell them, wait for 15 minutes. They tell me, stop praying, Father, God shall not misinterpret you. Just look at how far they will go. God, however, is not unjust. He knows what I would have preferred, and he sees what is going on. However, I see that he is not unjust to me. It gives me so many other things, far more than what I could ever want. Therefore, even though the saint had entirely expended himself, he remained wealthy. Although he occasionally collapsed with exhaustion, divine power was within him. Embittered as he was by drinking what he called the bitter cup of each suffering person, God removed all the bitterness and flooded his heart with the sweetness of divine consolation. Moreover, Panagia, the saints and the angels empowered him, sometimes even with their perceptible presence. The Appearance of St. Velasios while saying the Jesus prayer in his cell on the evening of the Sunday of the Prodigal Son in 1980, Father Paisio saw a saint, whom he did not recognize, within a heavenly light. He was tall and thin and wore a monastic mantle. In appearance, he looked like Abba Benjamin, as he is depicted in the Evergati Nos. He stood next to a low wall with a niche in which he could make out an old fresco of the same saint. Further on, there was some rubble, like ruins of an old monastery. Father Paisios felt a divine exaltation and wondered who the saint was. He then heard a voice coming from within his chapel say, He is St. Palacios from Sclavena. His biography will be published in a few days. Immediately, he understood the meaning of the divine vision. Not too long before, a hierarch monk he knew, Father Agustinos from Sclavena of Etolo Etoloa Carnania, had asked for his prayers so that he could find information about St. Vlasios, of whom very little was known, as he is the patron saint of their region. St. Vlasios had appeared in a vision to a devout woman in Sklavena for the first time in 1923. He told her his name, and then he showed her the way to the place where he had been martyred, asking that she dig there to find his relics. Indeed, after the digging had unearthed his sacred relics, a church was built upon the site, and he was venerated as their patron saint. He was commemorated on February 11th, the feast day of St. Vlasios, Bishop of Sebastia. But when Father Augustinus learned that the sacred skull of St. Vlasios of Sebastia is located in Consimanitu Monastery, he realized that it could not be the same saint. He then implored many fathers, among them Father Paisios, to pray that St. Vlasios reveal something from his life and appear himself so that his icon could be painted. St. Vlasios did indeed appear to a hieromonk and identified himself as the abbot of the monastery of the entrance of the Theotokos in Sklavena. He further revealed that he, together with another five monks, had been martyred by Saracens. His life was recorded after that divine information had been received. A few days after the appearance of St. Vlasios, Father Paisios received his biography. Footnote C. Archimandrite Agustinos Katsampiris, the holy martyr Vlasios of 
Akarnania, Athens, 1990. Return to the text. In May of that same year, Father Paisios, quote, returned, unquote, the divine visitation by going to his church in Sklavina. With great devoutness, he did many deep prostrations as he venerated the sacred relics. He also visited the nearby ruins of the monastery, as well as the low wall with the fresco in the niche, and they were just as he had seen them in his vision. He later suggested that St. Vlasios' icon should be painted using the image of Abba Benjamin as a prototype. Divine Warmth and Heavenly Light On the Sunday of Orthodoxy in 1980, Father Paisios went to the vigil at the Kelly of the Resurrection, which belonged to Stavrinikita Monastery and was about an hour's walk from Panaguda. Due to his having fasted and exerted himself during clean week, he was completely exhausted. He strove to remain in a standing position all night long, but because they didn't have any heating there, he shivered from the cold. As soon as he received Holy Communion, everything changed. He sensed a divine power, and his body began to warm up, little by little, like the coils of an electric heater. As time went by, that sweet flame became increasingly stronger. Moreover, it kept him warm all the way back to his own Kali. Two years later, in 1982, again on the Sunday of Orthodoxy, the saint went to the vigil that was celebrated at the Prototon Church in Karyes in honor of St. Cosmas, the Protoepistatis, and of the fathers who had been martyred with him during the reign of Patriarch Vecus, the Latin sympathizer. Footnote. St. Cosmas I, or Protoepistatis, was a senior supervisor of the Holy Synod of Mount Athos, when he and many Athenite monks were martyred in 1280 for refusing to obey a patriarchal order to concede union with the Roman Catholics and accept Latin doctrines. He is commemorated on the 5th of December. Patriarch Ioannis Vecus, 1275-1282, together with the Byzantine Emperor Michael VIII Paleologos, 1259-1282, instigated a brutal campaign of intellectualism and repression in order to promote and defeat, defend the union of the Orthodox Church with the Roman Catholics. The union was seen as a betrayal of orthodoxy and was ultimately repudiated by the emperor's son and successor Andronicus 1282-1328, who also requested that Vecus abdicate. Return to the text. Their tomb, which is within the Prototon Church, had been opened a few months earlier, and when the elder venerated the relics, he sensed abundant grace. During the vigil, as he stood in a stasidi at the back of the church, he saw a heavenly light, like an enormous halo, which encircled the sacred skull of St. Cosmas, the Protoepistatis. Panagia the Jerusalemite During that great Lent of 1982, Panagia appeared to him in a vision. He saw himself at a customs office where he had to prepare his papers for a long journey. Although there were many people at the office, no one bothered to assist him. Who will help me, he wondered. Isn't there anyone interested in helping me? And while he was in such distress, a noble lady with a bright face and garments made entirely of gold appeared before him. She was completely aglow. She took the papers from his hand, placed them in her bosom, tapped him gently on the shoulder, and with great benevolence said, Do not be troubled, I will help you. My son is king. Then he, she said, You will go through difficult times. And she revealed something that he himself had to do. A few days later, the saint recognized her countenance in the icon of Panagia the Jerusalemite, which he had seen in a booklet. At Jerusalem and at Sinai After Pascha of 1982, 
having been invited by Father Damianos, who had long since become Archbishop of Sinai, Father Paisio set out for Sinai, accompanied by a friend. They went first on a pilgrimage to the Holy Land. Wherever they went, the saint intensely experienced the presence of Christ. He repeatedly whispered, Christ walked here, as he walked along the way of sorrow, via Doloroso. He said, even if one does not know where he is going, by walking here he feels a transformation and is profoundly moved. Footnote. This is the way of sorrow, which is one of the names attributed to the street in the old city of Jerusalem, which is believed to be the path Jesus had walked on the way to his crucifixion. To a monk who asked him if he had seen the holy light at the holy sepulcher, he answered, There all things are within the holy light, and there the holy light was wherever I went. At some of the shrines, he was accompanied by two deacons of the Patriarchate of Jerusalem who were eager to serve as guides. The elder, however, preferred silence. At one point, when they wished to explain something for him, he said, There's no need for explanations. The events are familiar. We read about them. Here one does not need to hear a conducted tour. Here one needs a little Hezekiah and a little time in order to bring the divine events to mind and experience them. On Mount Tabor, while venerating the place of the divine transfiguration, something happened to him which he did not reveal. On the Mount of Olives, he asked his companions to leave him alone for a little while. He fell to his knees onto the rock upon which the sweat of Christ had dripped. He embraced it, and for a considerable time he prayed there, racked with sobs. In the church of Gethsemane, he was deeply moved as he stood before the icon of Panagia, the Jerusalemite. Once again he sensed her living presence, just as he had sensed it in the vision that he had had not long before. He crumpled, dissolved by her fervent love. He venerated her for a long time with the sense that he was before Panagia herself. He also visited the Patriarchal School of Holy Zion, at which twenty students were then enrolled. An iconography lesson was underway during the time of his visit, and with their brushes in hand, the students ran to receive the elder's blessing. Are you learning to paint icons? he asked. You must be careful, because those who paint icons are sometimes not careful about being in a good spiritual state and so they paint their own faces and not the faces of the saints. The professors asked him to say something more to the students, and the saint added, You should wage a struggle now that you are young and have the strength to do so, because when you grow old, even if you want to struggle, you will not be able. He rejoiced over the spirit of sacrifice he saw in many of the clergy, monks, and laymen, who ministered in the Holy Land. One must be a palikari in order to live here, he said, and he must have great patience. The fathers who maintain the sacred shrines and monasteries here are heroes, because there are many distractions and they face many dangers. God, however, strengthens them. Visibly transformed by the pilgrimage to the Holy Land, he set out for Mount Sinai, with the aim of staying there for at least six months. At the monastery of St. Catherine, those who had known him from his time there looked forward to seeing him again, while those who had heard about him expected to see a very austere ascetic. What they saw, however, was a very simple and approachable monk. As soon as he recovered from the hardship of the journey, he began looking for an ascetic dwelling, because another ascetic was living in the Kali of St. Epistemi. As he once again ascended the familiar rocky terrain and saw his beloved caves, he was deeply moved and repeatedly said, The entire place is holy. There are saints in this place. Wherever we walk, there are saints. The more he traversed the region, however, the more anguished he became as he saw that tourism had brought the worldly spirit to the desert, too. 
Looking pensive, he said to the monk who accompanied him, You must be very careful. You must not allow the desecration of this holy land. He was also grieved when he saw that the ascetic Kali of St. Epistemi had been exceedingly altered. The hieromonk monk who had settled there was also an acquaintance of the elder, and he said joyfully, Come and see what I have done. He had extended the building, planted a large garden, and built a wall, in which he had even placed decorative stones all around the Kali. Seeing those changes, the saint sadly shook his head. Father, it is not for gardens and orchards that one lives here, but for prayer and fasting, he remarked. If you wanted gardens, you should have gone to the Kali of the Holy Forty, Forty Martyrs. As he departed with pain in his soul, he said, We disgrace a holy place and consider it to be an achievement. The saint very quickly realized, however, that his health did not allow him to remain at Sinai any longer. He therefore stopped looking for an ascetic dwelling and decided to return to the holy mountain. He might also have received some divine message because when he returned, he said, I see now that God wants me to help people personally, not with prayer alone. This is the reason why I cannot distance myself from them. Anguish and Prayer for Greece and Orthodoxy While waiting for the airplane for Thessaloniki at the Athens airport, a number of people flocked to receive his blessing and talk to him for a little while. Someone asked him, What's going on, Father? We Greeks are going from bad to worse. We have reached rock bottom. We have not reached the bottom. We still have a way to go, the saint replied. But when we do reach the bottom, then things will begin to come to order. The saint was troubled, for he observed that many people conspired against Greece. Greece is a beautiful princess, he said, and everyone, both the lame and the blind, wants to take her. Everyone is looking for a window of opportunity. Fortunately, Christ is in command. Otherwise, we would have been lost. As early as 1977, when he had gone to Australia, he had recognized that a propaganda campaign was being carried out there, one which touted the falsehood that Macedonia is not Greek. That is why the saint was so pleased with the work Nicholas Martis had put into the 1983 publication of his book, The Falsification of Macedonian History. He praised God for it. He bought many copies of the book and gave them out as a blessing to other people. In fact, on one copy he wrote, Your sunshine, Martis, has illuminated the truth. The warmth of your sun, Martis, has heated up Greece. The heat of your sun, Martis, burns up the Slavic falsehood of the pseudo-Macedonians. Footnote, in Greek, Martis means March, the third month of the year. He spoke with indignation about certain Slavic nationalists who placed their country above Orthodox Christianity at the expense of Greece. He had foreseen, however, that they will not be able to harm Greece because spiritual laws will be in effect. Footnote C. St. Paisios the Athenite, the, held, the Elder Haji Georgis the Athenite, pages 85 to 91. Also, with regard to the danger posed by the Turks, the saint often said, Many clouds have gathered, if we can manage to disperse them. In fact, he did disperse them with his ardent prayers. Indeed, there was one time when God informed him about imminent danger. In May of 1983, he had received divine information that the Turks were going to attack Greece within five months, on Sunday, October 16th. He therefore began what he termed the stealth, stealthy recruitment of prayers in order for God to take pity on the Greeks and prevent war. He induced other monks to pray and also prompted fathers he knew to keep a vigil on October 1st on the old calendar, the day we celebrate the miracle of the holy protection of the Theotokos. In the end, no battles or skirmishes were fought that October. 
Shortly afterwards, a submarine docked at the port of New Ski. While speaking with one monk, the military officers revealed that they had been preparing for war as they followed the movements of the Turks. The monk asked them if the danger had been so great that it had warranted such preparations. Yes, they replied, we recently faced an exceptional danger. We barely avoided it. They also told him the date on which they had faced that danger. The monk who knew about the recruitment of prayers which Father Paisios had undertaken informed the saint of the incident. Father Paisios then thanked Panagia, who on the day which commemorates the miracle of her holy protection shielded Greece once again. What troubled the saint more than anything else was that the Greeks had taken the, quote, sweet downhill road, unquote, of sin, which is why they were no longer entitled to divine assistance. Just think about it, he said. God finds himself in a difficult situation. Should he allow barbarians to attack Greece? The youths will be killed. Should he not allow them? Yet again, the children are killed by the parents themselves. He was referring to the crime of abortion, which had been legalized by the Greek state in 1984. On Tuesday of Bright Week in 1983, Father Paisio saw a fearful vision. At midnight, after he had lit two candles, one for the living and one for the dead, he had begun to say the Jesus prayer. Suddenly he saw before him a large field enclosed by a wall. It had been planted with wheat that had just started to sprout. He himself stood outside of the wall and lit candles for the dead, which he placed on the stones of the wall. To the left was a dry land with rocky crags and cliffs that shook with thousands of heart-rending cries, which could move even the most hard-hearted of people. Even as the elder endured those unbearable cries and wondered what it all meant, he heard a voice say, The field with the planted wheat which has not yet formed kernels, is the cemetery for the souls of the dead who are to be resurrected. In the place shaken by the heart-rending cries are the souls of the infants who have been killed by abortion. After that vision, he was unable to recover from the tremendous anguish he had felt for the souls of those children. He himself documented that vision and sent it to be published in the journal Family with Multiple Children. Footnote, the Greek Orthodox Family with Multiple Children is a quarterly journal of the Pan-Hellenic Union of the Friends of Large Families. He also recounted his vision to many people and emphasized that the abortion of a child is an atrocious sin because the parents themselves kill their innocent children and deprive them of the grace of holy baptism. As for the law that no longer considers abortion a wrongful act, he said, When a person violates one commandment of the gospel, he alone is responsible. But when something which contravenes the commandments of the gospel becomes a law of the state itself, then the wrath of God comes upon the entire nation in order for it to be instructed. His indignation over the criminal law was so great that when the Greek president who had signed the law visited the Holy Mountain, the saint recommended that the monasteries protest by not receiving him. Father Paisios was saddened by the fact that Greece did not have leaders like Maccabees with ideals, selflessness, palikaria, and a sense of sacrifice. Footnote. Maccabean was the name given to Judah, the leader of the Jewish revolution, which took place in 166 BC during the reign of Antiochus IV Epiphanes. The Maccabees, which included Judah as his, and his successors, were distinguished for their struggles to uphold the faith of their fathers and their freedom. See 1, 2, 3, and 4 Maccabees in the Septuagint Old Testament. Return to the text. It was the main reason why he wrote an article about the hero, hero General Yanis Macriyanis on August 1st on the old calendar, 1984, 
the day on which the holy seven young men, the Maccabees, are commemorated. Footnote Yanis Macriyanis, 1797 to 1864, general in the Greek Revolution of 1821 and a great fighter. Following the independence of the Greek state, he also fought for the granting of a constitution to the Greek people by Otto, the monarch of Greece. He authored the acclaimed historical text known as Memoirs of Macriyanis. Return to the text. After the 1983 publication of Macriyanis's book, Visions and Wonders, some people called him a saint, others called him a religious zealot, and still others said that he had been deluded. In his article, Father Paisios expressed his great sorrow that despite the difficulties of the times, some people could throw dirt at the white tunic of Macriyanis instead of trying to benefit from the hero's words. He stated that Macriyanis had struggled more than anyone else for the liberation of our country from the barbaric Turkish yoke and later strove with divine zeal so that the Greeks not become spiritually enslaved by the Franks. Regarding the minor defects of the great hero, the saintly elder wrote, We ought to expect that a kilo of empty walnuts will have made their way into that ton of meaty, meaty walnuts which the good Macriyanis had given us as a blessing. Why then should we comment on the few empty ones when we, as humans, cannot achieve divine perfection, but only a relative human perfection in which there will inevitably be a few human imperfections? As for the visions that Macriyanis had had, the saint with his enlightened discretion said, Naturally, we can't say that all the visions of Macriyanis were divine because many of them arose out of his agony, that is, his great anguish generated them. They should, however, rouse us even more than the divine visions because in them one can see the great agony of the pure hero who constantly on alert was in that state between sleep and wakefulness and had these visions. The good God allowed him to have many visions Christ, Panagia, and many saints, so that we, posterity, can realize the great danger our nation was up against then, and the tremendous protection we had received from Christ, Panagia, and the saints, who worked together as if they had made an alliance between them, so that we would not be influenced by the Europeans, of course, and become Frankish. And he deduced, General Macriyanis, a genuine child of our church, was born into, raised up in, and sensed with the incense of the church. And later, as an authentic father of the nation, battle-scarred and wounded, he shed tears and anguish before God, and he shed blood for our freedom. And if we want to know him well, we ought to get rid of the smoke from our hearts and thoughts. St. Paisius himself, a genuine child of the Church with an orthodox sensitivity and the exactitude of the Holy Fathers, believed that the greatest danger facing Orthodox Greeks was their spiritual enslavement. Footnote C. Father Dionysius Tatsis, a record of the teachings of Father Paisius, the pure hero, General Macriyanis by St. Paisius of Mount Athos, Konitsa, 1994, pages 55 to 62. He was greatly troubled as he saw the ever-increasing influence of the worldly Western European spirit even among spiritual people. He was distressed by the various ecumenical movements which he termed patchwork of the devil. Deeply pained that God enlightened the church leaders so that they not be dazzled by the false light of the West but see clearly with spiritual clarity, so as not to fall into the great trap of the devil. In a letter, he wrote, Unfortunately, Western rationalism has even influenced the Eastern Orthodox leaders, and they are therefore only physically in the Eastern Orthodox Church of Christ, while their entire being is in the West, which they see reigns in a secular manner. If they were to see the West spiritually, 
through the light of the East, the light of Christ, then they would see the spiritual twilight of the West, which is gradually losing the light of the noetic sun of Christ and heading towards the depths of darkness. They meet up and have sessions at which they confer endlessly about matters for which there is no room for discussion, about matters which were not even discussed by the Holy Fathers over the course of 2,000 years. All such activities are inspired by the cunning one, the devil, and only serve to bewilder and scandalize the faithful, and to push them, some into heresy and others to schisms, which is how the devil gains ground. Heavenly Fragrance and Angelic Psalmody On Monday of Bright Week in 1983, Father Paisios was in his Kali, reciting the Jesus Prayer, when he suddenly sensed an intense fragrance. Taken aback, he went toward the chapel, but the fragrance had not come from there. He went out into the yard, and there he sensed it more intensely. Then he heard the Talantan as it was struck during the litany for the miraculous Action Estin icon, which at that time was located approximately one kilometer away from his Kali. The saint understood that it was from there that Panagia had sent him her blessing. A divine fragrance also flooded his Kali one year later on March 26, 1984 on the old calendar. As he stood at prayer before the icons in his Kali, he suddenly saw Christ and Panagia move in their icons as if the images had come alive. He immediately fell onto his knees in order to devoutly venerate them and repeatedly uttered, My Christ, bless me. My Panagia, bless me. His keli was simultaneously filled with such an intense fragrance that even the dusty little rug next to his bed emitted the fragrance. A divine madness seized him. He remained there on his knees, kissing the rug. The fragrance lasted for several days. A few months later, on the morning of November 2nd, when he was at the Hezekasterion of St. John the Theologian, he suddenly began to hear psalmodies. He thought the sisters were chanting, but when he exited his Kalevi to see, he had not found anyone. Since the psalmody continued, he realized that it was angels who were chanting. With an inexpressible sweetness, they chanted the Magnificat. My soul doth magnify the Lord, and more honorable than the cherubim. Footnotes the Magnificat is chanted in the service of Orthros before the ninth ode of the canons. When they had finished chanting all the verses, they also chanted one final hymn, Let all humanity holding torches rejoice in spirit. This is the earmost of the ninth ode of the canon for the Akathis hymn. They chanted this once as a fast tempo chant and once as a slow tempo chant. It was the first time he had ever heard such a slow tempo chant of the hymn. The angelic psalmody continued for about two hours and then slowly faded out until it stopped. Panagia the Eleftherotria, or Liberator On February 21st, 1985, on the old calendar of the following Great Lent, the saint received a visit from Panagia. It was 10.30 at night, and he was so exhausted that his legs trembled. He thought a little wine might invigorate him, so he exited the Kalevi in order to go to the storeroom beneath the balcony where he kept two bottles. As he headed toward the back of the Kalevi, deploring himself for having thought about drinking a little wine, he saw Panagia in the clearing, which was about four or five meters away from the balcony. She had the same countenance with which she is depicted in the icon known as the Liberator. She was a mother of great nobility, a most noble, magnanimous mother. Her garments were whiter than white, and she herself shone so brilliantly that even though it was night, the entire area was illuminated. As she walked towards him, she looked upon him with a sweet gaze that was full of affection. As he watched her approach, he saw that she had neared a spot 
which those who had lived there some fifty years earlier had designated as a privy, and so he dutifully called out to her, My Panagia, come no further, bless me from there, do not come any closer, because the place is unclean, and I am unclean. Panagia blessed him, and vanished before his eyes. Afterwards both my heart and my bo and the bottles broke, the saint said. His heart had broken out of joy, and the bottles of wine had become useless, for he had become inebriated with the heavenly wine, and no longer felt either weak or exhausted. After that event, he repeatedly asked, What wine do they drink in paradise? Have you ever drank that wine? Once as he recounted that event, he said, Heavenly drunkenness is good, but one must be constantly there at the never-emptying barrel, the heavenly one. Haji Afentis and Elder Haji Georgis Over the years, Father Paisios continued to add to the Synaxaria of the Athenite Fathers, which he had begun writing at the Kelly of the Precious Cross. Whenever he found spare time, he rewrote his notes on a clean sheet of paper and added any supplementary materials he had gathered. In a letter he wrote, These notes naturally require a great deal of work. They have to be well sifted, completed, and most importantly confirmed by God, so as to be written in accord with their meaning and not according to the conclusions reached by each of those who had heard about them, or worse, of the one who is writing them. He was especially moved by the saintly ascetic of the 19th century, Elder Haji Georgis, about whom he said, For his time, Haji Georgis was singular, and it is possible that there was no one equal to him. Indeed, Elder Paisios wrote a separate book about the extraordinary ascetic, which was published in January of 1986. That same year, during Great Lent, Father Paisios had a vision that involved Elder Haji Georgis and Haji Afentis. He was in his Kalivi when he suddenly found himself at the Hezekasterion, where he observed two beautiful birds flying around a tree and chirping very sweetly. Come, let me catch you, he said to the one, and he caught it. He also attempted to catch the other bird, but that one did not approach him and continued to fly. Ten days later, on February 11th, the Ecumenical Patriarchate canonized Father Arsenios Hagiafentis among the officially venerated saints. St. Paisios explained that the little bird he had caught symbolized St. Arsenios, while the other bird symbolized Elder Haji Georgis. Elder Haji Georgis will also be canonized a saint, he said, but I will not be alive then. Nevertheless, he is with Haji Afantis. The canonization of Father Arsenios was celebrated the following year, 1987, on the Sunday of Thomas, in a festive service at the Hezekasterion. Father Paisios, however, preferred not to attend that extraordinary feast day, so as not to draw attention to himself, but that his saint be honored exclusively. In honor of the newly revealed saint, Elder Paisios urged the sisters to build a church, the construction of which he himself oversaw, from up close as well as from afar. He advised that all things should be constructed as befits a monastery, that is, that all things serve their purpose, that they be substantial but not provocative. He also advised the sisters not to be worried or distressed over the completion of the church. Each year on November 9th, the elder attended the all-night vigil that takes place at the Hezekasterion to commemorate St. Arsenios on November 10th. <laughs>